Hello everybody and welcome to The Dry Dock, episode 179, technically becoming available very early 2022, but also technically the last Dry Dock of 2021. So, welcome aboard to everybody's favourite naval history related sleep aid, and let's get on with the questions. MG asks, could you tell us something about where and how gunpowder was stored during the Age of Sail and what precautions were in effect when handling and storing it? So in the classic Age of Sail, which is most usually typified by the Napoleonic era ships, a vessel would have a main magazine, or sometimes called a grand magazine. On the very, very larger ships there might be some additional smaller magazines elsewhere, but that was somewhat rare and because basically everyone was absolutely paranoid about what could happen if the gunpowder got set fire to, which was a fairly legitimate concern. In fact, in a lot of ways, despite the fact that, you know, it's the age of sail, everything's made mostly of wood, and there isn't a lot of automation aboard the ship, magazine practices in an age of sail ship of the line were actually, for the most part, far stricter and far more paranoid than in a 20th century ship of the line i.e a dreadnought or a capital ship largely because one of the main reasons that there was that slight relaxation and then obviously in some cases an over relaxation when it came to ammunition handling in the early 20th century was that the new explosives although they were more powerful were also thought to be more stable whereas everybody knew from lots and lots of experience in the age of sail that gunpowder was not your friend um, so the magazine would be below the waterline in the first place to obviously keep out incoming fire as much as possible it was also bearing in mind that all light at this point was provided by flames completely sealed off from said flame so you were forbidden to take anything that could possibly cause sparks into the magazine so any iron objects including buckles and things on your boots well if you had them sorry your boots were coming off um, you would go into the magazine with absolutely nothing on your person capable of striking sparks. The light would be provided from a light room above the magazine, which would be then separated from the magazine itself by several layers, whether that be of horn or glass, depending on the precise era. And the light from the lanterns, which themselves would be fully enclosed, would be reflected off of reflective metal or later on mirrors in order so that basically you had at least three or four layers and a, a curve of some description separating the flame of the lights from the magazine. So there's absolutely no chance of sparks from that getting in. Then within the magazine itself, you the walls would be made of double thick timber. Then there would be plaster. Then sometimes, depending on the nation and the ship and the uh, exact practice going on at the time possibly a lining of lead lead was also a very common lining for boxes inside the magazine and there would also be a lining of copper or all the tools would be of copper and that reason for that is neither of those things strike sparks so everything inside would either be wood copper or lead uh, apart from obviously the gunpowder and the bags that they're, they're in and there'd also be a curtain to you know brush off any lingering sparks or anything that you might have carried in usually too in a kind of airlock system so they were extremely paranoid because they knew what happened if a ship caught fire and the magazine went off and i've said this on a couple of dry docks before but if you um google rich or put on youtube i guess richard hammond uh guy fawkes plot you can see what happens to a reconstruction of the Stuart era houses of parliament when you set off one ton of gunpowder underneath it it's pretty terrifying then bear in mind that a ship of the line would have dozens of tons of gunpowder in the magazine so if a ship of the line's magazine cooked off that ship is basically going to cease to be you're going to be fishing out fragments basically from miles and miles around as was seen in a number of battles when ships exploded particularly the battle of the nile where lorient exploded the french flagship and the violence and the shock of it was such that basically everybody stopped fighting on both sides for several minutes whilst they looked in horror at what had just become of that that ship so 
the idea was basically keep any possible source of ignition away from the uh, large amount of explosive, which tended to work, as I say, unless ships caught fire completely, which was obviously a bit of a downer. Um, there were occasions where either the main magazine or a smaller locker might suffer a detonation or a partial detonation in battle. Usually this was the result of thrown explosives because obviously this is where the powder is. You need to get the powder up to the guns. So there would be ladders, hatchways, stairs, depending on, again, depending on the ship, um, some form of passage for the people passing the powder back and forth to be relay racing their way around with bags of powder. Thus, it was in theory possible, and as I said, does indeed occasionally happen, that a grenade or something like that that might be thrown into the ship might work its way down there before exploding. And then whether or you get a partial or full detonation is really down to luck. Occasionally you might just get a fire and someone might be able to damp it down, um, as indeed happened on one of the British ships at the Battle of Trafalgar. But you really were in a lot of bad luck if uh, something explosive managed to find its way anywhere close to your magazine. John Graubard asks, what was the idea behind the Atlanta-class light cruiser, and was it hopelessly outclassed in a surface action? So the Atlanta's original design brief has a very long, complicated, painful, and winding story behind it. Effectively, it comes out of the Second London Naval Treaty, where there's an agreement to reduce the overall displacement of cruisers. This is where you also get things like the Crown Colony-class designs. But the US Navy is looking effectively for a long time at two separate ships because they want to replace the Omahas but the battle fleet is looking for a smaller lighter type of cruiser that they can deploy in large numbers in the outer fleet screen because they've got the Brooklands which they are quite happy with on the inner fleet screen but they need something a bit more numerous for the outer fleet screen and you also have destroyer flotilla destroyer squadron destroy division commanders asking for something that can serve as a flotilla leader which some of the omahas had been doing and these two requirements are actually quite different the flotilla leader type looks almost like a super destroyer dash very very small light cruiser something like what the french and the italians were building whereas the outer fleet screen cruiser is something in the order of 8,000 tons i the upper limit of the new restrictions they're also hoping that they can get a six inch gun initially they're hoping for a six inch dual purpose weapon and they hold out hope for that for a very long time but it never quite materializes there's also quite significant problems because they realize they do need some heavy aa but on a small vessel a 8000 tons or however much less depending on what design you're looking at there really isn't that much deck space and so having eight or nine six inch guns plus some five inch aa if the six inch dual purpose doesn't work out as indeed it doesn't is just a really big ask it's very difficult and eventually the u.s navy comes to the conclusion that it's not going to build two separate types of small cruiser uh, one for flotilla leading purposes and the other for uh, outer fleet screen purposes which ironically enough is for defense against destroyers more than anything else although they do appreciate the need for AA armament. And so with the failure of the 6-inch dual-purpose turret for the minute, they are forced to consider a ship armed purely with 5-inch 38s because the alternative is to fit the ship with single-purpose, i.e. Um, surface-action only 6-inch guns, and then you have the aforementioned problems with fitting any kind of meaningful heavy AA battery. And that gradually leads to the Atlanta and the two demands, i.e. the outer fleet screen cruiser against destroyers and the flotilla leader, end up being somewhat combined and you end up with the Atlantas as we know them. Note that in none of this was there ever any consideration for them to be used as dedicated anti-aircraft cruisers. They would have that ability as a fleet screen unit and the selection of the five inch over the single purpose six inch was so that the ships could defend themselves but it seems to have passed by most of the um, US designers that this many 5 inch 38s would actually make for quite a fearsome anti-aircraft armament um, 
it was only during the war that this began to be realised, especially because it turned out the Atlantas didn't fare that well in direct surface combat. As far as it being hopelessly outclassed in a surface action, well, you've got to look at what its original design purpose was for. You know, as a flotilla leader, or as an out-of-fleet screen, its primary purpose was to be attacking destroyers one way or another, whether it was attacking destroyers directly at the head of a flotilla, or if it was attacking destroyers that were coming after the battle fleet, that was what it was supposed to take on. Notable is, of course, the fact the Atlantis have torpedo launchers, which most US cruisers don't have, and this reflects you know, their slightly different purpose. In the event that they ran into big enemy 10,000 tonners, they were not supposed to end up in a surface gun action with them. They were supposed to launch their torpedoes and act at that point like overgrown destroyers. If the guns cause damage, then fantastic, but they weren't expected to stand in line and fight it out with enemy cruisers. And this is pretty much what you see happening. On the occasions that Atlanta winds up fighting a small enemy ship like a destroyer, it does very, very well. On the occasion it ends up fighting anything else, anything larger, it tends to do rather poorly. But that's pretty much what the US design is expected. The main difference being that the Atlanta's use in the war, as to be honest, the use of many US ships in the war, was nothing like the design concept that they'd been conceived for pre-war. Uh, and so sometimes they'd ended up in really optimal situations and other times they ended up in really poor situations. I suppose the most direct comparison is probably with the Dido class and with that you can kind of see the very slight sort of one side of the coin or the other that the two classes represent because the Atlantas accept that they have the 5-inch 38 dual-purpose weapon, which, as I said, in the end makes them superior anti-aircraft vessels to the Didos by quite some margin, thanks to their rate of fire, number of guns, etc. Whereas the Didos with the 5.25-inch, which is a much longer-barreled weapon, have significantly more anti-surface capability. They're still pretty lethal against destroyers, but you do see in the Mediterranean and such that Didos will and can and will stand in the line with six-inch cruisers and go toe-to-toe -to -toe with enemy light cruisers with somewhat greater success rates than the Atlantis would enjoy against Japanese surface uh, cruisers. Texas and La Shock asks, In episode one of Battle 360, SBD pilot Dusty Kleiss describes diving on a Japanese cruiser, clobbered it, as he says, moored at uh, Kualjanin, I think, island, during the February 1942 Marshall Islands raids. But he never identifies it. I looked up the wrecks in the area, but the only cruiser there seems to be Prince Eugen, which of course is a whole other story. So which cruiser was it and what happened to her? That would be this ship, the Japanese light cruiser Katori, the largest Japanese warship to be damaged in the raids in February 1942. Uh, so she was indeed hit by uh, Dauntless dive bombers are based off of the Enterprise. And she wasn't sunk, but she was badly damaged enough that she was off for about three and a half months. She was sent back to Japan for repairs. Um, so obviously the raid's happening at the beginning of February and she isn't back until the late part, latter part of May 1942. So that's basically the only candidate for the ship that he hits and not sunk but damaged. And then as for the reason why he described it as, you know, clobbered it, well, one, yes, he did. He hit it with a, a fairly substantial bomb. But the other thing you've got to remember is that Katori is very definitely identifiable from the air as a cruiser. But remember what we've said before in previous dry docks about it being somewhat difficult to identify exactly what kind of ship you're looking at. Katori is relatively small for a cruiser. And thus, if you drop a bomb from a Dauntless on her and you score a hit, the resulting explosion is going to be proportionally larger than it would be if you hit, you know, a 10,000 tonner. And so if you assume that you've hit something like a Japanese fleet cruise or even one of their older World War I, late World War One era cruises, you see this explosion, you're going to think, wow, I've really, really smacked this thing up. Yes, you have, but it looks more impressive because you've actually hit a slightly smaller target. So I think that's pretty much what he was talking about. Jay Shefsky asks... 
The fairy swordfish that attacked Bismarck were actually somewhat advantaged by their obsolescence, but are there any other major naval engagements in the Age of Steam and Steel where one side's supposed obsolescence turned out to be an advantage? There are a few instances where being an old and ostensibly obsolete ship did have an advantage, albeit much more in the Age of Sail than in the Age of Steam and Steel. So in the Age of Steam and Steel, one of the most notable ones was the Battle of the Yalu River in the 1890s, where the Japanese had a far more modern fleet than the Chinese, all things considered, and a far better lead <laughs> fleet. But um, the Chinese had two ironclads, one of which you can see here later on in Japanese service, because you can tell it didn't do them too much good. But although ostensibly obsolete by the mid-1890s, these things had so much armour that there was not a tremendous amount you could actually do to sink the blasted things. Scour the crews from the upper decks with quick-firing guns, sure. Actually in any way impede their ability to fire their main guns or put them under the water? Not so much. They are just big slabs of iron at that point and there was precious little to be done other than kill everything else around them and hope they'd eventually surrender. There was also a engagement between Gerben, the ex- German battlecruiser in the Black Sea versus some Russian pre-dreadnoughts, ostensibly obviously obsolete. The Russians, of course, didn't have that many dreadnoughts available to them, and at the time they didn't have any operate ones operational, so they had, in the intervening years between Tsushima and World War One, decided to do a kind of by our powers combined option for their pre-dreadnoughts, where they'd all fire as a unit and ostensibly all take ranges from a single ship. And this actually kind of worked against Gerben. Um, they, the, the plan as originally envisaged didn't quite work out, but the idea of the small contained squadron of pre-dreadnoughts all engaging a single larger target actually ended up working out quite well because it meant Gerben was under fire from multiple different sources, coordinating their fire and actually scoring a number of hits whilst... In return, Gerben obviously could only focus on one target at a time, and any damage it did to the ship it was targeting had absolutely no effect on all the other ships, so they could just keep on firing, and as a result, eventually Gerben actually broke off the action. Whereas, in theory, she should have been able to pick them off one by one. And whilst it's not a specific engagement, a number of fights in the Battle of the Atlantic between old destroyers and U-boats technically count, because, of course, the modern anti-submarine escort, sloop, corvette, frigate, destroyer escort, whatever you want to call it, is a somewhat slower vessel because it only has to keep up with and slightly exceed the speed of convoys and also tend to be somewhat lighter vessels because, you know, they're built to be produced in as large numbers as possible. Whereas when you have some of the old V&W class or um, town class destroyers, um, the latter being the four stackers that were um, taken off of the US in, for the, in the destroyer for bases deal, those ships, whilst they're not necessarily as agile, they're somewhat larger and a lot faster, which means that you know they're there in the convoy escort as opposed to operating with the fleet because they're obsolete, but because of their destroyer origins, it means they are actually, they actually have something of an advantage when it comes to running down enemy subs because they can move faster than your average anti-sub escort. And also if it comes to ramming, being somewhat larger and somewhat more heavily built, they come out better in that field as well. Capitano Lorenzo asks, Contra-rotating propellers have been successfully used on aircraft and torpedoes for many years. Have contra-rotating propellers ever been used on any naval vessels? Cost aside, are there technical obstacles and issues that need to be overcome? I get rotational speed is limited by cavitation concerns, but aren't you just essentially doubling the surface area of your propeller blades without increasing diameter? It's theoretically possible to do, um, and indeed in the modern era it has been done uh, in two ways. One very similar to the way that aircraft do it, as you can see here with this prototype. American aircraft with contra-rotating propellers, because that's, to be honest, where most photos of contra-rotating propellers are going to come from. And also, more recently, it's been experimented with by having a conventional propeller and then putting a pod with a counter-rotating propeller that's kind of facing it. So 
that obviates the issue of having to have one shaft inside the other. But that's modern. Back in the time those channel covers, no. Um, as far as I'm aware, nobody ever seriously thought about putting contra-rotating propellers on anything big Navy-wise, any actual full-on naval warships. The reason it shows up in torpedoes is twofold. One is the fact that the torpedo has to fit within a confined space, usually a 21-inch torpedo tube, if you're talking about a submarine-launched weapon. And that means there is a hard cap on the size of the propeller. And so if you want to get it up to any kind of reasonable speed and efficiency, the contra-rotating option is pretty much the only way you're going to get that done. If you have a uh, torpedo that just runs on a single propeller, it's not going to go very far or very fast just because of the limitations of the surface area. The other factor, with torpedoes at least, is a similar factor to one of the reasons contra-rotating propellers are quite popular with aircraft in the latter stages of propeller aircraft development, which is that it cancels out the torque because proportional to its overall size, the amount of propeller surface area and the amount of torque generated for a torpedo is actually quite large and given that you want you know you want your torpedo to go in the proper direction a contra rotating propeller that then can cancels out that torque makes the work of the gyroscopic guidance a lot easier with ships that latter part which is usually one of if not the most important reasons of taking up a contra rotating propeller layout doesn't really apply because proportional to the size of a ship, the size of the propeller and the torque it generates is a lot, lot less. Also, it's not on the center line, which helps offset it somewhat as well. You've also got buoyancy um, and resistive forces going. But basically, on a large ship, you normally don't need to worry at all about torque generated by a ship's propellers. And to be honest, even if you did... Uh, which, okay, on some of the higher power ships you might have to, then there's a much more technologically simple solution, which is to simply have the opposite propeller, because pretty much all warships, by, at least by the 20th century, have at least two, have that opposite propeller just rotate in the other direction, rather than invent the, or adapt the highly complicated contra-rotating option with one shaft nestles inside the other on a single propeller shaft. But the main problem, the main reason why it doesn't really show up on capital ships is the technical complexity and cost. Because, as I said, outside of some very, very, very niche circumstances, you're not exploiting the fork cancelling effect of a contra-rotating propeller. And the slight efficiency upgrade you get, regardless of that, doesn't really compensate for the absolutely colossal amount of money that you'd have to spend in both developing the thing and then maintaining it because you, the other thing you've got to remember is that especially when you're talking about things like cruisers and capital ships the amount of power that's going down those propeller shafts um you can't really thin out the tube of the shaft all that much so if you're going to have two contra rotating shafts you're going to have to make your propeller shaft significantly larger and significantly heavier to fit the smaller one inside if you make the walls thinner, that's a way to get things to buckle, and the shaft will flex anyway somewhat, which, again, is going to make things a lot more difficult, because um, you could end up with jams. So, yes, in theory you could, but the only real place I can see such a thing having an application will be on probably something like a super destroyer, where you're desperately trying to get the thing to go as fast as humanly possible, and you're already spending stupid amounts of money into a highly complex and niche vessel so you might as well go the whole hog and give it maybe a pair of ultra high speed contra rotating propellers and see if that does you any good um it'll probably jam horribly and be the single least mechanically reliable power plant in the history of mankind but when you're building 40 plus not super destroyers you're probably already doing that anyway clayton bradish asks in the vast majority of u.s history Washington corners Cornwallis in Yorktown, the French fleet defeats the British fleet, the US wins the war, but nobody in the US seems to know what actually happened in that battle between the British and French fleets. So what did happen? So the Battle of the Chesapeake, or the Battle of the Virginia Capes, depending on who you want to listen to when it comes to naming the thing, was 
simultaneously a very indecisive but also massively decisive battle. It was indecisive on the tactical level in as much as both fleets made away without actually having captured or destroyed either, any of the other ships, although the British would then later scuttle one of their own ships due to some reports that it was too heavily damaged. But on a strategic level, it was incredibly decisive because it enabled the victory of the um, American and French armies at Yorktown. Now, the reason it allowed that is because the French were able to do two things. Firstly, the actual fleet involved, de Grasse's fleet, was able to bring in several thousand additional troops to start with. But more importantly, <clears throat> both by not ceding ground and making the British withdraw, as well as luring the British away from the mouth of the Chesapeake, it enabled a large French supply fleet, which had even more troops, supplies, and siege artillery, heavy siege artillery, to come in, unload, and again, strengthen the American and French forces that were besieging Cornwallis. If neither of those things had happened, then the forces available to besiege Cornwallis would have been significantly smaller and lacking in much heavy siege equipment, also having short supplies. And to be honest, even the sort of several thousand troops that the fleet itself landed, whilst useful, again, without that supply convoy coming in afterwards, then they would still have been on a something of an uphill climb. Additionally, of course, if the French fleet wasn't there or had been defeated, then the British would control the waters, which would mean not only would they obviously block the incoming French resupply convoy, but they in turn would be able to supply Cornwallis. So he'd be able to receive food, new equipment, uh, reinforcements of troops, take the wounded away, and maybe even some of the ships would have landed some guns to help in counter battery fire, all of which would have made the loss at Yorktown for the British probably not occur. Now, in terms of how the battle actually formed, the Americans, when they realized, you know, we're going to have to attack, um, you know, attack Yorktown, this is something where we need sea control. So they didn't have a navy that was capable of sea control. So they wrote to the French, their allies, and said, um, yeah, we kind of need some help. The French responded with a fairly large fleet. The British in the West Indies had had their forces depleted by a recent hurricane, but they still had a relatively substantial force, an Admiral Hood, well, one of the many Admiral Hoods of the various areas of the Royal Navy, but this edition of the Admiral Hood um, was sent north with a fleet to stop the French. And in a, something that's somewhat reminiscent of Nelson at the Nile, he actually arrived off the Chesapeake to see what was going on before the French did. Um, finding that there were no French there, he went off to New York to find out what was going on, um, met up with Admiral Graves, who then took command, um, which would end up being somewhat unfortunate for the British. And then when they realised that the French supply convoy had left, they realised, well, there is only one place that a supply convoy and a French fleet would both be going, and that is where Cornwallis is. So they headed on over to try and stop the French. Now, at this point, they had gotten their well, returned in the case of Hood, after de Grasse's fleet had arrived, but before the big supply convoy arrived. Um, de Grasse scrambled his ships to try and uh, counter them, obviously. A, lot of, a number of the British ships weren't in particularly brilliant condition in the first place, but after a bunch of manoeuvring, you ended up with the two battle lines heading in the same direction, parallel to each other, but then started to close in at the front, at the van. Now, that wasn't a particularly brilliant solution because the French decided, well, we're just going to sail in a straight line. The British have to close us down to open the engagement, which, of course, means the French can fire their entire broadside, whereas... The British ships, depending on where they are, would be limited to either firing basically their bow chaser guns, or if they could get a broadside off, their broadside would be a long-range one against French ships further down the line rather than the French ships in their own van, which were the ones that were pelting them with cannon fire. And bearing in mind, this is the pre-revolutionary French Navy, so the level of expertise in their sailors and their rate of fire was considerably higher than it would be in the revolutionary era French Navy for the most part. 
And so the two lines closed um, because the British couldn't bring much of their firepower to bear in the van engagement. The French generally got the better of it, although the French ships did take something of a battering as well. And thanks to conflicting signals and a, to be honest, lack of aggression by Admiral Graves, which was something that the Royal Navy, subsequently, thanks to both this and Admiral Bing, would seek to drum out quite quite um, decisively and succeeded in doing later on. But at, at this point, it meant that there was effectively three stages of engagement. You had the van, which you can see depicted here, of both sides blazing away at each other, smashing each other to pieces. You had a kind of long to mid-distance engagement in the middle of the fleets, which didn't accomplish all that much. And then the rearmost divisions occasionally would send the odd cannonball each other's way, but basically did not a lot. And the battle kept drifting east away from the Chesapeake, and then it kind of petered out in the evening. So, no, as I say, no particular decisive advantage gained. The British still had the windward position, which meant they could close down the French ships, albeit it also meant that, again, as you can actually see very accurately depicted here, um, it meant that the French ships were healing slightly to their starboard, which meant all of their guns could fire, whereas the British ships also healing to starboard, but obviously now that this, um, the, their starboard battery and the French port batteries being the ones that are engaged, it meant that some British ships had to keep their lower gun ports closed because you know, the ship's healing a bit too close to the water. They didn't want to repeat of the Mary Rose. But all in all, once the winds shifted and the day, the next day dawned, um, Graves decided that the damage that some of his van ships had taken was too much. He scuttled one of his ships and rather than renewing the action or doubling back to the Chesapeake or anything else, he just decided, yeah, whatever, um, and went back to New York, which turned out to be a horrific mistake because, of course, that meant that the French supply convoy, as we mentioned earlier, had managed to show up, and de Grasse just thought, okay, fine, I'll, I'll go back and occupy the Chesapeake, and good luck getting me out of there anytime soon. And thus the French and American troops on land got all the supplies they needed, all the extra troops they needed, all the heavy siege artillery they needed, and Cornwallis got none of those things, and ended up having to give up, and that was pretty much the end, realistically, of any British hopes of maintaining control of the 13 colonies, and hence you get the USA. William Timothy Murray asks, There have been some obvious benefits to civilian life that we enjoy today due to technologies, engineering and sciences that were originally invented, refined or developed for use in navies. Some are fairly obvious, like radar and navigation aids and methods and safety practices. Can you go over or list some other such things, especially material things that we commonly use in civilian life that we might take for granted that have a naval origin or history? A lot of technologies fall into this category, but to varying levels, whether they're invented, as you say, or refined because of naval demands. So, for example, the fundamental core of having accurate timing devices falls under something that was very much pushed forward by naval development because it was theoretically possible to have a very accurate um, clock on land. You had all the space you needed, it didn't tend to move very much, so all was well and good. But that wasn't especially useful to you if you wanted to, you know, travel around with a accurate timepiece. And those kind of things were far too big to fit on shipping. And so the desire for accurate navigation meant that eventually, through competition, a accurate and somewhat more portable timepiece was devised, which is a video in and of itself, in order to allow ships, specifically naval ships, to navigate and fix their positions accurately. This, of course, meant that not only did timepieces generally become a lot more accurate, but as I mentioned, they also became smaller and a lot more portable, which then allowed for the proliferate, proliferation, try saying that six times quickly, um, of this technology into the wider world, which in turn meant that, you know, people could then do things where the, the need for accurate timing was, was required. And although these days we don't use wind-up clocks all that much anymore, 
the fundamental basis of accurate timekeeping as an aid to navigation is a naval technology and we use it today in everything from the GPS in your phone to the GPS in your car to you know making sure your airliner ends up in the right place and so on and so forth. You also have naval developments to thank in large part for mass production. Now, yes, everyone thinks, oh, yes, Henry Ford, the Model T, that's the start of mass production. No, 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 no. Mass production with somewhat standardized sizings goes back a lot, lot further than that. It just didn't really emerge into the civilian market to a massive degree further back. So you had things like rope walks from making ropes and... Um, industrialized pulley and block and tackle making systems all developed in the age of sail for navies those are the underlying bases of mass production i mean even further back if you want to go back back even further there's also the standardization of iron cannon now granted the boring out of the guns leaves a little bit to be desired in terms of accuracy but the idea of standardized semi-mass produced iron guns was again a naval technological development and those kinds of things were refined and refined and refined um, for naval use and to an extent also bleeding out into army use. And they, again, set the underlying stage for the idea of a mass production line of standardized parts, which was then taken up and developed elsewhere, including on the Model T production line, for use in civilian uh, life. Almost anything to do with optics was also originally primarily a naval invention now yes of course you had astronomers who were demanding fairly precise optics for their observations of the skies but the type of thing that they were looking for mainly telescopes and the size and number of instruments that they asked for was basically nothing in comparison to the demand for telescopes and later binoculars amongst navies and then of course also rangefinders and other bits of equipment like that and that meant that if you were going to be an advanced player in the field of high precision optics you were pretty much certainly going to be supplying your navy and possibly several other navies so people like zeiss um, for example very very um forward in that and of course you think about what do we use precise optics for these days well all sorts of things cameras your phone which tends to be these days a camera that can also make phone calls um telescopes and binoculars obviously we still use those quite a bit um, and there's, those technologies obviously apply in terms of precision and accuracy to things like microscopes which we use in all sorts of scientific procedures um, so again a technology that really got its its body work going if you like in the naval field although other people were doing it as well and has then branched out thanks to the advances made there and to round this particular one off um, also fair amount of medical information because on land you know you have all sorts of resources available to you in all sorts of conditions which makes large-scale medical experiments somewhat difficult now of course large-scale medical experimentation on people is generally viewed as unethical but when you have a warship at sea and medical complaints break breaking out like scurvy or tuberculosis or whatever well, one, you have a very good incentive to not make those things happen, say nothing of battle injuries, uh, because you want your crew healthy and mostly intact. And two, you have effectively, especially in the age of sail, a large, months-long, if not years-long, self-contained experiment area with a, relatively speaking, compared to at least a land population, uniform set of subjects. And that means that you have both the method and the means to conduct scientific experiments, for lack of a better term, to work out how to solve these things. So whether that be cleaning a ship, ventilating a ship, giving people citrus juice or sauerkraut to prevent scurvy, or doctors figuring out how they can treat fairly major trauma on patients at sea with relatively minimal equipment without killing them or getting them killed via post-operative infections and the like all of this is stuff that is pretty much forced to develop by the advent of long distance sailing with warships and so we still enjoy many of the benefits of the, that today because you know, a lot of that stuff is underlies further medical advances 
Frosius asks, in your opinion, were there any noteworthy naval actions by the various warlords during the Chinese Civil War, 1912 to 1949? Nothing that I'd consider a particularly notable naval engagement. Um, in 1949, there are a bunch of small naval engagements. Uh, the two probably biggest is the defection of the ex-HMS Aurora from the Nationalist Chinese to the Communist Chinese, and then its subsequent sinking by the Nationalist Chinese by air attack. And of course, the HMS Amethyst incident, which is a whole complete mess of its own that I'll cover at some point in the future. But those are pretty much the two biggest incidents. There are a bunch more naval engagements in the Chinese Civil War, but they happen 1950 and onwards. Whereas, to be honest, before 48-49, neither the Nationalist nor the Communist Chinese have any particularly large naval forces, period, whether they be Oceanic or Riverine. So whilst there are small engagements here and there which do involve ships or river gunboats of various sizes and descriptions, either from both sides, or obviously bearing in mind that the Japanese stick their war in as well against the Japanese, for the most part, yeah, in terms of noteworthy naval action, I can't think of any. I'm sure there's a few battles which were probably decided by the actions or inactions of gunboats on the rivers and such like but to be perfectly honest um nothing that i'm particularly familiar with would classify as notable connor johnson asks steam locomotives have cylinder drain cocks to allow any condensated water out of the cylinders when starting i'd imagine ships would have similar systems how was it generally handled on ships and how did it change between reciprocating engines and turbines so for those of you who might not be aware what these things are for, basically, if you have an engine and it's running on steam and then you shut it down and it cools down, then, well, there's going to be steam in the system. And as it cools down, that steam is going to condense and form you know, liquid water. And, well, liquid water is not a good thing to have in engine cylinders of any description, <laughs> let alone uh, turbines. So... Obviously, you want to get rid of that when you're powering the engines up again, because as the initial steam pressure builds, um, well, one of the ways of getting the water out is as the initial steam pressure builds open up uh, these valves and the water will be forced out and then you just have steam in there, which is good. Um, now, when it comes to reciprocating engines, vertical triple expansion engines and the like, they run on cylinders, so pretty much the same as a steam locomotive on land, they would have a cylinder drain cock or one or more per cylinder and the engineering crew would have to remember to keep to open them up get the water out and then close them up again as this pressure builds so pretty much the same as said on a land-based steam locomotive just perhaps on a larger scale when it comes to turbines however the turbines obviously don't have cylinders you provide high pressure steam to a set of turbine blades but there would still be draining lines fitted along the length of the turbine and those would have to be opened up as you were powering powering uh, the engine back up again uh, this is one of many reasons why if it was at all possible you would try to keep your engines ticking over if you were not going to be in harbor for all that long um, and also another reason why when ships were in harbour long term, you would power up an engine and then maybe switch over to another engine uh, and so on and so forth to avoid having water sitting in cylinders or within turbine runs, turbine blade runs for incredibly long periods of time. Because, of course, as well as the compression issues that having liquid water in the system could cause, if you keep it there for too long, you can also get corrosion issues, which are even worse. Rebel Skvirl asks, assuming that the USS Akron, Macon and Los Angeles were not destroyed but remain in service when World War II breaks out, what roles could these airships have realistically played during the conflict and would they have been effective in those roles? So this is a question that's come up on a few other dry docks and effectively the, the one thing I can think of where they would serve relatively successfully, again assuming they don't just break up randomly in World War II after the magic protection wears off, 
would be as anti-submarine escorts. Uh, airships of varying descriptions had a reasonable amount of success in this role. These things are bigger, longer range. They can hang around for longer periods of time. They can fly higher, etc. And, of course, at least in the case of Akron and Macon, they can also launch small aircraft. So I foresee them acting as basically large, hovering, uh, dash following, anti-submarine scouting assets with the additional advantage that if they see something, and bear in mind they're big enough, you can mount even the early air-to-surface radars on them, so you can have plenty of uh, spotting capability. They can either go out and check something themselves, or dispatch an aircraft, and the aircraft equipped with a few small bombs can attack the U-boat instead. The only caveat to that is, although that they, in theory, would have the range to cooperate with the convoys all the way, I'd probably use them to cover the mid-Atlantic gap where conventional aircraft can't cover um, for as long as possible, if for no other reason than if they head further east, they might run into long-range German patrol aircraft, and then you might have possibly the world's most ungainly air-to-air dogfight where something like, say, Akron equipped with a bunch of Orlikon 20mm anti-aircraft defences is fighting a circling FW200 or something like that in a kind of, I don't know, three-dimensional aerial battleship game. So effectively, they become a flying escort carrier with even better radar search capability. Kra F1 asks, How valuable was ultimate top speed versus cruising speed or range? For example, having an extra one or two knots top speed on your ship would be handy in combat, but if this came at the cost of one to two knots in your cruising speed, your ship might not be at the said fight in the first place. How did navies of the early 20th century approach this balance in ship design and operation? It depends on the kind of ship you're looking at. If you're looking at it in terms of battleships, having an extra knot or two is actually much less helpful than you might otherwise think. In fact, it can actually be a detriment. Um, when you look at, say, for example, the US Standard class, there's a very good reason why the US kept pretty much all of them at 21 knots. Because if you have ships that are substantially quicker, like, say, the Queen Elizabeths, or battle cruisers, um, then they can have an ultimately different use because they're fast enough that they can meaningfully draw away from the fleet even when the fleet's operating at full speed. But if you have a maximum speed that's only a knot or two off of everybody else's, well, you're not really going to get very far if you try and outpace everyone. But equally, you're going to have huge problems station keeping because you're if you everyone goes to full power, you're going to be just creeping slightly out of speed of everybody else and regulating your RPM and steam pressure to just enough to lose a knot or two and therefore keep formation is going to be a somewhat more complex task than if everybody else is just, well, we can go 21 knots when we open the taps. Um, so, yeah. Um in terms of the navies of the 20th century, it was basically a case of largely what is our current top speed um, for the fleet on average. And let's go with that because that's basically all we need. It's only when you're planning something of a paradigm shift in your fleet or technology has advanced quite significantly that you'll consider kicking your top speed up by a few knots. So, for example... Um, starting with the revenge class in actual fact the and in part there thanks to fisher changing midway um through their design process what kind of um, power plant they were going to have the british had kept with 21 knots 21 knots 21 knots in all their battle line you had the queen elizabeth theoretically 25 actually more like 24 and a half and then the revenges which originally was supposed to be back down to 21 but as i said thanks to fisher switching the um switching their power plant up they are actually capable of about 23 which then meant well you had renown uh repulse and hood which were obviously considerably fast as battle cruisers but then when they were looking at the next generation of battleships what would eventually become the n3s and then what became o3 and then nelson they decided actually we're going to stick with the 23 knot speed because it offered a bit of an advantage over everybody else's battle line and there were now enough ships between the qes and the r's to 
mandate that yes actually a 23 knot top speed might be quite useful but the US was still sticking with 21 knots the Japanese to be perfectly honest were doing their own thing going a bit all over the place with maximum top speeds um, but when it comes to your cruising speed versus your top speed most navies tended to have three speeds uh, for their battle line so you had obviously flank speed what you can do with your engines running at max power you then also tended to have a normal cruising speed and that would usually be in the lower teens in at least when you talk about world war one and to a degree in world war two as well um, so for example in the grand fleet depending on exactly what time period you're looking at that would be either 12 or 14 knots and this was the speed that was quite efficient obviously not particularly quick but you could motor on along at that speed for quite a long time you would then have a fleet cruising speed so this would be the speed that you'd go at if you were on a specific operation you needed to get to your target a little bit faster but you weren't going to go all out because you know the power requirements start to ramp up very quickly towards the end of your speed regimen so again using the ground fleet as an example that was 17 knots so that was the speed that Jellicoe advanced his fleet to in the immediate um, run up to Jutland and then, as I said, going back to the, your, your top speed, your battle speed. So when you look at the Grand Fleet, when it's cruising towards Shetland, it ends. It starts off cruising at this lower, much lower speed in the low teens. Then, as reports start to come in that fighting's going on somewhere, they accelerate up to the fleet cruising speed. And then once they know that actually combat is in the offing, they accelerate up to full battle speed. Now, obviously, when you're talking about fleets that have 28 knot battleships, the lower and mid cruising speeds are going to be somewhat different but you will still see a general cruising speed in the teens and then depending on the ship it might have a a mid sort of speed of either in the low teens or or sorry the high teens or the low 20s of knots which will be its kind of on approach to battle speed mark vakuzik asks would the Jeune Ecole have been a viable option for either the US Navy or the Navy of the Confederacy during the American Civil War? I'd assume that because of the smaller size of the primary warships, gunboats capable of being effective wouldn't really have been that much more economical than the ironclads they would have been facing. Well, there's two elements, well, two main elements, I should say, to the Jeune Ecole, one of which actually both sides in the American Civil War did attempt, that is using cruisers to raid the enemy's commerce and obviously here you have alabama versus kearsarge alabama of course being classic example of the confederacy's attempts to enact the commerce raiding side of things and of course the union also via partly via blockade but also partly via active ships at sea seeking to both capture confederate ships merchant shipping and hunt down confederate raiders like the alabama so that's certainly it something that was done but the problem with trying to make a je ne Col style doctrine in the 1860s is that the other main part of the je ne Col relies on small craft able to threaten capital ships now of course under the classic je ne Col paradigm that's torpedo boats um, and then later destroyers whereas in the 1860s torpedoes in the sense of the locomotive self-propelled torpedoes don't exist um, they do have torpedoes but they're what we would refer to as mines they're not a, a shipboard weapon as such and as you mentioned well you, yes you have gunboats but the difference between a gunboat going up against a monitor versus a torpedo boat going up against a battleship is that if a torpedo boat manages to loose its torpedoes against a battleship then it doesn't really matter whether the battleship erases it from existence two seconds later with a single shell because it's going to almost certainly be a mutual kill scenario assuming the torpedo hits whereas with a gunboat going up against a monitor well equally an 11 or 15 inch Dahlgren gun could cause a gunboat to cease to be on the face of this earth but if the gunboat let's say has been carrying around its own big Dahlgren or equivalent gun and fires back shortly before it's disintegrated well that hit might not do anything and even if it does something it's 
95, 99% not going to sink the monitor in question. I mean, you could get incredibly unlucky and have maybe a, a shot that lands just short skips under the armor raft, punches a hole in the side, and the crew's not particularly good at um, damage control, and the whole thing keels over and sinks. But that's spectacularly unlucky and unlikely as compared to, you know, what a torpedo hit would do to an ironclad. So that small, cheap, economical way of reliably taking out capital ships doesn't really exist in the 1860s, and thus the Je ne Col as an idea isn't an entirely viable option. Um, weirdly enough, if you sort of flip it on its head a little bit and look at the American Navy in general in the 1860s and 1870s, once you have monitors equipped with somewhat better, higher velocity weapons capable of piercing armour, in some ways, the monitors almost count as a form of jeune école. Um, they're a bit more durable than a gunboat or a torpedo boat, but in terms of being small, economical, and actually capable of smacking around a larger ship, they have some utility as coastal defence ships. Uh, and bear in mind, say, we're not talking about the American Civil War stuff, we're talking about the, sort of the next generation monitors where they actually have um, equivalent to battleship-grade armament, as opposed to the lower-velocity smashing-type weapons of the Dahlgrens. The Outer Circle asks, What if HMS Erebus and HMS Terror had chosen to risk the unknown passage east around King William Island? I know it was called King William's Land back then, and it was only speculated that it was an island and not a peninsula, but the area doesn't seem to suffer from the tight pack ice that Terror Bay, where they became trapped, did. Even if they were trapped anyway on reaching Terror Bay, they would have been far closer to help. Thoughts? I think it would depend on how far back they're changing course. Obviously, we don't know exactly where they went, because obviously no one survived to tell the tale, and nobody drew a detailed map. Uh, we can only speculate at the exact route they took, and where exactly they ended up, obviously, um, locked in ice. So the notes, obviously, that they left give some positions, but that only tells us where they thought they were at the time, once they were locked up in ice, and not really anything else. Um, but if we assume that for whatever reason on their initial approach towards um, the north of King William Island, um, so during the early part of their expedition, they had for whatever reason decided to veer towards the east. Maybe they, as you say, maybe they speculated it was an island, maybe they just saw a lot of pack ice and maybe saw a, a bit of a route past it or something like that. Um, maybe they even can, might even have looked at it and concluded, um, well, you know, we're going to get stuck in the ice. We're not going to make the progress before winter this year, but this route seems to be slightly less icy so we can get a little bit further south and hole up for the winter and come back again next year. So let's say they do that. Um, as you mentioned, it's probably going to clear the ice during the summer so they can try and head south and probably maybe during the early part of winter or the beginning of spring they might have um foot expeditions out like the one that led left the first victory point note and they might well discover that in fact king william island is an island and they might try for the southern passage um, and then maybe try and press further west who knows whether that'll succeed i don't know enough about the precise ice conditions through the southern part of king william island and certainly not what the ice conditions were like in the middle of the 19th century um, to be able to say whether they'd be able to make that passage or indeed if they did whether they'd then subsequently be able to make the passage out into the Pacific um, but may maybe that's a chance but as you mentioned the thing is even if that doesn't happen they are significantly further south closer to help and the that bay or that they'd be running into on the east side of king william island does run even further south still so perhaps if they concluded after the second winter um that actually we're not going to get out of here in any way shape or form then perhaps as that second second winter in the area comes to an end uh, and the ice starts to clear a little bit they would have maybe sailed the ships as far south as humanly possible before beaching them 
and then abandoning the ships, in which case some of them might have been able to make it back home. You know, it just yeah, I think it depends at that point what state the crew is in, because it's not just that they were trapped in ice for a long time. Physically, they were not in the best of conditions, it would appear, when they left the ship. And they certainly weren't thinking particularly straight, given some of the contents of the stuff they took with them. Um, but who knows, with this altered condition, they might they might be slightly better off. Matt Kidd asks, you've spoken about many influential officers in various navies over the years. Are there any examples of an enlisted man figuring significantly in the Navy's history, excluding being known or important just for his valorous actions in combat? Well, it depends how you define the question, because you can either look at it from the point of view of someone who was an enlisted man, who then rose through the ranks and figured significantly in the Navy's history, albeit mostly due to their actions as an officer, or an enlisted man who became very significant in the Navy's history, as you say, outside of combat, because of what they did as an enlisted man. The latter is much more difficult to answer because, well, you know, outside of combat, an enlisted man is fairly low down the pecking order, which means their opportunities to influence the general course of the Navy outside of doing something in the middle of a furious gun action are quite limited unless you want to count perhaps an enlisted man who then leaves the service and then does something that actually benefits the navy quite significantly um, usually by inventing something or something similar to that whereas the first part someone who starts off enlisted and then works their way up the ranks becomes very important that's somewhat easier because in various navies that was a route that was open to people um captain james cook the famous navigator and map maker for example as pictured here a he started his naval service quite late in life and b he started that service as an enlisted man um, he then worked his way up through into the ranks of commissioned officers and obviously went on his famous voyages although interestingly enough he was still on the um, enlisted route of things for quite a long time well after the point where he became technically a captain um, he wasn't actually a captain in terms of being a commissioned officer with the rank he was a captain because he was in charge of a ship he was more technically master and commander um, and then later on was actually made a, a if you like, proper captain. Mason asks, was it just a coincidence that HMS Barrett came off worse in both of her cruiser engagements, or would any of the other counties have done better? I think with her first engagement at the Battle of Cape Spartiviento, that is just... It's fortunes of war. You're talking about extremely long-range 8-inch cruiser gunfire going on, um the fact that anyone hit anything in, at that point um, in the 8-inch exchange is, was pretty much luck of the draw. I mean, yes, there were other hits going on, uh, one or two other hits going on uh, between other ships, but, you know, you could put any any number of World War II era cruisers of that period, 1940-41, in her situation, and whether she hits the Italians or whether the Italians or whatever you're substituting in hit her is kind of a coin toss um, so I'd say that's that's just a you know, fortunes of war when it comes to her engagement with Hippa on the other hand in that case that it's a bit of a weird one because she does drive Hippa off but the engagement also gets close enough that the secondary batteries are able to open fire on both sides and that, in those circumstances, you would, you should, I think, expect a county to be landing some hits. So it's not a particularly brilliant showing for Berwick the second time around. So I think if you subsed in any other county for Berwick in her engagement with the Italians, it's probably going to be much of a muchness. But I think if you put one of the more experienced um, counties in, such as, say, Norfolk or Suffolk, um, or Dorsetshire, for that matter, at that point, and there, in place of Berwick for the engagement with Hippa, then I think at that point you probably could expect to see a number of hits on Hippa, um, as opposed to, you know, historically where Berwick didn't score any. 
Brady L asks, much is made of the delayed launch of the number four float plane from Tone during the Battle of Midway and how it caused Nagumo's dilemma. My question is this, had Tone number four launched on time, how likely is it to have missed the US carriers due to their different positions earlier in the day? And if it does miss the carriers, how does Nagumo proceed, proceed with his strikes and how does this affect the battle? So in the relevant section of Shattered Sword, um, John Parshall and Anthony Tully point out that if Tony's number four aircraft had launched half an hour earlier, roughly when it was supposed to have done, then it would have flown well south of the American carrier's position and not detected them, assuming that it then flew something approximating a normal search pattern probably would have then spotted the American formation on its return trip. So you'd be looking at the transmission being made probably, if, I, if memory serves, probably about half an hour to 45 minutes later than it was historically, which that, weirdly enough, probably isn't going to change all that much when it comes to Midway. So it's unlikely, although possible, that Tony's number four aircraft would, would completely miss the US carriers if it had launched on time, um, which would be a very different scenario, because at that point, well, Nagumo would just be in the process of probably, he'd probably just about be in the process of bringing aircraft up onto the deck ready to go um, to hit Midway when the US aircraft arrive overhead. So at that point, you would have actually had packed flight decks. Um, but in, in sort of the baseline of the question, if Tony's number four float plane um, has launched at the time when it was supposed to have done originally, and then reported back in late, then as I say, you're probably going to end up with roughly the same scenario because by the time the US aircraft show up, Nagumo will still have ordered his um, aircraft to switch from land attack back over to seaborne attack weapons. And that process is still going to be ongoing when the bombs start falling. So not a tremendous difference, I would have thought at that point. Meatwad wants to know, how much of an effect would Force Z have had if it had not been sunk? Well, for one thing, I, I mean, yeah, it's a valid question, but it's also what I tend to refer to as the hand slap question. And you may have heard me use this analogy before, so I'm sure many of you have probably played at some point in your lives the playground game where everybody puts a hand in. So you know, let's say I put my hand in, someone puts their hand on top of mine, someone else puts their hand on top and so on and so forth. And then you go back around. So everyone's hands on top of each other in a massive stack. And then the idea is you pull one hand out from the bottom put that on top and then the next and the next and very quickly it dissolves into a massive load of people trying to slap each other which is quite amusing but also incredibly chaotic and this kind of scenario is basically kind of like that everything devolves into chaos quite quickly because you've got to take into account you know how does force said survive in the first place does it survive because it sailed 24 hours earlier when the Japanese torpedo bombers weren't present. If it does, then what does it accomplish? Does it intercept the troop convoys that it was supposed to? Does it intercept Japanese cruisers or forces at night? Does it not intercept anything? Does it get attacked on the way home, um, regardless of any of the previous, and presumably by the question, somehow make it out? Um, or does it survive because, I don't know, some buffaloes show up a bit earlier or and um you know the pincer attack on repulse doesn't develop maybe by sheer flukes no one reactivates the broken prop shaft on prince of wales and so prince of wales limps back damaged and repulse limps back with well doesn't limp back but repulse wanders her way back with just some bomb damage to her hangar to show for it you know all of these scenarios will affect how things go um it, when they get back to Singapore and then you have the wildly branching scenarios following up from that because you know if Prince of Wales is 
badly damaged in the air attack but not sunk then she's going to be in dry dock for quite a while <laughs> so she's out basically out of action although she'd make a very useful um, defense ship to try and you know use a heavy artillery on incoming japanese troops during the siege of singapore um, but repulse is going to be available and out and about to do things whereas if they're both undamaged then obviously they're both available and then you have the question of you know if they are available in singapore whether it's partially damaged or undamaged do the japanese try and attack them in singapore harbor with bombers and torpedoes etc if so do they succeed if not when the japanese troops show up or perhaps if they do damage them and they reduce to basically stationary gun platforms how does their gunnery affect the defense of singapore um, if they're still undamaged by that point or at least able to get going and they let's say for sake of argument singapore continues to fall um because they, they might break the japanese attack on singapore you don't know um but if if singapore still falls and they're forced to sail off to join abda command well then obviously abda command now has a massive firepower advantage over the historical japanese forces that they faced but if the two capital ships are with ABDA command then the Japanese are very likely not going to just send cruisers and destroyers out they're going to send at least the Congos they with Prince of Wales around they might even send out a capital ship or two which ones do they send how does that work out do, will they actually make the interception will Prince of Wales and Repulse chew up some Japanese lighter forces or will there be a big gunfight Will there be further strikes by the torpedo bombers? You know, all of these are potential scenarios. The only thing you can say is that if for said for some reason hadn't been sunk, it would have had huge knock-on effects in the Southwest Pacific theater for as long as they happen to last. Rodney McCoy asks, I was thinking about the dry dock question concerning Dan Callahan and what, if any, battle plan he had for the 1st November night battle at Guadalcanal. So, Drac, I'm putting you in Admiral Callahan's position. What would you have done? So, obviously, this question is somewhat difficult to answer completely realistically, because, of course, I know what happened at that battle, and I know what the technologies available were. And so, if you put me back in time in place of Admiral Callahan, um, well, I have a lot of advantages over him. Uh, just in terms of my baseline knowledge of you know the fact that this has already happened to, for me but trying as much as possible to eliminate the hindsight bias and answering i guess i suppose how i would act given the generic scenario so let's see what i know i know that the japanese are pretty good at night fighting i know that we have radar i know that that radar is new but it's potentially quite interesting um personally i quite like new technology so i'd be very interested in that um so i would want to use it um perhaps trust it a little bit more however i'm also not the world's biggest fan of parading around into the night in a massive long line I appreciate that the forces i've got fighting with me haven't fought really with each other all that much before and i have a limited number of them but I think I would end up, again, trying to be as, as little hindsight as possible, I would probably end up, rather than sailing in a long column, I would, uh, a long line, I'd sail in three columns. So I'd take O'Bannon and Fletcher, which are two of my destroyers with SG radar, and I'd put them each at the head of a destroyer column, which is flanking m my three cruisers. So Helena would be leading the cruiser line, followed by... Uh, my two eight inch ships the atlanta and juno would be placed as flotilla leaders amid the two lines of destroyers so you'd have on the left hand column o'bannon leading cushing followed by atlanta then laffey and sterrett then in the middle the column of helena then san francisco then portland and then on the right fletcher aaron ward then juno then barton and monson this also means all my torpedo armed ships are on my flank so i'm sailing more as a compact column formation and i'd discuss with the captains beforehand what my battle plan is my battle plan is well this way i've got 
guns and torpedoes available on all sides and we're in a nice compact formation with three sets of SG radar scanning ahead. Now if we end up with an SG radar contact coming in then the instructions would be to confirm that contact with the next adjacent ship which is going to be Helena in most cases or if Helena um, detects it then whichever destroyer is more to that side of the contact and then once they've confirmed between themselves that yes in fact this is a real contact they're to pass that message back to me on San Francisco because let's assume I'm on San Francisco as Callahan was historically and because now San Francisco is directly behind Helena well you can use radio but you can also just use a signal light um, have some pre-arranged signal sets to indicate you know enemy to the left enemy to the right bearing whatever now once the enemy is detected the idea and confirmed and i say yep okay good to go the idea is that the near side torpedo armed column either the destroyer column with the atlanta or juno depending on which column it is will position itself to launch a torpedo spread from a single set of launchers and with the atlantis that means their only set of launchers on the available side at the enemy fleet at the range that they, we estimate we're in range of our torpedoes then that column is going to break towards the enemy move in as close as possible to the enemy scouting units their own destroyers and engage whilst they're doing so they're coming in basically behind the cover of their own torpedoes they're retaining their second set of torpedoes or in the case of the atlantas their other side launcher they're retaining those for close range action picking targets of opportunity the rest of the column i.e my light cruiser helena and my two heavy cruisers and the other destroyer column will also break towards the enemy but take a little bit more time about it so i'm going to keep the spacing between my cruisers a little bit larger which will in theory allow for my offside column to come through my gun line if necessary uh, but the idea is that they will start to accelerate to speed so they'll start to slightly overhaul me and then as a unit the cruisers and the offside column will bear towards the enemy and the idea is at that point then i basically have the offside unit riding my flank but on the opposite side to where the enemy is which means I then have a clear, hopefully a clear field of fire because the near side column's already gone off and the bearings will be shifting. And then as and when the engagement begins, if necessary, I can send my fast column of destroyers and whatever Atlanta class is there into the fray. If not, then they can conduct long-range gunfire support or torpedo fire. They're also available close by if I get ambushed by enemy destroyers. Um, and in absolute worst-case scenario, if you know the amount of enemy that have been revealed is significantly stronger than my own nearside column, I can throttle back my cruisers and allow my now operating at full speed offside column to cut across my front and head in to support um, the nearside column. So how would that work out in the actual battle? Well, assuming that we're heading north when radar detects the enemy, then in theory that would then be O'Bannon's column with Atlanta would break towards the Japanese and start engaging uh, the first Japanese destroyers. Uh, obviously follow first a torpedo salvo and then coming in with a gun salvo. I'm going to be angling in and then Fletcher's column with Juno is going to be coming in to my right. So that means that Fletcher, Fletcher's column is going to be engaging ships like Harasume and Yudachi. Um, and I'm pretty much on a collision course with um, Nagara, Hie, and Kirishima. Which is not the world's best outcome considering that I'm three cruisers and they're a cruiser and two battle cruisers. But um in theory with atlanta in support my four destroyers should crush ikazuchi akazuki and inazuma um, and they've got torpedoes to spare so as i'm coming in and he and kirishima are getting very worked up about um helena san francisco and portland my 
what was my near side column should be able to launch their remaining torpedoes in a broadside torpedo assault on the Japanese capital units, and my offside column, led by Fletcher, should still have all their torpedoes still available and should be slightly ahead of me, so they'll be able to launch, cross-launch effectively, against the targets that I'm engaging, whilst, again, the under orders to launch half their torpedoes at any given time so they're retaining the other half of their torpedoes so if dash when the left hand flank of the Japanese forces arrives they've got torpedoes to send their way as well broadly this on the left I think I should have a fairly decisive victory um, I've got the numbers and I've got the element of surprise the element of surprise gets worse and worse the further to the right or starboard that we end up going so Fletcher's column in theory is going to be gradually being fed Japanese destroyers but in increasing numbers so they may get overwhelmed but they have Juno there to help them so maybe not they sh it, but it's going to be a bit of a close run thing the closest run element is going to be mi myself Portland and Helena facing off against Nagara here in Kirishima now I don't have too many qualms about the fact we'll probably put Nagara down with prejudice um but quite how we're going to fare against here in Kirishima is another matter. I'll probably go and you know, charge in headlong. It's worth a try. The best place to do damage. Um, but I think a lot of how that's going to be successful or not is going to depend on two things. One, with Helena up front, there's a fairly good chance I might just completely smash up um, Hiei's ability to actually see what the heck is going on, um, which would be quite fun um you know blow up all their searchlights all their spotting platforms then it's pretty useless to counter fire me um of course if she catches a few 14 inch shells early on this could go quite badly um but i have backups to that because obviously san francisco and portland can pour eight inch gunfire and try and do some proper damage um but i think a lot of it's also going to come down to the in theory at least one possibly two torpedo flanking attacks coming in from my, my destroyer columns um, if we assume for the sake of conservatism that w the near side column is the one that gets a salvo off maybe the offside column is getting a little bit overwhelmed trying to deal with constant feeds of japanese destroyers well if they hit here and or kirishima then fantastic that's pretty much a win for me um, if they don't, then at least hopefully it's going to force them to dodge and weave, which will make life even harder for them. And hopefully, you know, again, having five versus three odds, including an Atlanta versus destroyers, hopefully they will have finished off the Japanese destroyers. So may, hopefully after launching their torpedo strike, they can come in and back me up and try and smother whatever Japanese capital units are available to target with lots and lots of five inch gunfire again disrupting the japanese ability to actually see me because i don't really want to be on the receiving end of 14 inch shells if you don't mind um it's going to be a complete mess and a melee but it's going to be a mess and a melee that i started and i started to my advantage you know of course there will be long lances in the water and such like but um one would hope the japanese might be a little bit more hesitant about randomly spamming torpedoes in the water when there's a bunch of their own friends around as well um quite how that's all going to go i don't know but it would be very very fun and interesting to find out paul from chicago asks why did the royal navy abandon transom sterns for the nelsons and especially the king george v considering that they had them in place for the G3s and N3s. Honestly, I genuinely don't know. I've looked through a lot of different sources prior to answering this particular question, and for the most part, where they even note that the G3s were designed with a transom stern, it's noted. Um, occasionally it'll say something like it wasn't repeated on the Nelsons, and then it just kind of goes away is kind of taken as red oh well okay and there's no there's no particular note made in the nelson design section as to why they reverted back to the conventional stern and then as you say obviously they did it with the king george v although in would have gone back to a transom on lions and vanguards so there's that i guess the only thing that i can think of without you know obviously without being able to reference other sources and say this is definitively why would be that 
perhaps Vanguard, Lion, G3, N3 are not so much built to the restrictions of any given treaty. So the designers are a bit freer to design whatever hull they need for the speed, fire protection and firepower that they've been asked to do, and thus they can include a transom stern in that design within reasonable limits. Obviously they're not going to be allowed to go completely crazy. Whereas with the Nelsons and the King George V's, they are having to be built right up to the 35,000 ton limit, and we know just how many corners were cut to get um, that in. Now, in theory, that should suggest that a transom stern should be included, because the transom stern effectively cuts off um, a section of stern, which would save weight, which would be good for, you know, coming in under the weight limits. However, at the same time, I it would require a theoretical slight rebalancing of the ship, and the hull lines are going to have to be slightly different. So it may well be that there's some other structural reason in terms of trying to fit as much volume, as much space in as humanly possible within a treaty limit to allow them to, and that that's kind of compels them to have a more standard elliptical stern. That seems to be the only thing I can draw personally at the moment because that seems to be the only connective factor between you know ships that the Royal Navy designs post-World War One. The ones that are designed with transom sterns have two varying degrees, not quite no limits, but looser limits on displacement, whereas the ones that are designed with the conventional sterns, at least in capital ships, are confined by what they uh, by treaty as to what they can do and have some fairly ambitious limits within that so that would be my guess but if anyone else has come across documents i haven't been able to see in the research i've been doing for this particular question and has a more detailed explanation then please feel free to let us all know in the comments because i'd like to know as much as anybody else chain gun 1701 asks how would damage control aboard differ on a starship versus an ocean ship and how would it be similar a lot of the damage control is going to be broadly similar but there's a few things will be more emphasized for example fire on a starship is going to be a far more dangerous thing than fire on an ocean going vessel and that's saying something considering that fire is one of the most deadly things you're going to encounter on an ocean going vessel but unless you're locked in a small compartment fire isn't going to steal all your oxygen on an ocean going ship whereas in space you have a limited amount of breathable air <laughs> on your ship and the more the fire consumes it the less air you have overall and yes you might have air recycling systems they ain't keeping up with a big fire you might have compressed air tanks or oxygen tanks great Let's hope the fire doesn't get to them, shall we? <laughs> so, fire would be even more of a priority to put out, although, on the other hand, you do have the option, at least in theory, of ventilating compartments into space, which would kill most fires. Um, so, unless it's deep within the ship, you probably actually have a slightly easier time firefighting on a starship than on an ocean-going vessel. Now, of course, if you have a hull breach... In an ocean-going ship, you have stuff outside that's trying to get in, which you don't want. Whereas on a starship, you would have stuff inside, i.e. your atmosphere, trying to get out, which you don't want. That part of damage control, by swings and roundabouts, is going to be slightly harder and slightly easier. Because on the one hand, you know, you've only got to worry about a single atmosphere of pressure in a starship. In an ocean-going vessel, you might have quite a lot of pressure of water coming in and if your ship is maneuvering or going at speed that can increase which can cause bulkheads to fail etc whereas on a starship as long as you've got the thing airtight it has to withstand one atmosphere of pressure pushing towards the the vacuum and if it's a relatively small breach then again on a ocean going vessel um you know even a small breach with a lot of high pressure water coming through can be very difficult to seal whereas with a spacecraft if you have a hull breach and the air is escaping then assuming the immediate debris etc has cleared it's not going to be a tremendously difficult process to just walk up to it and put a patch over it um, 
or you know file it down sand it down phaser it down whatever you need to do to get the patch to apply smoothly because again it's just one atmosphere escaping it's it's not a massive dramatic effect unless you're talking about the immediate aftermath of the, the shot impacting in the first place but conversely when you're in a compartment that has a breach in an ocean going vessel and the water is filling up you can at least breathe until the water fills up the compartment while you're trying to do damage control and that usually will take a while i mean put it this way if you're trying to do damage control in a compartment it's probably not had half its hull plating blown open to the ocean in which point obviously it would flood a lot faster whereas on a starship um you could lose all the atmosphere in a sealed room even through a relatively small breach fairly quickly which is going to make things more difficult because it means at the very minimum you're going to have to be operating with you know some kind of closed con breathing system which again unlike a uh, breathing system in an ocean going vessel you're going to have negative pressure outside because of the vacuum so you're going to have to have a slightly different method of attaching it to yourself as opposed to um, if you're underwater or um, or if you're in a, just a you know a smoke choked environment where usually the the pressure differentials are not going to be quite as much or if it is it's going to be working in your benefit Reva asks while I know the Royal Navy was concerned about it was jamming actually used at Jutland would not the presence of enemy jamming be something of a hey troubles over here sign as surely as hearing gunfire when it comes to indicators of hostilities elsewhere in the fleet as far as i can tell the jury's somewhat out on whether or not jamming was actually used at jutland there do seem to have been effects consistent with some form of jamming but whether that was intentional or not or just a product of so many radio transmitters and receivers operating in a relatively confined space is somewhat unclear i mean there's nothing at least from the last time i read through Shear's uh biography the or autobiography there's nothing in there that seems to indicate that he was specifically ordering jamming to be used but it could still have happened so uh at this point i don't know um whether jamming was deliberately in use at jutland but in terms of the presence of enemy jamming being an indicator yes and no bearing in mind this is world war one technology we're using so if you're completely unaware that the enemy is anywhere in the vicinity then yes if your radio starts to be jammed that's an indicator that actually there is an enemy in the vicinity and we didn't know they were there however in the case of jutland specifically once the battle has the main battle has concluded you're into the night action you have a situation where the both sides know that the enemy is there somewhere in the vicinity so having jamming flare up all that really tells you is okay well the enemy that we knew was here is here this isn't any new information or i mean all it really tells you is the enemy hasn't gone miles and miles and miles and miles away which i suppose is somewhat useful but not exactly surprising because things like uh, radio direction finding etc whilst they existed to a very limited degree using land-based installations in world war one they didn't really exist in terms of a board ship for the kind of blanket area jamming because bear in mind again jamming technology is not exactly very advanced in world war one it just consists of broadcast static or random noise music whatever you want really on the frequency that you don't want people to occupy anymore um you could probably kind of tell well there's it's maybe a little bit stronger over that way if we head in that direction but you don't really have that much in terms of directional antenna in world war one most of the radio antenna on a world war one battleship consists of very long cables stretched between the fore and uh, main masts so you're not exactly turning those without turning the entire ship which unless you're a destroyer you're very unlikely to actually be doing so you're not going to really be able to say ah yes well the main source of jamming is coming from over there therefore the enemy must be in that direction um for the most part world war ii things become a bit more advanced but in the middle of the night uh, during the 
that part of Jutland. It, it's yeah, it's not so much a trouble over here as just we are in the vicinity. Good luck figuring out where. Andrew Waite asks, would World War II naval aviators have benefited from having an angled flight deck to land on? I think it depends on the type of angled flight deck and the size of the carrier. So if you're talking small carriers, then unless you're going to go completely stupid proportionally, no, because it's not going to grant enough space. If you're talking about some of the larger carriers, then possibly, but again, as I say, it depends on exactly how much of an angle you're putting on the flight deck. Because if you're putting a relatively minimal one on, you can see here HMS Eagle, the audacious class carrier. Um, now compare that to a profile of Eagle's flight deck beforehand. There's not actually a tremendous increase in overall flight deck space. It's more about just having the overrun. And, okay, the overrun might help in as much as if somebody fails their landing, they're going to go off into the sea rather than directly in front of the oncoming carrier. But at the same time, when you look at the landing um, video footage of World War II aircraft carriers, World War II attack aircraft and fighters in general were landing in much, much shorter spaces, and they had crash nets and barriers and all sorts well before you'd run off the end. Um, the angle flight deck more helps the jets, which have a much longer uh, runoff period. So there'd be a minimal benefit at that point. Um, the other thing you might argue, I suppose, is that the angle flight deck gives you opportunity for conducting landing and takeoff at the same time. But again, with a relatively narrow angle, it doesn't improve all that much over the existing partial capability that World War II aircraft carriers already have to do that. Um, the two greatest benefits of a immediate post-war angled flight deck scaled back into World War II itself are that you, well, you have a slight increase in deck space overall, which means you can handle slightly more aircraft on the deck, which is always good. And to be honest, the angled flight deck, if anything, would probably be used as additional takeoff space. So you'd be taking aircraft off over the bow and probably also taking aircraft off or, or, using the angle. So you'd increase your sortie rate, um, but not necessarily your recovery rate. Now, if you were to take everything a step further now and obviously bearing in mind to say the larger the carrier the more proportional benefit it has so something like an Essex um, or a Shikaku would benefit from much more from an angled flight deck than something like say an illustrious would but if you were to look at both the amount of change that the angled flight deck gives as well as to a certain extent the size but if you look at something like the Forestal class supercarriers immediately sort of 19 well designed just about <laughs> 1950 and before laid down immediately after 1950 if you're talking about an angled flight deck set of changes like that where you have overhangs both to port and starboard significant deck overhangs to port and starboard the island's well set off um and the angle flight deck is is truly separated from the flight operational area then yes at that point an Essex or some implacable or something built in that style, yes, there would be huge benefits to that because now you've massively increased the deck space. You've got the the angle flight deck at an angle such that you can truly operate aircraft in full takeoff uh, sections and still have a significant safe sortie re uh, sorry, recovery area. And when you are in you know properly launching your strikes because of the shorter takeoff distance of world war ii attack aircraft you can also take advantage of the fact that you can sort the aircraft both off of the bow and off of your angled flight deck so i think overall yes there is a, there would be a certain benefit from having angled flight decks but you'd really have to apply only to the largest carriers so of the period so essex's chicago's and placables to get the most benefit and it would have to be, to get a, a me properly meaningful amount of benefit, it would have to be a Forrestal or other supercarrier style 
twin overhang quite substantially the side of the hull rather than the relatively narrow additions that were made to some carriers like Eagle and Ark Royal immediately post-war. DM Phoenix asks, At the Battle of Coral Sea, the small Japanese carrier Shoho was absolutely pulverised by no less than 13 bombs and 7 torpedoes. Needless to say, its 11,000 ton hull did not survive the action, with the American bomber commander famously commentating, Scratch one flat top. Not counting the atomic tests at Bikini Atoll, is this the most flagrant case of naval overkill in terms of the sheer amount of ordnance received per target tonnage, or is there an even greater example? I mean, you've got some other fairly famous examples of overkill at the period. Um, Bismarck is an obvious one. Yamato and Musashi are obvious ones. To a fair degree, actually, Scharnhorst, given the pummeling she was given right towards the end as well. I mean, even Tirpitz, because you're looking at about £28,000 in weight of ordnance being directed at Shoho. Tirpitz, if you only count direct hits in Operation Catechism, was hit by £36,000 of tall boys, which is obviously more. On the other hand, it's about, what, rough, not quite 50% more, whereas Tirpitz itself outmasses Shoho by a factor of well over four, more probably around about four and a half times. So in terms of uh, ordnance expended per tonne, then yeah, Shoho's still pretty much up there. All the other ships that, you know, as I say, Yamato, Masashi, Bismarck, you can argue are hit by an awful lot of munitions, probably more weight of ordnance in most cases, but in ordnance per target tonne, yeah, it's going to be pretty difficult to top Shoho. At least assuming that you believe 13 bombs and 7 torpedoes hit it. The Japanese accounts do dispute that amount. But, you know, I guess it depends on whose battle report you choose to believe. K Wolf X asks, What kind of added difficulties would the Grand Fleet and the Harwich Force commanders have had if the codes of the Kaiserliche Marina had not been captured so early in the war? Assume these codes could not have been broken for a couple of years, if at all, so only radio direction finding and signals intel could have been used to guess the intentions and determine the movements of the high seas fleet and its occasional destroyer force at Zeebrugge. Do you think the lack of code breaking ability might have forced them to the use of convoys sooner, seeing as sub hunter groups might have had a difficult, might have been very difficult or impossible to deploy without the ability to read messages sent from the U boats? Not that the sub hunter groups were all that useful, even with that information. Now, I don't believe it would have forced the introduction of convoys much earlier, mainly because one of the largest problems with getting convoys working in World War One, and granted there was some resistance to the concept overall, which a you know, worse situation at sea might have overcome, but the one of the biggest blockers was simply the fact that there weren't enough escorts. So especially in a situation where the Grand Fleet is having to guess a lot more, it's going to demand even more escorts in the form of destroyers. And thus, you know, there just physically aren't going to be that many destroyers and such like available for the convoys, um, which puts kind of a hard limit on when you're going to reintroduce them, unless some other circumstance makes the British start to churn out large numbers of oceanic convoy escort ships, basically a World War One equivalent of the flower class, for some reason, relatively early in the war. But the main effect is going to be in the North Sea with the operations of the High Seas Fleet, because now that they can't read the codes and know what the Germans are planning ahead of time, they're going to have to rely, as you said, on basic RDF and signals intel. Now, they'll probably be able to build up a general pattern of what's going on over time. Um... But, you know, things like increased amounts of signalling in the Jade Estuary area, likely meaning the High Seas Fleet is going to sail. OK, well, that's fantastic, but it doesn't say when, it doesn't necessarily say what date, etc. So everything's going to be a lot less precise, a lot slower to react. And so whilst with Room 40 Intel, they still moved the battlecruiser fleet down to Rosyth to allow it to try and intercept German raids on the coast, if they don't have this kind of level of intel, that you might very well see pressure to move the Grand Fleet further south so that when they get indications that something is happening, obviously with more delay, then 
the ground fleet has less distance to go to intercept its target, which could work out for the best. It could work out significantly worse, especially if everybody is packed into Rosyth somehow. I'm not entirely sure how that would work, but let's assume by some magical means they manage to stack the entire Grand Fleet into the further fourth. Well, you ain't doing any long-range gunnery practice at that point, believe you me. Um, so yeah, overall, it would mean considerably more difficulties, especially for the Grand Fleet. The Harwich Force... Um, probably slightly less affected because they have a short distance to go anyway and a lot of their encounters are somewhat more random as well and kind of they're given an indication that the enemy is going to be doing something in this area and so they go to investigate and they sometimes run into the enemy that will obviously the the granularity of the data will be marginally decreased by not having access to the codes but um not as much but overall, I think what it's going to mean is there's going to be a lot more paranoia when it comes to various operations. So, for example, when the monitors are sent to bombard the coastal portion of the Western Front, you're probably going to see significantly stronger guarding forces because they don't know as well as they did historically what the Germans may or may not be doing uh, about that. And also a, key, a number of key submarine interceptions probably won't happen because... Uh, a fair few sub interceptions were made because the subs were either signalled to or signalled back and their positions and their intentions were read and the Royal Navy was able to position forces to block them. Um, whereas, OK, with very basic land-based radar direction finding, they might be able to figure out, well, there's a U-boat there, but whether that U-boat is going to sail east, west, south, what time it's going to sail, where it's intending to go, etc., that kind of stuff, which is what Room 40 managed to figure out and what allowed the British to position intercepting units that they don't have so either they're just not going to have that level of success or they're going to again have to spread their resources even thinner to try and cover all possible approaches. Michael A. Klan, I think asks when the US Navy was bombarding the Japanese held islands did they use only high explosive shells or did they also employ armor piercing shells to penetrate bunkers and tunnel systems? Almost invariably, they would use HE shells simply because, um, well, battleships use AP shells to hit other battleships. Battleships are fairly large targets compared to that, a bunker or a tunnel whose exact location you may not even know is an absolutely tiny target. And the chances of you scoring a direct hit with an AP shell are minimal. Now, that's not to say they didn't use AP shells against, you know, certain targets in certain shore bombardments in World War II, where shore, where there big shore forts or fortifications, etc., whose locations were known, then yes, AP shells were used. And obviously, if there was, say, a Operation Torch, when you have Jean Barre popping off rounds, you use AP shells there. But if you're firing against a Pacific island held by the Japanese you're pretty much going to be using exclusively HE because, as I said, you, you don't know actually exactly where the enemy hard targets are. And even if you did, well, for one thing, a 14 or 16 inch HE shell is probably still going to do a proper number on a bunker anyway. Um, and it, as we said, it's really too small a target to accurately hit unless you go in right close, which you are not going to want to do uh, for the most part anyway. So, yeah, the, the, and you can actually see that when it comes to things like the Battle of Surigao Strait, where the amount of AP shells aboard the 7th Fleet ships had actually been drawn down quite significantly compared to their normal stock levels, precisely because they were expecting to conduct a lot of uh, shore bombardment missions, which meant they'd overstocked on the HE, which then meant that, well, I mean, fortunately they still had several hundred AP rounds aboard each, so when they engaged the southern force they could sink them but the following day they actually had very few ap shells left if they had been called on for another engagement nicholas Ressar asks after watching some interesting decisions from some playing ultimate admiral dreadnoughts was a literally all big gun ship i.e no secondaries at all ever a viable strategy outside of a few specialist things like monitors not really 
at least on paper. It, it's kind of an odd one. Back in the early to mid, probably mid-ironclad period, you have ships like Agamemnon here, then yes, it was a viable strategy because you were only going to go up against other large-ish ships, um, even corvettes and stuff count as large-ish for the period, um, and your armour would be proof against anything but the biggest guns, so therefore you only needed the biggest guns to take out the enemy because if you came across against up against something like a frigate or a corvette, well, they couldn't hurt you because you were ridiculously armoured, and you could take all the time in the world to blast them to pieces with your few large guns. And if you came up against a battleship, well, having light guns wouldn't be of any benefit to you in that situation either. So still only have a few large guns. Once torpedo boats get into the equation and then quick firing technology gets onto smaller guns, but not larger ones, then it becomes not such a viable tactic, again, at least on paper, because if you're going to be attacked by torpedo boats, you, well, A, you hope you have escorts, but you can't count on having escorts, and therefore there is a need for a secondary battery. Um, of course, once aircraft come in, you definitely need an anti-aircraft battery, but in that kind of period in the late 19th and early 20th centuries where aircraft aren't yet a threat, but torpedo boats are, Every bit of common sense says that you do need a secondary battery to defend yourself against them. Now, of course, against that, you can argue that, well, how many times did a battleship actually end up using its secondary battery against attacking destroyers? Which I suppose is a valid argument to a certain degree. I mean, the battleships at points would use their secondary batteries against each other as well um, but in their intended purpose there's actually relatively few engagements in world one slightly more common in world war ii because of the relative lack of numbers um, of ships generally for the most part but in world war one it was actually relatively uncommon a for the secondaries to engage their intended targets at all and b for them to actually do anything um, the most the most that, that ever tended to happen was usually Jutland in the night actions. So I suppose you could make an argument that, at least for World War One and maybe immediately in the run-up to World War One, so the first two decades of the 20th century, that perhaps whilst a scenario of a battleship being attacked by a torpedo boat or destroyer was a valid reason to have a secondary battery, in hindsight, the sheer unlikelihood of that happening, given all the cruisers and destroyers you had intervening between you and the enemy fast attack craft, possibly would mean that having just purely all big guns might be a valid strategy, especially if you could obviously then use the saved weight and space from not having a secondary battery to either up-gun your ship or up-armor your ship or both, or maybe make it a bit fa faster or whatever. But that's not so much that it's viable in whole, it's more of a, well, you might get some additional benefits fighting other things rather than, you know, guarding against this one un relatively unlikely scenario. But at the same time, as I said, that's hindsight. We don't, they didn't know at the time that it was going to be a relatively unlikely scenario or indeed that secondary batteries generally would prove to be somewhat ineffective compared to what they were supposed to do. David Toyne asks, in Admiral Seifert's diary for Operation Pedestal, it's noted that at about 11.50 on the 12th of August, as the convoy was coming air under air attack, that Rodney was laying down a barrage with her main battery. I assume, given the, the action at the time, this means an AA barrage. Did the Nelsons carry anti-aircraft shells for their 16-inch guns, and given their maximum elevation, how effective would they have been? Is this more a case of one-ton shells making a big bang and then I'm not flying anywhere near them being the pilot's reaction? Now, the interesting thing is that actually of all ships, Hood, believe it or not, early in the war seems to have engaged a target, an airborne target, with an adapted 15-inch shell that was used in an anti-aircraft role, although it seems it was probably more of a, a, t a literal timed fuse 15-inch high explosive shell that was mostly used to just scare off a shadowing aircraft because, well you think you're nice and safe miles and miles and miles away from the enemy fleet and then suddenly there's a colossal explosion <laughs> right near you so you think right i'm getting out of here um but no 
when it comes to the Deltas, they didn't have a 16-inch anti-aircraft shell. Um, what this is referring to, I'm 99.9% .9 certain, is a tactic that both Nelson and Rodney would use in um, the Mediterranean when under air attack, which is that when torpedo bombers were coming in, obviously they have to fly low and slow, and what they would do is they would fire their main guns loaded with high explosive shells into the sea ahead of the torpedo bombers, with the idea being that obviously you set up a massive column of water and shell fragments, which if the Italian bomber is dumb enough to fly through said um, sort of plume of water and shell fragments, it was probably going to knock it out of the sky, at least hopefully. Um, and if they avoid it, well then great, they've broken off their attack run. Um, obviously there's only a limited number of shells that you can fire, there's a limited number of uh, limited amount of volume that the, spl the splashes can occupy and you have to get all the timing right. So it wasn't a spectacularly effective technique, but as far as the wartime accounts from various sailors who witnessed it uh, state, it did seem to deter some Italian bombers. Others would, the torpedo bombers would just go around the, the shell splashes or whatever, um, but it had a limited deterrent effect. And I think this is pretty much what they're referring to. And you can kind of understand the logic to a certain degree, because if if a torpedo plane flew flew through the plume of uh, like, you know, several dozen tons of water being chucked up, it's probably not coming out of here the other side intact. Trevorius asks, with one of the main issues with battleship gunnery being dispersion at range, and with the battleship here existing simultaneously with early guided munitions, what were the limiting factors that prevented a country from ever developing a guided battleship shell, and was it doable at all? So there are quite a lot of limiting factors to this. Um, so firstly, you've got to think about how is this shell being guided? You've, broadly speaking, got three options, two of which are external and one is internal. So you've got Internal guidance, the, the shell is fired at a target and it guides itself. Um, I suppose there's a subset of that which is off-board target designation, but the shell is self-guiding. And then you've got externally guided shells, i.e. either radio control or manual, some kind of manual physical connection control. Now, that last one you can rule out pretty much immediately. Spooling wires out the back of a battleship shell in order to guide it in some manner is not happening. Because firing the shell is going to destroy anything <laughs> that you have attached to that shell in terms of, uh, you know, guidance wires or whatever. And if you're going to ex guide it externally via radio, well, you have two things. One shock sensitive electronics um you'd have to invent some kind of guidance system that can withstand the shock of being fired out of a battleship gun which is a problem that they struggle with even today um and and we have you know compact microelectronics not vacuum tubes which are a little bit more sensitive to being suddenly chucked out of a battleship gun at several thousand feet per second um so most likely your external radio guidance system is going to break when you fire the shell but even if it doesn't how do you guide the shell because bearing in mind the shell is you know as you can see has no particular aerodynamic guidance system and any fins or anything you put on it are most likely again to be destroyed when the shell gets fired um certainly any fine control motors or whatever um your only other option really at that point would be maybe some kind of, I guess, internal gyroscope that you could adjust and hope that your little internal gyroscope or flywheel has anything like the amount of inertia to actually affect the flight of a, you know, a shell that weighs as much as a small car in any meaningful way and also doesn't compromise the armor penetration capabilities of the shell because you're you know, occupying a internal volume with guidance system, thus weakening the shell's body overall. And then you've also got the fact that the thing is spinning quite a bit, so um, that's going to factor into your 
ability to guide the thing because everything inside it is also <laughs> going to be spinning so a course correction even if you somehow manage it, it's probably going to send it just wildly spiraling um, so you pretty much ruled out external guidance and then you've got a question of internal guidance either shell is a self-guiding projectile again you have a problem of how exactly are you going to make this thing into a guided projectile because you still have the problem of well anything you attach externally to this shell is almost certainly going to be destroyed uh, on firing and even if it's robust enough like maybe i don't know pop out wings made of metal assuming they somehow survive in some kind of intact state as i said before the control mechanism motors or whatever is probably not going to and even an internal guidance system like the us used on the bat bomb i.e the early anti-shipping missile not the let's attach incendiaries to bats and drop them over japan weapon um again almost certainly not going to survive the launch of the shell from the gun so practically speaking no a, a guided battleship shell is not doable in world war one or world war two circumstances and as I said, you know, they still have trouble with it today with a lot more advanced technology that's a lot less susceptible to breaking horribly when you fire it out of a high-velocity weapon like a 16-inch you know, gun. The Rogue Chief asks, In your King George V Wednesday special, you discussed how the myths of the difficulties with the class's quadruple turrets have been taken out of proportion, and yet you still spoke of the troubles encountered with the quadruple turrets as well as the triples for the Nelsons and the original Bayern plans. Why were there such recurring problems in making a turret for anything more than two guns? So there's a combination of factors going on. I've mentioned in other dry docks, one of the problems with making a multi-gun turret is that every time you add an extra gun, everything gets exponentially more difficult in terms of keeping everything working at the same time because everything's gotten a lot more complex. And it's not just a matter of, you know, saying, oh, well, we have let's say, I don't know, each gun has, and its loading mechanism, its elevation mechanism, etc., has a 90% chance of working on any given day. I mean, that would be pretty terrible normally, but let's, for the purposes of argument, say, you know, uh, a single 14-inch gun has a 90% chance of working. So you might think, if you don't understand probability and statistics, that well, if you have four, that just means you still have a 90% chance because it's all the same. Well, no, that's not how it actually works. With probability and st uh, specifically, you have to multiply the chance of each thing within a system going wrong or going right or whatever. So if your odds are 0 0.9, uh, uh, then you have to do 0 0.9 multiplied by 0 0.9 multiplied by 0 0.9 multiplied by 0 0.9, and that will give you the result for, let's say, a quadruple 14-inch uh, turret how likely it is that all the guns will be working at any given time. So if you have a twin 14-inch turret and you have your 90% chance of the gun actually working, well, for a single gun, then a twin turret has an 81% chance of working properly. A triple turret has a 73% chance, near enough, of working properly. And a quadruple turret only has a 65.5% chance of working properly. So even though each individual gun might have a 90% chance of working properly, if you have a quadruple turret, those little bit little errors add up and all of a sudden you've only got a about two thirds of the time chance of your entire turret working properly. And even if you have a turret that's got a 99% chance per gun of the gun working properly, once you turn that into a quadruple, that's gone down to a 96% chance of everything working properly now you might think that's fine that's great except that that means statistically speaking roughly one in every 22 to 25 salvos is going to end up with something breaking which isn't brilliant considering that you might well end up actually firing that many salvos in a single engagement and also bear in mind that that is not just salvos in an engagement that's salvos so if you say do 10 salvos in training and then you go into battle and you fire 30 salvos so let's say total 40 maybe maybe i'd have thrown a few more here and there well statistically speaking then you're likely to have at least two breakdowns during the battle itself so there is just that complexity issue and the only way that you 
address that is by making your turret as a whole and the individual guns with their loading and elevation mechanisms etc much much more reliable and you only do that through practice trial and error which is why at least in terms of the turrets the french quadruples tend to work a lot better now some of the issues with their shells are a completely different matter but the turrets themselves didn't tend to have anywhere near as many breakdowns as some of the british ones did and that's because they had experience starting all the way back with the normandies designing quadruple turrets and ironing out the problems plus there's also the fact that richelieu's were technically more like like four twin turrets to hap with pairs of twin turrets happening to sail in very close formation but that's another matter um but then you also have the other problem of kind of related to that advantage that the french had which is that when you develop something for the first time it usually is a learning experience this is where most of the things that are going to go wrong will go wrong if indeed anything is actually going to go wrong so when you look at the british experience they've used twin turrets so by the time you get to the 15 inch 42 twins on the queen elizabeth the renowns etc they've had a lot of experience working out how to get a twin turret working properly and generally speaking it does when they built the Nelsons, it's the first time they've actually put a triple turret into service. It's not actually the first time a British gun manufacturer has developed a triple turret, but it's the first time it's gone into service with the Royal Navy. So, as it's the first of type, there are going to be a lot more problems than there would be if they'd repeated it. So, for example, the Lion class's triple turrets, or if the King George V had been built with triple 15s, I would expect them to have significantly fewer issues than the Nelson's triple 16s did and that's not just because of the various weight saving issues that uh, occurred with the Nelson's triple 16s even adjusting for that there would still be less teething troubles in theory with a uh, triple King George V or a triple equipped lion and on top of that you also have the fact that you know the British developer triple turret with Nelson great fantastic first of the first of its type they have issues okay fine then you move on to the king george the fifths and now they're developing a quad turret for the first time so you have you're basically back to square one with first of its type you're obviously going to have problems etc 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 whereas as i say if you look at the germans um with the bismarcks they stick with twins uh, anyway they do go for triples in the Scharnhorst. fair enough but they at that point have some experience with triples already having built the deutschlands then you look at something like well and the Königsberg as well for what good that is and then you look at the americans as we said already the french have got quite a lot of experience building quads the americans well they started using triples in the nevada class so by the time you get to um something like the north carolinas or the south dakotas the fact that with so much pedigree in building triple turrets behind them the fact the americans can build a decent working triple turret sort of first time first time for the north carolinas it's not exactly a surprise um and so on and so forth so yeah i mean you do see that the, the complexity of triple and quadruple mountings does mean there are some reliability issues regardless of how many you've built compared to a twin turret but when you look at the ships that really have issues for whatever reason with their turrets it tends to be ships where the turret number of guns has gone up relatively recently or is indeed a first of the type so if you look at the early u.s standards there are quite a number of issues where they're, tri they're triple turrets there are less issues with say the tennessee classes triple turrets and again north carolina and south dakota's some issues but nowhere near as much as you know the pennsylvanias the nevadas etc Matt Blom asks, the port of Esquimalt on Vancouver Island near where I live is the base of the Canadian Pacific Fleet and is considered a great natural harbour, yet the British just abandoned it in 1905. Was it common for the Royal Navy to invest in ports and just later abandon them? In what other cases has this occurred? It wasn't common, but it did happen in a number of different cases pretty much around the same time that Esquimalt was left to its own devices. And the reason for this was basically that the Royal Navy had built up a whole series of ports, coaling stations, dockyards, etc. around the world, 
as it had expanded its control over the world's shipping and ocean going commerce lanes pretty much from the middle of the 18th century onwards but uh, by the time you got to the beginning of the 20th century there were a few places where the royal navy was and then fisher meant that it wasn't and that was basically due down to the uh, threat of the german navy which was on the rise so in the middle of the 1900s fisher ordered large numbers of royal navy warships back home to concentrate in british waters to face off against the germans and that meant that whereas the royal navy before had had a lot of its strength scattered throughout the world and therefore you know squadrons of cruisers maybe the odd visiting battleship etc needed some fairly major dockyard facilities all of a sudden the western pacific coast of the north american continent didn't rate spectacularly highly in the estimation of you know what would be needed to keep British interests safe and thus the size and scale of the Eskimalt dockyard was no longer needed there just weren't that many ships present if any and so without the ships there and no real prospect of them coming back anytime soon the dockyard was left and a number of other facilities around the world were left around about the same time for basically the same reason a few obviously were maintained places like simon's town in south africa um, singapore obviously uh, gibraltar etc but these were things that the places that sat on vital communication and trade links eskimo didn't eskimo was good for exerting control and patrolling the well the eastern pacific although it's the western pacific coast of north america but there weren't vital british interests in the area in the way that there were in somewhere like gibraltar or the suez canal and as i say with the lack of shipping it it just had to be left because there was no point in maintaining a large dockyard facility for a fleet that wasn't going to be there chief eye roll asks Rear Admiral Sir Home Riggs Popham appears to have truly been a damned cunning fellow with a colourful career and many significant contributions to the Royal Navy and the British Empire. Was or is he a particularly notable officer in the Royal Navy, or did the Royal Navy produce many with similar accomplishments during their careers in the Age of Sail? Was his noteworthiness handicapped by political enemies, or that he appears to have specialised in amphibious or combined operations? Admiral Popham, I would say, exists on the third tier of notoriety for British admirals and other officers. So the first tier is you know, people that you would think of as near enough everybody would be able to name them if you asked, OK, name a British admiral or, or sailor. So that'd be people like Nelson or Drake, for example. Then you've got the second tier, which would be... People who, uh, well, admirals who someone with a passing reasonable knowledge of naval history could quite happily rattle names off of. So people like Jellicoe, Beattie, Cornwallis, uh, maybe someone like Blake, Monk, those kinds of... Uh, the fighting admirals, Cochrane as well, um, people who are fairly notorious at least within naval history circles, but perhaps don't have quite the name cachet of Nelson or Drake. <clears throat> Anson and Howe as well. Hawk. <laughs> All these other ones coming to mind. Um, Tyrant. And then you've got the third tier, which are admirals and other officers who made a fairly significant contribution to the Royal Navy in some way, shape or form. But whose names are perhaps slightly less well known even within the context of you know people who have a familiar familiarity with royal navy history so popham obviously amongst other things is well i say well known known for coming up with a revision to the initial set of flag signals that was introduced into the Royal Navy that allowed actual proper communication between ships as opposed to a very limited number of sort of go to line X in page Y of the fighting instructions, which was much more limiting and also meant that no one could actually respond 
um, with questions, queries, or even confirmation that they'd seen what the heck the Admiral was on about. So uh, it's fairly important development that allowed the Royal Navy a lot more tactical flexibility when it came to operating in the Napoleonic Wars. But at the same time, it's a bit odd in this kind of time period because Popham does obviously make that contribution and a number of others, as you mentioned in your question, but at the same time, there are quite a number of other Navy officers who are able to pull off similar levels of achievement. Um, there are obviously some civilian inventions as well, but around about this time, especially when it comes to naval technology, but to be honest, when it comes to a lot of other technologies as well, an awful lot of advances are made by naval officers, either because they're faced with a problem and they think, well, I'm just going to come out with a solution because this is annoying, or... Um, for example, if they're back on half pay and they're thinking, well, I'm bored, I'm used to finding solutions to problems. Hey, you, have you got a problem? OK, right, great. I'll come back and think of a solution. And, you know, 50 percent of the time it wasn't gunfire. And as a result, you end up with an awful lot of weird and wonderful things being invented by naval officers, a fair number of which are actually pretty darn useful. But this kind of level of innovation that's going on means that for a lot of people, admirals like um, Popham end up being sort of passing footnotes because it's like, well, yes, he invented this signaling system and, and this other officer invented this and, and this officer invented this. But, you know, this officer took them all, put them all together and went and beat the French. So we'll remember him instead of everybody else who made it possible. Biggles of Maritime Command asks, what is your favourite World War II maritime aircraft and why? Not the most effective, but favourite. Uh, he says, mine is the Sunderland because it's just a brute and just a character. Another contender is the HE-115, which unfairly lives in the shadow of the HE-111. Well, if you're going to put it in terms of just favourite, as probably some of you have picked up at this point, I do have something of an appreciation for the utterly absurd. And so once you discard effectiveness, I think my favourite has to go to the Vickers Wellington. And yes, I know that was originally an RAF medium-heavy dash bomber. But as a maritime patrol aircraft, it really takes the biscuit. I mean, they used it in anti-submarine work. They turned it into a UFO, as you can see here. Um, admittedly, a few other aircraft also had a magnetic anti-mine ring like this. Uh, Catalinas, some German aircraft, etc. But the Wellington is one of the better known ones. And, of course, you have to top it off with the glorious insanity that is turning a mid-to-heavy-weight strategic bomber into an anti-shipping torpedo bomber, which, believe it or not, they actually did with the Wellington and operated from Malta attacking Italian shipping at night. So yes, a night-flying strategic torpedo bomber. This is what they turned the Wellington into, amongst other things. About the only thing that would make it even more glorious is if they'd used one of these UFO Wellingtons as a torpedo bomber as well, because I can guarantee you it would have confused the heck out of anybody they were attacking. So yes... Um, just for its glorious absurdity of all the many roles they put it to that you really shouldn't be putting a strategic bomber to. Uh, the Vickers Wellington goes down as my favourite maritime war, uh, wartime aircraft. Hugh Fisher asks, Why did it take so long for a ship-to-ship -ship missiles to become effective weapons? In the early 1800s, the Royal Navy was firing Congreve rocket barrages at pesky Americans. Why were smoothbore short-range cannon developed relatively quickly into much longer range and more effective weapons, whilst the rockets were not? Hooray! It's literally rocket science! Do you know how long I've been waiting to use that line? Oh dear. Um, no, in all seriousness though, it is genuinely a problem of rocket science. Back in the... You know, a late 18th, early 19th century, sure, Congreve rockets, kind of a thing. Um, still not the world's most accurate of weapons, and disturbing tendency of having uncovered fire aboard a ship is not something that wooden warship captains look forward to. Then you get the ironclad era, and, well, even if you had some kind of adapted Congreve rocket, you were not going to get through the armour of an ironclad anytime soon, and gun ranges, as you mentioned, start to increase. And simply put, rocket technology, such as it was, was far too imprecise and far too short range to keep up. Now, once you got into the 20th century, into the 1920s and 1930s, then people started looking at rockets in a bit more, a bit more seriously, so you so you could start to develop rocket motors and such like that could carry 
something, whether that be a missile, a bomb, uh, a space rocket or whatever, to arrange such that it was further than your average for you know, a naval gun, which then rendered them somewhat useful. But then you had to contend with, well, the twofold problem when it came to surface-to-surface -surface missiles. One, at any appreciable range, you can't see the target, and the rocket definitely can't see the target, which means that you're going to have to have some kind of onboard guidance system and a remote onboard guidance system, i.e. one that doesn't need much input from the ship after it's been launched. Well, that only really starts to come about during World War II. And the second part is that um, an air-to-surface rocket is, or an air-to-surface missile, I guess, is somewhat easier to do because, one, it doesn't matter if you, when you drop it, it can build up speed and then accelerate off, whereas if you don't get a big punch out of the initial launch of a missile that's going surface-to-surface, -surface, it's just going to fall into the sea, which is going to end somewhat badly for you but secondly when that missile if you're launching it from in air to surface mode it can pick up a target and then it can course correct it can to a certain extent afford to drop a little bit as it adjusts its course uh, and it's most likely that because of the elevation you'll have a target lock pretty much from the get-go at least in one way shape or form whereas with a surface-to-surface -surface missile, you also have to maintain a minimum altitude unless you want to slam into the sea, which adds, an, weirdly enough, whilst taking away part of the three-dimensional range of operation, it actually adds an extra dimension to the complexity of your guidance system. And you also have to have a guidance system that, instead of just locking onto something going, aha, I will attack this, thank you, just let me launch, you have to develop a guidance system that can either take a cue from an onboard sensor system on the ship or can be launched semi-blind into the ether and then pick up a target and go ah yes well i now i well, well i was before i was flying in a perfectly straight line now i recognize that i must instead attack this so all in all it's a much more complex uh, system than perhaps a, your average early air to surface munition and you also have to have it big enough and nasty enough to punch through whatever it is you're actually attacking and hence you need to make it fairly big which is why um proper full-on surface surface missiles only really come about just after the period that the channel covers 22 nf2 asks in the most recent military aviation history video uh, in which you came in for a segment the effectiveness of the fw200 condor from a naval aviation perspective was discussed in depth did the Japanese have any real equivalent to the Condor in the Pacific Theater, and how effective was it? And conversely, what were the most effective Allied counters to it? So, in terms of long-range maritime patrol aircraft, the Japanese primarily had a couple. The H-6K, Mavis, flying boat, and the H-8K, as pictured here, Emily, flying boat. They had a few more of them than the Germans had Condors, and they, they were relatively effective. The main problem that they had was the kind of environment that the Condor was operating in in the Atlantic was very far removed from the environment that the H-6 and H-8Ks were operating in in the Pacific. Namely, you know, there wasn't that much of a density of Allied shipping heading to a relatively nearby target zone the way that the Atlantic convoys were. And to the Pacific is very large. So there was a lot of Pacific to search. There weren't convoys steaming towards you in a nice, easy to intercept manner. And due to the proliferation of islands in the Western Pacific and then later things like escort carriers, because obviously the Pacific War took a bit longer to get going, it meant that fighter cover was more often available than it was during the Condor's heyday. So they had, I think they had the potential to be very effective. If the Japanese H-6 and H-8K fleet had been magically teleported to Western France in 1940, the Germans would have made absolutely fantastic use of them. But uh, operational circumstances are being very, very different, limited how effective they could actually be. Although 
couple of them did actually end up bombing, well, bombing Oahu. They tried to bomb up Pearl Harbor in the aftermath of the actual Pearl Harbor attacks, but they got so hopelessly off target, no one actually noticed the fact that they were under attack, which was quite amusing in and of itself. Um, but in terms of what were the most effective Allied counters to these flying boats, fighters, um, quite simply put, the H-6K was moved off into quieter areas after it became clear that it was a bit too slow and not quite heavily armed enough to stand up to incoming Allied fighters. I mean, the H-8K was still vulnerable, but it was faster and better armed than the H-6K, so it was less vulnerable. Um, but even so, losses in that aircraft started to add up more and more as time went on, and obviously Allied air superiority got more and more. Classe Cornate asks, Can you please explain to my nephew that converting Leonardo da Vinci and the Italia-class ironclads into aircraft carriers is a terrible idea? Well, it's not that difficult to do. Let's do some quick comparisons. So, let's take a battleship conversion to an aircraft carrier that turned out okay. So, HMS Eagle converted from an Almirante La Torre class battleship. Now, as a baseline, the Almirante La Torres are 625 foot long and capable of just a fraction under 23 knots. The Leonardo da Vinci, by contrast, is almost 50 foot shorter at 577 foot long and only capable of a fraction over 21 knots. So it's starting out considerably slower and is a fair bit shorter. Now, obviously, the shortness of hull means that you're going to end up with a shorter flight deck, which means you're much less capable of doing air operations, and also means your hangar is going to be smaller. And the fact that you're traveling slower as well means that you're going to end up in a position where, you know, you're not going to be able to have as heavy aircraft take off. Now, granted, you could make the argument that once you put the bow extensions and the massive ramp up in speed onto the Conte de Cavour class um, in the 1930s, then those ships might make okay-ish carriers in that as much as you get something about the size of Eagle, except a little bit quicker. But specifically, Leonardo da Vinci is 15, 20 years before that happens, because obviously she explodes in, in World War One, So definitely not a good candidate. Interestingly enough... If you want an idea of roughly what Leonardo da Vinci would be equivalent to, well, in terms of length and speed, she's broadly equivalent to a Normandy-class battleship, although, interestingly enough, uh, Leonardo da Vinci's a fraction wider. And, of course, we all know what happens when you convert a Normandy-class battleship into an aircraft carrier. You get Bern. So, yeah, um, you're basically looking at Italian Bern, which is not a sentence you really want to have associated with your navy. As for the Italia class, the ironclads, well, they're much smaller, so that immediately moves them down into the position of maybe they'll make an escort carrier. And at that point, okay, fair enough, as an escort carrier, a speed of 17.5 knots is not entirely unreasonable, but let's look at the earliest escort carriers. So we're looking at the Long Islands, the Bogues, etc., and, well, the Italia class is just a fraction over 400 foot long. Even the early escort carriers are almost 100 foot longer than that. So, yes, you would have the speed of an escort carrier, and probably a bit more once you've... Well, there's not a lot of armour to remove from an Italia class, but you could take off... Obviously, you take off the guns and such, like, and presumably put some modern machinery in it. So it might, you might get it to go a little bit quicker than that, but... The hull size is just ridiculously tiny. Um, you know, you're chopping 100 foot off the flight deck. You might be able to maybe get some very, very lightly loaded fighters off, but that's about it, and you're also not going to have a tremendous number of them. So it would be, well, it would basically be the ban of escort carriers, even assuming that you could actually get any of the any of the aircraft to take off on the much shorter flight deck that you now have. So, yeah, all in all, pretty terrible ideas, I'm afraid. John McCarthy asks, Recently I've been looking for information on World War One and World War Two gun accuracy. Typically, comments are qualitative, such as excessive dispersion, and I've so far found few quantitative values. 
what would be commonly accepted values for ex acceptable dispersion? How much is too much? How much is too little? And why those values? Can you suggest some references for quantitative measured data on dispersion? And finally, what are the major contributors to dispersion? I've seen a variety of explanations, including barrels too closely spaced, projectiles not well seated, muzzle velocity too high, projectiles too light. Any idea on the relative importance of these factors? Quantitative data of this sort is actually, as you say, remarkably difficult to come by. You can find it, but at least in my experience, there hasn't really been anywhere that's collated everything into one place. About the closest you're probably going to get is actually the article in last one of last year's Warship Internationals regarding the shell dispersion of the Italian 15-inch gun in World War II, because in that article they actually quantify and tabulate the dispersion of a number of different guns, about a dozen if I remember correctly. Although that still doesn't obviously cover everybody, it's, it's a much greater concentration of quantitative data than I've seen in most places. Other than that, because it's usually not an issue unless somebody notes something especially out there, either in terms of accuracy or inaccuracy about them, um, usually you'll end up having to look for gun data tables from the specific nation, which usually means going to their archives. So US archives will have information about the dispersion of US battleship guns. I know the Q archives have information about the dispersion of various British naval guns. And the German archives, again, I've seen published data from the German archives that shows the shell dispersion on German guns. But even then, it's not a case of, I want this document and it'll show me the dispersion for all of the guns of that nation. It'll be, right, well, here's this document and here's some armor penetration curves and here's some velocity curves and here's some pressure curves and also here's a dispersion curve for that gun. So actually, you know, if anybody has the capability to go and hunt down all those bits of data from all over the place and see if they can put something together in a single cumulative document that would be really great um, it would save an awful lot of searching by everybody else I'll tell you that much but um, as a rule of thumb you probably are looking at maybe uh, I think I've said this before in the drawdown maybe 300 to 350 yards dispersion for a salvo would be your sweet spot and you can maybe forgive up to maybe forgive up to 400 yards at longer ranges but not at shorter ones because obviously dispersion is going to increase the longer the ranges but the the reason i say that is through a combination of things one is just practical observation what are the dispersions when it is actually noted specifically that, um, you know, this is excessive. And also what's considered a bit too tight. Again, I've mentioned on the channel, at the Battle of Jutland, the Germans noted the incredibly tight groupings of the Queen Elizabeth class were sort of about 200 to 250 yards and occasionally slightly below that. And it was noted that those were actually groupings that were a little bit too tight because it meant that shells were all landing within sort of 50, 60 yards of their of the German ships, but the, because the dispersion was too tight, they were all in this landing area, whereas if the dispersion had been 300 yards, maybe one or two of the shells from that salvo would have actually hit or near missed the German battle cruisers. And the reason that I think that kind of 300, 350 yard figure is about right is that when you look at the overall size of battleships you're talking about if you're going from the early part of world war one onwards anything from about 550 feet very rapidly climbing queen elizabeth are just under 650 feet and then obviously going up in world war ii as you get to things like the king george the fifths which you know, are considerably large i mean the nelsons are 700 foot long king george the fifth 745 foot long so if you've got a 300 to 350 yard um, radius, uh, diameter of accuracy, then that means that a smaller World War One era ship is going to occupy about two thirds of the length of that. And a larger ship like 
a, th a treaty battleship or Yamato or Iowa is going to occupy most, if not all, of that space linearly. Um, obviously, if it's 350 yards, there'll be, be a little bit left over. Now, it's not going to occupy the entire landing area, so if you get the salvo on target, it doesn't mean you're going to hit with every single shell because obviously it's a circle or an ellipse more accurately whereas a ship is effectively not entirely but effectively linear with respect to this but with a three to 350 yard dispersion range if you get your salvo on target that there's a fairly decent chance of scoring multiple hits um, whereas if you have your dispersion larger than that you're now opening up to a point where a ship can be within your circular area of probability and you're on target but none of the shells might hit they might all miss because you know, the area over which it's dispersing is much larger and this is the other thing you've got to remember you know i talk about a lot about the square cube law but there's also the linear square law so you know if the diameter of your circle is 300 yards and then the diameter of another circle is 400 yards well that might only be a one-third increase in circle diameter but the area that that circle is now covering and therefore the scatter of the shells is actually considerably larger which makes any, any individual hit much less likely and of course you've got to bear in mind that's for capital ships if you're targeting smaller ships well okay fair enough some of the larger cruisers might not be too far off linear dimensions of a small capital ship but smaller cruisers and destroyers are going to be smaller still so obviously um this is one of the reasons why they're harder to hit but smaller weapons tend to, are also shorter range so if you're six inch four five inch four inch guns engaging smaller ships at closer range you're probably a little bit more accurate overall anyway so you take this photo for example this is a photo of hood being engaged i believe at the merzel kabir bombardment and this dispersion is pretty good um you can see you know it's bracketing either end of hood it's fallen a bit short obviously uh, but you can also tell that you know if the gunners had been a little bit further uh, on target i mean if they range forward by 100 200 yards or so then there's a decent chance that at least two of the shells in this presumably half salvo would have landed hits whereas if you imagine that the dispersion was double that you can see how hood might easily slot between some of these shell splashes without any major issue and yeah this is kind of when you when you see some pictures from various engagements and you see the salvos splashes coming up you can kind of tell roughly what the dispersion is um compared to the ship that it's near missing or possibly even hitting depending on uh what photo you're looking at and that's why when you look at the some photos from say the italian battleships engaging british cruisers in the mediterranean that's how you can tell that the dispersion issues for the italian ships were not exaggerated because as i've mentioned before and i think i've shown before on the channel there's photos where you have two entire cruisers in the photo separated by several cruiser lengths so you're talking about disper uh, sort of a distance of well over a kilometer all told and there's a shell that's landed behind the far cruiser and there's a shell that's landed camera woods of the near cruiser <laughs> at which point you'd be lucky to hit a postcode let alone a ship now as for the explanations for dispersion being affected pretty much all of those are valid it just depends on what kind of problems each particular gun and shell combination is having um, if the weight of the charge and the weight of the shell quality control is off then that's going to throw dispersion out because they're all going to be on somewhat different ballistic paths if the projectile is too light that has tends to have more of an effect on armor penetration but it can have an effect on dispersion at longer ranges because a lighter shell is more susceptible to subtle shifts in direction from changing moisture levels temperatures wind directions wind strength etc um, if the muzzle velocity is too high that can affect dispersion because i mean it can in induce vibration in the guns it can cause destabilization of the shell it can cause potentially over stabilization of the shell which again is something we've talked about on uh, 
previous dry docks. If the projectiles aren't well seated, well then they're going to come out the gun at slightly skew if angle, which means they're going to probably start tumbling, which is going to completely ruin their ballistic path. If the gun barrels are too closely spaced together, uh, then the blast of each gun and or the uh, wake of each shell, depending on if you've got t uh, timing delay circuits in there or not, can affect the flight path of the other shells, which again is going to throw them all off even if only subtly at the beginning, by the time you're 10-15 miles away, well, that will add up to quite a considerable amount. And, you know, so on and so forth. So, all of those and more can all have a significant impact on the dispersion of shells. And if you've got multiple of them working against you in one particular gun system, you're really going to have major problems. But any single one of them can have problems. Um, although maybe some systems also exhibit more than one of them and then you're really in trouble. But the vast majority of these issues can be solved to a, either a certain degree or completely by making some changes to how you operate the gun. For example, if your muzzle velocity is too high, you can dial down the amount of charge. So muzzle velocity drops, okay, you lose a bit of range and armor penetration, but you're actually hitting things. If the projectile's too light, well, you can live with it, or maybe you can invest in a slightly heavier projectile. If they're not well-seated, well, then you need better quality control in your manufacturer. If the gun barrels are too closely spaced, then delay coils um, might be a solution, and so on and so forth. Christopher Dent asks, how useful were the active pre-standard US battleships, Arkansas, New York and Texas, in World War II, and how does that utility compare to the Queen Elizabeth and R-class battleships of the Royal Navy? So within that, um, you've got basically three groups when it comes to the Royal Navy. You've got the modernised Queen Elizabeth, i Queen Elizabeth, Valiant and Warspite. You've got the unmodernised, or not as modernised ones, i Barham and Malaya. And then the R class uh, as well. So, and then within the US as well, you've got New York and Texas, and then Arkansas. So, Arkansas of all of them is probably the least useful. She's got the smallest guns. Okay, she's got a number of them, but she's got the smallest guns. She's the least well protected. She's the slowest. So, yeah, there's a, there's a reason she basically is used for shore bombardment duty pretty much exclusively. And not really a tremendous amount else. New York and Texas are a bit more useful than that. They are probably broadly on the equivalent usefulness of some of the slightly more worn R class. So, as you can see here, they do some pretty decent service in shore bombardment duty. They also do convoy escort duty um, to scare off German raiders, which is you know, things that the R class also did. But the circumstances of war do kind of work against evaluating their precise utility because, for example, in the early part of the war, the R-Class went off either to lead or form a significant part of operations against the French, before that hunting the Germans, after that operating against the Italians. So they were to a certain degree, even if they were second-line units within the battle line, they were still on the front lines, whereas Texas and New York weren't. But at the same time, you know, that was the early part of the war where the Royal Navy was really scrambling for everything they could get, and they had the need for them, whereas in, well, in the very earliest part of the war, the US wasn't involved at all, and by the time it was involved in 1942 then again well Texas and New York do see as we say convoy and shore bombardment work but when it came to operating on the front line period you know even things like the Tennessees and the uh, surviving Colorados until West Virginia was refitted obviously um, even they weren't really seen all that much on front line duties simply because of lack of fuel infrastructure in the Pacific so they Texas and New York didn't really have a necessarily a chance to prove if they could have been useful in the same way that the R's were used, at least in the early part of the war. Um, but then by the by the latter part of the war, the R class are pretty much, you know, doing the same job as New York and Texas. So you could probably put them on a par 
Then you've got Malaya and Barham, um, which are broadly in roughly the same boat as the R-Class, except they're a little bit faster. So they see a little bit more fleet work, but not on massive amounts. So again, bearing in mind the same fact as we just mentioned, comparing the R's and new, the New York's, you could probably make a reasonable argument that Barham and Malaya fall broadly into the same category as Texas and New York, even even though they might have a couple of very, very subtle advantages. And then you have the modernized QEs, and they actually do see proper full-on frontline active service pretty much throughout the war. Um, they're considerably quicker than any, any anything else that uh, we were looking at, much better armed, and they are yeah, considerably more useful than the pre-standard U.S. battleships. Captain Landlocked asks, What would the Washington Naval Treaty look like if the British had lost their fleet in World War I and the high seas fleet was also sunk so they can't use German ships? And would that give the Royal Navy a leg up in World War II by having the most modern fleet? I mean, I think it very much would depend on when and how the British lost their entire fleet, but... Uh, I don't know, let's say for the sake of argument, considering the high seas fleet also sinks, I don't know, they anger an ancient sea god or the world's worst hurricane shows up in the middle of the Battle of Jutland and, you know, everything is sunk, or at least all the capital ships are sunk. I don't know, for some bizarre reason, some of the smaller ships might survive or whatever. Um, the main reason for that is, one, it's, well, it's still not a remotely plausible scenario but it's less remotely implausible than some others and also kind of mid-1916 is a decent point to take it from going forward to the Washington Treaty so let's say pretty much most of the Royal Navy's capital ship fleet is on the on the seafloor I mean to, at that point the loss of so many experienced sailors and officers is going to be an absolute kick in the teeth um, but who knows, but maybe a bunch of them survive in lifeboats or something, or whatever. Um, the British cannot afford to not have a fleet. Now, the good news for them is even if they lose the Grand Fleet, they still have all the stuff on blockade duty, the Harwich Force, etc., etc., so they can still run their blockade and containment. But with the, with the sort of the slate wiped clean, they're going to face the fact that they have to crash build ships it doesn't matter how much the treasury is going to scream it doesn't matter anything else the long-term survival of the british empire as well as to be honest the short-term survival um, because the both sides will have some ships that are in, running into completion in dry dock is massively at stake now so you're gonna see i think simply by necessity the royal navy is going to have to be built back up fast um and when you look at you know what they were able to pull off historically you have things like the we want eight and we want won't wait campaign add up the number of shipyards capital grade shipyards that the british have and yeah they could quite conceivably be laying down eight capital ships a year for quite a while not necessarily all things like hood hood was a little bit big for a lot of shipyards, but certainly battleships of the scale could be fitted in quite large quantities. So at that point, they're probably just going to go, yeah, you know what, um, the stuff we did for Hood, because bear in mind Hood is in the process of being laid down at this point, um, okay, quantify that and, you know, make a few tweaks and everything, but get the other three Admiral class laid down this instant. We have to build them. So the four Admirals can be laid down in 1916. Um, they're probably going to grab, I would imagine, plans, given that they've just put small tube boilers in, they'll probably get Jellico, or if he survived, or his successor, quickly slamming plans through for small tube boiler Queen Elizabeth's as also, you know, the next capital ships to build, because... There, there were some issues already showing up with the Rs um, in terms of expandability, so they're just like, okay, right, go for, go with that. Renown and Repulse still under construction as well, obviously. So you probably see four small-tubed Queen Elizabeths and four Admirals laid down in 1916, and then they're going to have... I mean, at that point, I think they could probably afford to leave the battle cruisers off a little bit at that point, because if you've got four hoods coming down the line, 
plus the Renown and Repulse, that gives you six battle cruisers. If the Germans have lost their fleet, all of their battle cruisers are gone as well. Nobody else has battle cruisers at this point, so six is fine. Um, especially when you want to concentrate on rebuilding the battle line. So the next year, 1917, is going to be we need eight battleships of some description. Um, whether they just do repeats of the Queen Elizabeths or whether they take the, the end of 1916 to make some modifications and come up with something new, maybe a 10-gun Queen Elizabeth, maybe experiment with a triple turret and a 9-gun arrangement, more reminiscent of World War II um, designs or whatever. Or maybe they look for bigger guns, who knows. Um, but they'll probably do eight battleships in 1917 and probably another eight in 1918. Those definitely will be kind of a next generation type design. So at that point, they've got um, 20 dreadnoughts under construction plus six battle cruisers. It doesn't put them back up to Grand Fleet levels, but it's a fairly decent chunk of ships. And it's going to put, given that the Germans have been knocked out, it's going to put them back roughly coming back up on a par with the u.s navy except of course as you mentioned with a lot more modern vessels and then you're probably i would i would expect that you probably see a last tranche in 1919 um, but they might dial it down they might go okay we need to take some wartime lessons also you know the budget's being cut quite significantly so they might drop down to four ships um, which probably might look something like Battle Cruiser 1919 or something like that. Um, and then another four in 1920, which will probably start to approach something like the G3s or thereabouts. And the Royal, I mean, the Royal Navy is not going to accept anything other than parity um, for a, a Naval Limitation Treaty. And... I think what will then happen is they'll they'll agree to probably something broadly similar to the Washington Treaty because at that point it actually serves their interests to a certain degree because they've, they've got the ability, if the Treasury will grin and bear it, to build back up to a level that would be broadly compar compatible with the Washington Treaty as it stands by the early 20s. But now all their ships are going to be 28 knot plus, which puts them at a distinct advantage over everybody else. So they'll be quite happy with that. They probably won't get the Nelsons, but they probably won't care because they'll have, you know, they'll have four admirals and um, possibly some G3 alikes. Which, although that probably means that when the Washington Treaty, um, the US and Japan are probably going to be arguing vociferously to retain a couple of Lexingtons as battle cruisers, maybe the Amagis, something like that. And yeah, having a fleet where your baseline ship is a 28-knot version of a Queen Elizabeth and everything else is better going into World War II, that's going to be very beneficial for the Royal Navy. Um, the main question is going to be that short, sharp, massive build increase is going to cost an awful lot of money, um, which means that the 1920s Royal Navy is probably going to be operating on shillings that it's digging up out of the back of the sofa um, for quite a while. Which, I mean, it's, it's not the worst thing to happen in the world, but it might delay the King George V's being brought online. Although, then again, given that that might allow them to invoke the Escalator Clause, that may not necessarily be the world's worst thing either. It all hinges around n not whether they can, because the infrastructure and the industrial capability is certainly there, um, but if the political will is there to effectively replace the battle fleet after whatever unimaginable disaster struck it. Gabriel A. Hawkins asks, I enjoyed your recent piece on World War II battleship guns and found your observation that range amounted to a non-factor because ships could evade long-distance fire after seeing the flash of the guns. Uh, interesting. But as World War II was actually fought, your conclusion is fairly unassailable, but prior to December the 8th, 1941, was the US Navy imprudent for valuing range? Uh, to illustrate, imagine the bemused look of British gunners if the high seas fleet at Jutland engaged in the violent manoeuvring that protected Salt Lake City at the Komondorsky Islands or Novaki doing the same thing at Truk. 
more ships would have been lost to collision than shell fire. In other words, ships in a battle line do not have the same freedom of movement, and for this reason practical range would necessarily be greater in a fleet action, and there may have been a basis for the US Navy believing there would be meaningful battle tactics in the plus 30,000 yard range. Sort of, I guess? I mean, I can see where you're coming from. It is a little bit difficult to disentangle that from the fact there weren't really any major battle line actions in World War Two, particularly, and certainly not on the scale that we think about in World War One, or even what people are expecting, although maybe that is a bit of hindsight going on there. But some of the other issues, I mean, in a lot of ways it links back to the early question on dispersion. Um, I think at those longer ranges, even when everybody's quite happily sailing in a straight line and you've you, you obviously therefore they're not evading you have a couple of problems one is it's incredibly far um which means that in pre-1941 when for, for the majority of the time pre-world war ii you think about optical only spotting okay you might have aircraft up spotting but let's face it in an age of carriers and anti-aircraft guns how long do you think a spotting aircraft is going to last so we're effectively looking at optical range finders and at 30,000 plus yards the odds of the weather being good enough for you to actually spot that far well you're being a bit optimistic at that point I think and then as I say looking at the dispersion as dispersion increases with distance um, and you know even the slightest error in your calculations back home will make a considerably, considerably greater difference so for example you know if you're shooting at 10,000 yards which okay for World War II standards is a bit close but if you're shooting at 10,000 yards and your gun turret is misaligned by half a degree well that'll put your aim off by 80 90 yards which okay I mean that's 300 come on not quite 300 foot almost 300 feet but you you might still hit your target if your aim was on target a half degree error at 10,000 yards you might actually still hit it um it's just that you know if you had it completely on you might hit it with one or two shells instead of three or four whereas if you take that out to 20,000 yards you're now talking about just about missing the target if you take it out to 30,000 yards you're now talking about not even necessarily missing the target actually being close to the next tar next ship in line than you are to the ship you initially shot at so i mean that's just using an arbitrary half degree error but it, it kind of illustrates the point how small errors in what you might be doing at the firing end get magnified by quite a bit when by the time the shells get to the other end at longer ranges not even accounting for the actual dispersion of the shells themselves and you see this reflected to a certain degree even in much later war shooting stats. So, um, I mean, pre-war, you look at the actual hit rate in practice exercises of those kind of ranges. The hit rate percentage is really subpar. It's below what you'd actually want in a battle, below the level where you could reliably actually count on hitting anything in a battle beyond much beyond random chance. And that's in... A practice scenario, as we know, accuracy tends generally to fall off in an actual battle scenario. And even when you look at post-war, um, when you look at, say, some of the firing tests done by an Iowa-class battleship, so bear in mind at that point you're talking about, uh, obviously, a much superior fire control system to what's available pre-war, and at 30,000-plus yards range, the gunfire accuracy again, even in a practice level, is such that you're more likely to run out of shells in your magazines than you are to do cumulative death-dealing damage to a battleship. Obviously, you might get one or two hits in at some point eventually, but it's relatively unlikely to happen. Um, so, I, I don't think that, strictly speaking looking at longer range engagements was entirely a hiding to nothing because you know there are differences in what constitutes long range i think anyone who was looking at oh yeah we're going to fight our enemy at thirty thousand yards plus sorry but you're basically at that point just rolling dice um there is not a tremendous amount of point in trying um 
it's, it's just too inaccurate even if your enemy doesn't dodge but maybe looking into fighting at 25,000 yards sure that's probably got a degree of benefit to it i mean we know that a number of hits were scored beyond a 25,000 yard range so there is some validity in that um and then you have you know everybody's different estimations of where ranges will open at and where they're comfortable fighting of course the royal navy is quite happy to start shooting in the mid 20,000s of yards but their main objective is going to keep closing and closing and closing on you until you're in the kind of the mid teens and then blast at you at close range so that's the royal navy's idea but um if you i suppose if you look at more accurate at longer range you're basically kind of trading off against if i hit them at longer range i might be able to slow them down keep them there and pound them to pieces but it's going to be you're going to need a lot more ammunition whereas obviously closer in you're more subject to damage but you also can subject your enemy to a lot more damage as well so i think overall it would be as i said how how long a range um if you're training at twenty five thousand yards yes fine if you're thinking you're going to hit at 30 plus no <laughs> not not really worth counting on in a battle scenario sweet 420 den asks how did sms Deflinger get the nickname iron dog and is it the best warship nickname of all time by all accounts it seems to have picked up the nickname after its performance at jutland where ironically enough unlike its slightly younger sister ship lutzow um which obviously ended up sinking Deflinger appeared to just take blow after blow after blow after blow and kept coming back for more so it was a, a nickname that the British gave to it rather than anything else. It wasn't, I don't think the Germans were particularly aware of it until afterwards. Um, as far as is it the best warship nickname of all time? It's, I mean, it's certainly up there, um, probably in the top three. I wouldn't necessarily want to say it's the absolute best warship nickname of all time because there are some pretty good ones um, across various navies at various points. Um, a lot of which, well, some of which are given by the opposition, if you like, to a ship, mostly out of frustration, and some of which are given to the ship itself by its own crew. Um, so while I, say, I wouldn't necessarily say it's the absolute best, but certainly a, a, a strong contender, and I think it probably comes down a lot to your own personal preferences for ship nicknames. Morten Bernholt Rausmussen asks, could the Danish Navy by 1864 be considered to be the sixth most, pa most powerful in the world? Qualifier. In a Danish book about the naval battles of the Danish-Prussian War of 1864, the author Benno Blesilt maybe, says that the Danish Navy was arguably the sixth most powerful in the world at the time. He lists Great Britain, France, China, the USA and Japan as more powerful. He lists Italy and Spain as former great Navy powers, and he argues the Crimean War has damaged the Russian fleet enough to be overtaken by Denmark. He finally acknowledges the Austro-Hungarian Navy is on a par with the Danish, but due to a mutiny in Venice, the Navy is partially sailors and partially soldiers, and thus not as navally efficient as the Danish. Is this claim ridiculous, or does he have a point? I mean... Kind of. You could probably actually theoretically maybe even make an argument for them being even further up the ranks. The one thing is you've got to remember in 1864, you're talking the very early ironclad period, so who is the most powerful or who ranks where on the chart of the most powerful is fluctuating almost month by month as various naval powers bring ironclad warships online. In a lot of ways, it's very similar to kind of 1905 through 1910, where... At one point, you know, Brazil was theoretically a more powerful navy in battle line strength than Germany or the USA because they had the Minas Gerais class before, you know, the Americans or the Germans could bring large numbers of their own dreadnoughts online. So it's a little bit of a, a passing thing. But, you know, with that said, China and Japan in 1864 don't have commissioned ironclads the u.s does obviously it's got lots of monitors thanks to the american civil war great britain and france obviously started the whole thing um the italians actually have a few so and the russian the russians also have some but not as many as the danish um and so on and so forth so yeah in 1864 by dint of having three ironclad warships the Danish Navy could at least claim to be in the top five in terms of battle line strength, as long as you're only counting by ironclads, which a lot of people were 
only doing. Um, but, you know, 1865, 1866, etc., as the 1860s goes on and other nations start to acquire ironclads in fairly large quantities, obviously Denmark starts slipping back down uh, the ratings. But yes, but briefly, Denmark was probably in the top five, at least by ironclad strength. Trevor Polasek asks, Shore bombardment seems to be a relatively boring duty for warships during war, but did crews manning these ships think it was boring? Uh, were there any differences between the opinion of the gunnery crews, other crews, and the command staff? Well, it depends what kind of bombardment duty you're doing. Um, if you are shooting up some basic bunkers and tunnel systems, etc., and not a lot is happening, then yeah that might be relatively boring but if you're shooting up those same targets but the enemy is say launching air attacks on you it's probably fairly exciting and if you're shooting up enemy fortifications and short positions and they have short batteries shooting back at you it becomes more exciting still so shore bombardment could be boring if the enemy weren't particularly well prepared to receive you but it could also be somewhat exciting especially when shells start landing on you as did happen to occasion occasionally on shore bombardment ships um as far as opinions go between the various crews well the command staff would always be a little bit on edge looking out for you know counter battery fire air attacks etc the gunnery crews i suppose given the sheer number of shells you'd probably fling at a target during a shore bombardment well, they might get a little bit bored after loading the like 25th shell uh into their respective gun uh the, for the other crews the engineering crews and so forth it doesn't make much difference because whether the ship is shooting at a shore target an air target or uh, another ship at sea all they're hearing is the thud and rumble of guns overhead so it doesn't really make much odds to them fisher fishers fishing fisher fishing for freshly fished fresh fish for fresh fry friday oh i'm gonna get you one of these days <laughs> asks what was the first warship to accommodate all of its crew in bunks instead of hammocks also is the midway critique video still in limbo uh trying to quantify exactly which was the first warship to have its crew in bunks instead of hammocks is a little difficult i mean apart from anything the transition happened at different times in different navies the royal canadian navy for instance didn't get its first ship with bunks instead of hammocks until after the second world war whereas in the u.s navy some ships had bunks instead of hammocks before the First World War started. Um, and on top of that, the reason I say it's a little bit complicated is whilst say, the US Navy appeared to have been an early adopter of the idea, you also get other testimony, like there's a congressional inquiry from 1900 where they're talking about a ship in the US Navy, although I wasn't able to determine exactly which one, having hammocks, uh, sorry, having bunk beds, and the sailors not liking them, and so eventually the bunks were ditched and the hammocks were put back in instead, which theoretically would make it a very strong contender for being the first ship equipped with uh, bunks instead of hammocks, but then also not because they're taken away afterwards. So uncertain. Um, if you want kind of a date from which bunk beds were persistently available it'll probably be something around about the very late 1900s early 1910s and probably in the u.s navy but i suspect the first warship to at least temporarily accommodate its crew in bunks instead of hammocks is going to be something that in the 1890s and as far as the midway review video that's, that's still pending me finding somebody who can uh, provide me with legal services to fight studio canal about um the u571 video because until that's sorted i don't want to risk putting up any more film reviews and less and, and just in case the film companies get as stupid as studio canal have done jellico cats get confused at night says i was thinking the other day that there are a few naval sounds as iconic as the ping of a world war ii sonar system which got me thinking about what equipment is actually used to generate that ping so what's used to generate a sonar pulse is something that will look vaguely like this. Um, quite often also looks a little bit like a mushroom, but it's a combination microphone and speaker. So the speaker, when it's in speaker mode, it produces the ping sound or whatever sound the sonar is making, depending on the type of sonar. And then it switches over into 
microphone mode, so it listens for the return of the signal. Now, the structure is basically the same um, for pretty much all regular sonars, especially World War Two. Now, the difference in you know, the continuation part of your question about how electrostatic, magnetorestrictive, and piezoelectric transducers all produce sound, um, and why people chose one or the other, it's a relatively open-ended question. Each way of doing it has its strengths and weaknesses. So, for example, a piezoelectric transducer will be relatively static because piezoelectric um, equipment creates energy, well, either turns energy into sound or turn, turns can turn sound into energy or actually more precisely physical deformation rather than sound, although fast enough physical deformation will result in sound um, by current passing through it. So if you compress, if you have, say, a piezoelectric disc, you compress it, you'll generate current. Conversely, if you put current through a piezoelectric disc, it will cause a slight amount of movement, and if that movement is quick enough and at the right frequency, that will generate sound. Whereas a magneto-restrictive system is will generally have some kind of core element inside a magnetic coil and by passing current through the coil you can make the core move which might generate sound again if it's moving fast enough at the correct frequency and conversely if somebody or some force causes that core to move it will change the electromagnetic field around it which will induce current in the coil so you know it's potentially a slightly the magneto restrictive version is potentially a slightly more precise instrument um, because the core is usually free floating whereas with the piezoelectric transducer there's a lower limit below which you know applying any further pressure or any less pressure won't actually result in much at all happening um, but at the same time it, the magnetic magneto restrictive component is has a moving part if you like a or a more moving part which makes it slightly more vulnerable to damage and so on and so forth reichsbeer minister asks what are your top three moments of have those muppets not learned anything in ship design from 1918 onwards without hindsight but in the view of the time okay well i've got to nominate the german type 1934 destroyers i mean yes okay i know Germany's ship design capabilities did take a little bit of a nosedive in the 1920s and early 30s, but still, stability is a fairly fundamental aspect of ship design, and when you get the stability so badly wrong that adding a simple radar antenna has dangerous propositions for your ship, so you have to start stripping other bits of top gear, and in order to make sure they actually stay the right way up generally and don't try and join the U-boat corps, you have to leave a bunch of their fuel in the tanks unburned. Yeah, you, you've basically almost accidentally in, invented an inverted ship. That is... That's a special kind of failure. I mean, I could mention the Königsbergs, but that'd be far too easy. Um, then, I think... The politicians, and unbelievably enough, some naval officers who seemed to think in the UK that a 12-inch gun battleship would be a brilliant idea to propose at the London Naval Treaty. <sighs> yeah, I mean, it's not like you've just had, what, the past two, three decades pointing out to you that no, in fact, the world will not comply with, the wish, with your wishes, and you can try and do whatever you like, fair enough, but, you know, the world will just keep on rolling without you. And if that means you try and build small ships for to please your mates in the treasury, everyone else will just build bigger ones because they don't care about your particular political hang-ups about spending money. <laughs> so, yeah, just, just the existence of those ships alone is a fairly big design fail in my book. And actually, returning to the destroyer um, theme of things, the US doesn't get off scot-free either because the Sims class, uh, at least as originally built, had issues that were almost as bad, in some ways you could possibly argue even worse possibly, than the Type 1934s. I don't know what it is with some people and interwar destroyer design. I mean, the Japanese had this 
some of these issues as well but the sims the things with the hatsuharas the fourth fleet incident showed that they were dangerously unstable but at least it took until the fourth fleet incident for people to work out that they were properly dangerously unstable with the sims class it was almost a case of I um, hope you keep up speed out of dock, otherwise you might fall over, um, until they had to massively downgrade things. Um, and also, the I think the other thing is with the Japanese, when you look at something like the Fubukis, you're like, okay, well, they're trying to fit the Fubukis in a smaller hull. That's probably not going to end well, but let's see how it goes. Whereas for the US Navy, by the time it got to the Sims class, they had a fairly extensive history of already overloading 1930s era destroyer designs. And they kept going. So, you know, you had the warning, you ignored it. What did you think was going to happen? The weird thing about it is that, you know, having then decided to go for broke and come up with an even more hilariously overloaded large destroyer design, which was going to be the Fletcher class, somebody somewhere managed to reel in the insanity and told them to basically knock it off. And you ended up with a Fletcher class that was pretty much the opposite of almost every other US destroyer class that had come immediately before it. In that, it, yes, it was heavily armed, but it was also about as stable as a rock. So it wasn't going anywhere fast and was open to a massive number of upgrades, which it wouldn't have been if the uh, guys who presumably had designed all the other ships and thought they were brilliant ideas had gotten their way. Kyla Stern asks, in movies, there's often a scene in which a ship, submarine, or in particular spaceship, pushes the reactor, engines, etc. beyond 100%, so 110%, etc. I have on several occasions heard people say that it would basically be suicide and one would never do that, but I suspect the specified 100% is the 100% in which it is guaranteed nothing will happen. So, does pushing engines over the safe specification and towards the absolute total actually done, and if yes, on what occasions or how often? Yes, it could be done. Um, not tremendously often, but more frequently than you might actually otherwise imagine. And you're pretty much right. The full power is the full power at which you can run basically until your fuel runs out and the manufacturer will guarantee, you, A, you will always reach that power and B, you know, things won't explode when you do. There is a little bit of reserve always left in there. But how much can vary from ship to ship, power plant to power plant, even within the same class. Now, there are two ways which you can effectively overclock your engines. One of which is using force draft. Um, so increase the air pressure in the boiler room. That feeds more air into the boilers, which means, you know, more combustion, which means more te higher temperatures, which means everything generates more power and off it goes. Now, that is moderately safe in as much as... To do that, you usually means your ship has a force draft system installed, which means you designed your power plant with that in mind. So whilst it might only run at a certain amount of power that would be rated as its maximum power under normal conditions, you can ramp it up and it's designed for that. I mean, it's you're not going to run on force draft until you run out of fuel from a full tank because you will eventually cause damage to your engines. And to be perfectly honest, running at force draft with the increased pressures and so forth in the boiler room isn't good for your engineering crew either. But it's a somewhat reliable way of doing this. I.e. if your engines are in decent shape and your captain orders you to go you know, all speed, force draft, etc. You can run on that for a couple of hours and be relatively confident you, you're not going to explode. Whereas the other option is literally just to pile in fuel or pour on fuel, depending on if you're coal or oil fired, um, to the maximum possible burn that you can get now obviously bear in mind you can't just shovel or pour things on indiscriminately because otherwise you'll smother your own fires but you know that combined with regulating the various valves and everything that regulate pressure maybe even closing off safety valves can allow you to ramp the pressure up on your engines by a fair amount um Obviously, the fact you're closing safety valves means you are going beyond the safety design tolerances of your engine. And that will, for a while, give you some fairly impressive power output. But every second involves you taking quite a considerable risk. Um, but it was done because, to be honest, yes, if your engines go, you're in a lot of trouble. But in the circumstances where you're pushing your engines that far the chances are the trouble you'll be in if you don't is even worse so there's for example um 
a rather famous one, which I've related a veteran's account of at one point on the channel, was when uh, British cruisers were being chased by an Italian battleship in the Mediterranean. And at the time, I believe it was HMS Gloucester, due to damage, was supposed to only be capable of doing 28 knots. Then they discovered that Italian 15-inch shells were falling around them, and everybody took off at high speed, and everyone was thinking, oh, we're going to leave Gloucester behind, you know, the rest of us are capable of well over 30 knots, this could be a problem, do we stick around and help Gloucester and then all possibly die, or do we leave Gloucester to our own fate, that wouldn't be very nice of us, so where's Gloucester gone? Then it turned out Gloucester's engineers was like, no, we, we are out of here, mate, um, and were leading the rest of the squadron as their speed gradually ticked up to considerably north of 30 knots, um, because, yeah, their attitude was, well, yeah, if we blow our engines and we need two months of repairs in Alexandria well so be it that's a lot better than catching 15 inch shells to the face so toodles um and of course you also have um HMS Rodney with its uh, sort of Schrodinger's engines where at one point when they're closing Bismarck on ostensibly 22 knots the engines are clapped out enough that they can't actually make it quite but then at other points when they're in proper serious mode um and they're just like throwing everything at it even though the engines are properly clapped out at this point you know at that point by all indications they're making 25 knots in a ship that was designed for 23 so yeah the and to be honest i suspect that some of the well um your 22 knots may be a bit faster than our 22 knots may in part be because of the absolute thrashing they were getting already worn out engines uh, previously to that. Salty Viking 10022 asks if the US Navy had gone with 14 inch guns for the Floridas like they proposed how would that affect all follow-up battleships up to the Colorado if at all. So yes yeah, a little known fact uh, but there were advocates in the US Navy for an 8-gun, 14-inch design for the Florida class um, way back, and then pressure again for the Wyoming class, and then obviously they got their way with the Texas and New York. It is pretty much a pattern throughout the US Navy's design history of the late 1900s and early to the 1910s of the US Navy itself is generally pressing for heavier armament um you know te tennessee's and new tennessee's definitely in new mexico's to a degree were hoped for to have 16 inch weapons and you know the floridas and wyoming's they also hoped would have 14 inch weapons so if they get the go-ahead then the florida class is going to have eight 14 inch guns they did look at a 10 14 inch gun option which is kind of almost like a proto texas but it they came to the conclusion that that was actually too big for most of their existing dry docks so the eight gun option if it was if a 14 inch option was going to be selected it would have been the eight gun option i suspect at that point they would have then refined that with the now alternate wyoming's so whether they would have made it a slightly larger eight gun ship or whether they might have been able to argue for a 10 gun ship i'm not entirely sure but it would it would be an intermediate stage between an eight gun 14 inch ship and new york and texas which are of course 10 gunners and then you'd get new york and texas and then you'd get nevada and everything would pretty much go par for the course the main question then is whether or not the driving factors that change the decision making for the florida class would persist in the u.s navy or whether it's a one-off because if they persist then you're effectively moving the gun caliber probably moving the gun caliber argument forward to classes so florida's and wyoming's now have 14 inch guns at which point the new mexico's and tennessee's probably get 16 inch guns whereas if it's kind of well you just about man managed to scrape over the line and that's it then well you have two extra classes with 14 inch guns and probably everything else develops as standard the only difference would maybe be that the uh, the longer barrel 14 inch gun would show up a, a maybe a class earlier than it did historically because the 14 inch 
he, the, the first set of 14 inch guns already in production but yeah it, what the legacy would be it, it, as I said would depend largely on the factors involved I, I don't think it would personally I don't think it would see a huge advancement um, I strongly suspect the Wyoming's might end up with 10 guns because at the time you've got the British building the Orions and then the King George V and the okay 13.5 inches slightly smaller than 14 but not that much and they they have 10 guns um, so they probably wouldn't want to persist with an eight gun design past the Floridas but yeah we'd, you'd have to see how that all panned out I suspect on balance that it might well be used to argue for at least the Tennessees to become 16 inch ships um, although that might obviously then set off a cascade of other people designing 16 inch ships a little bit earlier as well Jonathan Welch asks was the decision by Admiral Pai to ultimately pull back from sending assistance to Wake Island by the Carrot Carrot Task Force justified, in your opinion? I think it was overall, to be honest. Admittedly, some of that is affected by hindsight, but it doesn't really change my opinion that much. OK, granted, you've got Lexington and Saratoga, the two biggest carriers in US Navy service at the time, with a reasonable escort force. But it's an awful lot of eggs in one basket. At the very beginning of 1942, well, actually technically late 41, um, the Japanese Navy is at the point where it has the greatest advantage in carrier fighting versus the US Navy. The US Navy at this point has no experience of carrier fighting. The Japanese have a fair bit. OK, granted, Soryu and Hiryu are not the biggest and meanest carriers the Japanese could have sent out, but still their air groups have a a reasonable degree of competence in what they're doing and u.s anti-aircraft defenses are for obvious reasons at the weakest that they'll be during the war um, their carrier doctrine is at the weakest it's going to be during the war and they haven't made the damage control change procedures that they would make after coral sea and bearing in mind lexington went down at coral sea in large part because of failures in damage control so you have US fleet carriers at their most vulnerable with their least experienced air groups with not a tremendously great carrier doctrine and they are thinking mostly about reinforcing Wake Island not fighting a full-on carrier battle so if the Japanese get wind of them coming and it's a fight between hastily scrambled air groups from Lexington and Saratoga versus a coordinator strike from Hiryu and Soryu I'm putting my money quite firmly on Hiryu and Soryu. Um, the amount of defences that the US carriers have available, fighter direction, etc., it's just not, I don't think, would hold up at that point. Um, and you've also got to remember that the US has taken two very precious fleet oilers with it, and given that we know that at Coral Sea, the Japanese had a propensity for going after the occasional fleet oiler, thinking it was in fact a carrier, um... You know, even if Lexington and Saratoga somehow make it out intact, if instead Neshe and Neosho are taken out, the two fleet oil, fast fleet oilers, that's almost as bad. So, yeah, it's... Whilst it does condemn the people on Wake Island to some rather horrific consequences for the duration of the war, the alternative is, worst case losing a pair your your two big assets when it comes to fleet carriers at this point and two fast fleet oilers and your middle case scenario is losing possibly one of each maybe both of one and keeping the 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 other pair who knows but there's not that there's not many scenarios that don't rely on blind luck and miracles wherein a US force that actually tries to reinforce Wake Island is going to succeed um you know, even a one-for-one -one trade at this point in time favours the Japanese. So I think ultimately, ruthless as it might otherwise have been, I think the decision to pull back the Wake Island Relief Force was justified. Yes, in theory, they might have gotten in and gotten out without being noticed. Do you want to just bet like half your carrier strike force on it? No. Salomon Shakia 93 says, In Hayayo? Uh, hey 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 uh, anyway. Someone like that. Miyazaki's animated film version of Diana Wayne 
Wynne Jones novel Howl's Moving Castle, there is a scene where a squadron of battleships is leaving the harbour. To me, they seem very sim- visually similar to the Russian pre-dreadnought Cesarevich, but armed with shorter schwer Gustav-style guns. Which real-life ship do you think the ships in the scene were based on? And I'd like to hear whatever your personal and engineer's thoughts are on the ship shown in the film. Ah, uh, well, here's the thing in question, though. Why? Why do you make me look at these things? Yes, that is a bow chaser gun. Yes, that is side-by-side twin turrets forward. Yes, the wing turret is bigger than the forward turrets. And later on you see a rear shot where you find out that the big guns, i.e. the wing turrets there, uh, are represented by a third twin turret aft with a super-firing turret more of the scale of the smaller forward guns above it. And then you've got the sticking out casements, the pronounced tumble home. Uh, why? <laughs> I mean, yeah. The tumble home, the ram bow, the massive superstructure, this is all very, you know, 1880s France, which I suppose explains why you'd think of Cesarevich, which is somewhat inspired by that. Um, having your big guns aft and on the sides in this kind of triangular layout, again, is also a very French of the period not having and main big guns forward. Having side-by-side side forward guns is not unusual, uh, bizarrely enough, as it might sound. Again, for 1880s, 1890s ships, you see this on, uh, for example, the Beowulf, uh, the Siegfried-class coastal defence ships of Germany. They have a pair of side-by-side side mounted main guns, although they have at least have the decency to put them in single turrets, not twins. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's not entirely removed from an 1880s-early 1890s designer's continental design aesthetic, although I really wish it had been. Uh, you've also got some little pop guns mounted on top of the casements, which is a thing, I guess. So, um, yeah, I'd say this is, this is probably, if it's inspired by anything, a mashup of probably two or three different um, French pre-dreadnought and pre-pre-dreadnought design ideas of yeah around about the 1880s dash early 1890s as far as my opinion as an engineer goes it has no visible belt armor because there are scuttles all the way along and down the hull um it's massively high-sided i mean you can see the little ships in front of it it's got guns everywhere which means it's also got magazines everywhere it's it might be okay ish for a broadside battle although even then you've got at least four different calibers of gun present in just this picture alone at least two of which look like they were expected to actually fight in the main line for some reason there's a twin casement randomly sitting around there um yeah positives you're going to stun your enemy into such bemused silence that you might actually get a ram attack in um negatives or how to improve them i mean it's literally almost all the worst design concepts slapped together <laughs> plus you know oversized guns anyway uh, i mean with those side guns you probably have like what four shells stored in the magazines but nevertheless um how to fix them set scuttling charges put them out of their misery shoot the design staff and maybe travel back in time and shoot their ancestors and start again <laughs> i mean to be fair they they look fairly cool and steampunk but as a real life ship design uh even if you scaled the guns down to actual sensible calibers but kept the ra- the ratios between them they're still hilariously impractical in fact the only thing i've seen that's even more impractical is some of the Brazilian Riachuelo design competition entries from the 1910s. <laughs> and the less said about those, the better. Nid asks, It is generally held that the Washington Naval Treaty helped roadblock another very expensive arms race, and possibly even a war in the 1920s. What are some other examples of the often justifiably maligned politicians actually getting something right? A program they cut due to cost, or for being overly aggressive, etc.? 
Well, much as it pains me to say that the politicians do occasionally get something right, I suppose even a broken clock is right twice a day, so it's inevitably going to get something right purely by accident, if nothing else. Um, but to be fair to them, the Castle Ray doctrines in the aftermath of the Napoleonic Wars were probably a semi-decent idea. And they weren't quite Washington Naval Treaty in their scope, but given that the Allies in 1815 had France pretty much over a barrel, Castlereagh advocated essentially almost the opposite of what the Allies were going for at Versailles. Um, so rather than being incredibly punitive, um, Castlereagh's doctrine was, well, to take justifiable compensation, but to not overly humiliate the French basically to avoid them doing something like what happened in 1930s Germany, where they just get incredibly fed up of being de what they see as downtrodden and having fallen massively from grace and then flaring back up into aggression again. Um, his policy was basically to weaken the enemy just enough that they can't immediately think about kicking off again, but otherwise leave them with their pride and use the sort of generosity that you're expressing i suppose at that point to leverage other things that you might want like you know forcing people at gunpoint to a promise to abandon slaving and he was relatively successful in that given that in the aftermath of the congress of vienna in large part thanks to his guidance the europe ended up with a period of peace that largely speaking actually ran on for an unprecedented period of time by that point um another one i guess would be churchill believe it or not <laughs> in the 1910s and the more and more you look into him the more and more you can understand why the king's secretary was said to wonder like that churchill obviously clearly didn't actually have any morals or scruples at all because Churchill seemed to, at least in the First World War period, to take the idea that he had been given a policy or had decided a policy or position to support and he was going to run that into the ground, which was not great for the Navy when he was part of the government in the 1900s and was in put in with a fine, he was in cahoots with the Treasury and was desperately trying to cut the naval budget and naval expenditure hugely um all the time but then weirdly enough if you're expecting consistency but not perhaps weirdly enough if you realize that churchill was more about just getting behind an idea and going full bore into it once he was put in as uh first lord of the admiralty on the basis that everyone he was working for thought he'd then help rein in the spending he then took a look at well i now work for dash with the admiralty listened to what the Admiralty was saying about you know, force balances and how many ships the Germans would have versus the British, and immediately turned around and started ramming through ship after ship after ship after ship, much to the dismay of everybody who thought he was there precisely to stop that kind of thing happening. Which turned out to be just as well, because he kind of strong-armed them into... strong-armed the government into supporting things like the Queen Elizabeth class, which turned out to be a pretty good and solid investment. And I suppose you can... Although the line between military and political is a little bit blurred in this particular instance, but you could also probably point to Japan's decision to bring its ship manufacturing in-house. Because up until kind of the early 1910s, a lot, if not the majority, of all their warships had been built overseas. Um, and they decided, actually, no, we, for various reasons, in mostly political, would like to build them at home and so that's why like things like the congo was the last foreign built capital ship for the japanese navy well that turned out to be a fairly prescient decision for japan although it didn't necessarily work out brilliantly for everybody else because of course the anglo-japanese naval treaty uh, expired in with the conclusion of the washington treaty relation foreign relations of between japan and other nations cooled off quite dramatically in the interwar period and then of course in world war ii they were opposed to everybody else so them having the capability to both design and build their own warships um all the way up the spectrum from carriers and battleships all the way down to destroyers and submarines worked out very well for them um albeit just not particularly well for everybody else duke of petchington asks hydrak the king george the 
fifth class video with Matt has left me wondering. Because the King George V construction started in 1936, thus being too late to delay and make changes to the 9x15-inch gun design, why didn't the Royal Navy pick the 30-not-15-inch gun design, then slightly modify the 15-inch gun and mounting and turret machinery to use the 14-inch, i.e. fitted four 15-inch guns but not with them, and then be able to switch them rapidly when the escalator clause, clause was invoked? I think, in very broad terms, just because they were really, really hoping that everybody would stick by the treaty, and they were concerned... I mean, one of the reasons they dropped the triple fifteen design in the first place was they were concerned that if they were seen to be designing and laying down ships that would be in excess of the 14-inch calibre that they were asking for at the Second London Treaty, then they'd be seen as hypocrites and no one would want to go for it. Um, I suppose you... If, if it was agreed at the highest echelons of power that this is what they were going to do, then it could be possibly pulled off. I mean, the the thing is that when you present the ship with nine 14-inch guns, I mean, remember, originally the Royal Navy wanted 12. They had to settle for 10 because of other considerations to fit within the treaty limits. Going down to nine, when you compare that to the Nelsons with nine 16-inch guns, um, and, you know, the American standards with 12, 14 inch guns etc it's going to be a bit of a bitter pill to swallow now i suppose you could probably dress things up a little bit in by saying well you know they're 30 knots we've had put some of the displacement into speed they've still got the major armor that the king george V have so you could play it off to foreign observers that you know yes we've had to go with nine 14 inch guns because we've got this really fast really heavily armored ship and you'll probably get away with that um adapting the gun mountings to take to take a 14 inch gun but also be capable of having a 15 inch dropped in that in and of itself is probably not actually as difficult as you might think um, especially if you just put some additional basic i'm um, very crudely put some spaces on the 14 inch mountings um yeah i wouldn't worry so much about that or, or the weights to be honest the weight differential is not going to be too great where you're going to have the biggest problems is going to be your magazine and shell hoist systems because obviously they're very finely tuned to the size of charge and the size of shell that you're designing it for so you could design everything to be 15 inch capable but then you're going to have some rather interesting you know um storage spaces that are just a bit too big for a 14 inch shell and shell hoists that have a slightly odd rattle because everything seems to be a, to be a bit loose um, I suppose you could design them with kind of built-in but removable fillers and argue they don't know they're damping or something like that and just hope no one takes too close a look at them so in theory yes you could do a 9 14 inch ship that's actually a 9 15 inch ship in disguise the single biggest problem however that you'd run into with all of this is probably going to be how the heck do you dis disguise the fact that you've got you're going to be designing testing and then building a lot of 15 inch guns um that's that's the kind of process that takes years and is not at all easy to hide someone is almost certainly going to catch on to it and in order to design everything to spec for your 15 inch guns i mean okay you might use the original 15 inch shells as a base line but you're going to have to have at least one of these 15 inch guns around to take measurements off of to design your turrets before you sub in the 14 inches i suppose in theory you could do all this design work in the background and say it was an insurance policy against the 14 inch claws falling through and then keep everything on ice and then when the escalator clause gets invoked quickly whip it out again and start building 15 inch guns like there's no tomorrow yeah okay m maybe um people might get a bit suspicious about that though it'd be a very close run thing so yeah technically possible but also very expensive and in terms of practicality mm, i'd be hesitant i'd be hesitant that to think that anyone would be would try it be fun if they did though paul asks if you could take a camera on one trip with a time machine what event person or ship from naval history would you choose to photograph 
this is subtly different to what would I video. Um, if I had the opportunity to just take one photograph, I'd probably try and take some kind of somewhat aerial photograph of the Spanish Armada and the English fleet running up the channel. Maybe in battle, maybe the Battle of Granville or something like that, but I mean, the Spanish Armada was kind of like a, a case study in practically every kind of warship of the period, except for the galley, and they still had the galleys there as well. And then you have all the English ships, and you know, some of them are so tiny, it's we think about it as this a fight between two massive fleets, and indeed they were two massive fleets, but a lot of the ships, you know, it was more like attack of the especially aggressive sailing yachts than <laughs> than something like uh, the Battle of Trafalgar. I mean, just go and see the Golden Hind replica in London, and you realise, well, that would actually probably be a mid-sized ship at the time. I mean, okay, the Mary Rose is significantly larger, and there were ships that were... Obviously, Mary Rose wasn't present, but there were ships of her size and larger in the English fleet, but there were a lot that were a lot smaller than that as well. Little Dweller asks, how many ships could the UK build at once during World War II? How many slipways did the UK have that could build battleships, carriers, cruisers, destroyers and smaller ships? And how many larger, let's say, Liberty or Victory sized ships could, in terms of merchant vessels did the UK build during the conflict? Unfortunately, it's a question to which there can be multiple answers and... It's difficult to work out exactly, especially for the smaller ships, where you should quantify that. Now, the reason I say why it's possible to work out answers at all is because, usefully, um, the old versions of Jane's fighting ships, including the ones that cover both World War One and World War Two, lead in with, although in the World War Two books it's somewhat less detailed than the ones they had in World War for the World War One period, they actually lead in with a list of all warship builders, camel lairds. Um, Harlan and Wolf, the Royal Dockyards, etc. And they quantify how many large slips they have. Um, this is why I say there's more detail in it, because pre-World War One, it actually tells you exactly how large each of the larger slips are. And then they mention smaller ones, so you can work out from that sort of exactly what size ships can fit in those, engraving docks and dry docks and things like that. Whereas in the World War Two editions, they'll mention X number of large slipways or docks or whatever and they'll quantify the size of some of them and then they'll separate out and mention some smaller ones so you can get a loose but relatively accurate estimate of how many slipways engraving docks and dry docks there are for the warship building components of britain's industry but this is kind of where you run into a problem because one you have things like the flower class corvettes certain destroyers and frigates that were specifically designed to be able to be built in merchant yards which conway which um, james fighting ships doesn't quantify and to try and pull together with the information for all of those especially the small yards a lot of which no longer exist that would have been able to turn out a flower class or something that's an incredibly difficult piece of work. I don't know if anyone's actually done that before, adding all, all those up. Secondly, that gives you a theoretical, we could have, we have space on the slipways and in the docks for X number of hulls, uh, even if you <laughs> go through all of that difficult work. What that doesn't tell you, obviously, is in the fact in World War II, you've got ships coming in for refit, ships coming in for repairs, so they're going to need space in dry docks and graving docks depending on how what kind of bad state they might be in. Um, so that's going to reduce your shipbuilding capacity. Then you've also got the matter of the workforce. Um, for example, one of the reasons that HMS Vanguard was delayed was because at the shipyard that she was being built at, they only had a limited number of skilled men working there. So they chose to prioritise the completion of the carrier implacable and then move that workforce over to Vanguard, which subjected her to a few months extra delay on top of everything else so the theoretical maximum shipbuilding capacity of the uk if the shipyards are allowed to call for priority for workers is different to if you go with the historical priorities placed on production and then you also have industrial bottlenecks outside of the shipyards because it might all be very well having you know 15, 18, 20 plus slipways that can take battleship size hulls. 
But as the Admiralty pointed out, even with the investment they did in the late 1930s, they and with grabbing guns from retiring ships, the supply of guns and armour in late 30s, early 40s was only enough for the Royal Navy to lay down three capital ships a year, three battleships a year, not including aircraft carriers. That is a drop-off because of the industry had dropped off from World War One, where they were quite happily motoring along with four or five capital ships a year and could do eight if they wanted to. And quite often actually were laying down something along the lines of between six and eight anyway, because while the Royal Navy might only have been building four or five capital units a year, there were foreign orders as well. So obviously the shipyards are still ordering armour and guns from British suppliers for them as well. So that that reduced gun and armour production capability, which is a result of the cuts that came in the 20s and 30s because of the Washington Naval Treaty, means that, yes, you could in theory build a dozen battleship hulls, you could lay them down in a single year, but you could only fit them out at a certain rate because some critical parts, like you know the armament, <laughs> can't be produced beyond a certain capacity without massive investment in the rest of the infrastructure or buying things in from overseas. So exactly how many ships the UK could build, you know, there are about four or five different answers just based on those main aspects. Peter Guy asks, We all know how deadly Typhoon Cobra was to lightly ballasted destroyers, but in how much peril were the capital ships? There are pictures of carriers taking rolls so pronounced it looks like they're at 45 degree angles. This got me wondering whether carriers were especially vulnerable in extreme storms. Were the fleet carriers more or less stable than, say, the battleships in that type of sea state? Or does it not matter, assuming that they were entirely seaworthy and properly handled? Would that would they have been more vulnerable to capsizing if something catastrophic happened at the height of the storm, like the loss of propulsion or steering? Generally speaking, the carriers were somewhat more vulnerable than but the battleships in the storm. And that's for a number of reasons. I mean, here's the face of USS Hornet having been smashed in by the storm. There's similar photos uh, of Wasp with her flight forward flight deck collapsed and a few others that took a proper battering. Um... Now, the reason that the carriers are more vulnerable than the battleships, well, there are a few. One is carriers, shockingly enough, are fairly high-sided, which means they have a huge amount of um, area to be affected by high winds. Battleships sit somewhat lower in the water on average. They don't have quite as much um, broadside facing the wind. So if they get caught by a strong gust of wind or something like that, or a sea on the side, if they're not, you know, perfectly heading into the seas, and obviously the wind and the wave <laughs> may not be necessarily coming from the same direction, um, that means that the carrier is going to be more affected by the wind, and possibly even by sea state, if it gets really bad, than a battleship is going to be. Secondly, is the fact that, well, both carriers and battleships carry significant amounts of weight high up obviously the battleship carries its main armament the carrier carries aircraft but even in the worst of storms you'd expect the turrets to stay in place i mean if you're in a storm that's so bad it's throwing the turrets off of the ship you probably have larger problems to worry about like who's angered merciful poseidon um but in your more mundane typhoons, if the ship starts pitching, and as you said, there's a number of pictures showing your ships doing some fairly impressive uh, leans, well, the turrets, are, as I said, are probably going to stay locked in place, but it is entirely po more likely and possible for aircraft, which hopefully have been tied down, but you never know, someone might not have tied an aircraft down down properly or something might snap you know it's much more likely for aircraft to start shifting on a carrier and if one starts going it's probably going to end up with a cascade and you know a worst case scenario if an air aircraft carrier leans over too far and all of its aircraft decide they're going to go on a journey to the lower side of the ship all of a sudden that's quite a lot of weight that's shifted to the side that's already leaning at which point you could roll over and sink, which is not a good thing. Um, the third element, and you kind of get some idea from, from this bit picture of Hornet, 
is with carriers more so, well, perhaps more or less so, I guess, with US carriers with their open flight decks, if the sea gets really bad and starts, you know, smashing up the flight deck, there's a chance that a significant amount of water could make it into the hangar deck. Now, with the open uh, US ca uh, hangars, it's slightly easier for the water to get in, but equally somewhat easier to get rid of it as well. Um, obviously, they wouldn't have just kept everything open on the sides. They would have shut it over up, up. But in the kind of storms we're talking about, as you can see, um, large amounts of steel remaining where they're supposed to be is not necessarily a guarantee. Um, whereas with, say, an armoured carrier, it's got enclosed sides, so the water's not coming in there. But if the sea gets up strong enough to, I don't know, say, smash in a hangar, uh, smash in an elevator and the sea pours in, it's going to be much more difficult to get rid of the water that gets into the hangar. But regardless, the point is, if you get large amounts of water in the hangar, and you don't get rid of it post-haste, then the minute your carrier lists um, again in the in the storm, all of that water is going to run over to one side, you get a free surface effect, and also, you know, the lots of heavy water running around, that's more likely to break aircraft away from their man moorings, and then they fall over, and again, you roll over and sink. All of this is much less likely to happen on a capital ship. It's not spectacularly likely to happen on a well-managed fleet carrier, but it could, especially if there was a catastrophic failure of the engines or something like that. And so overall, um, if I was given a choice of being on something like a North Carolina-class battleship or an Essex-class carrier in something like Typhoon Cobra, um, I'm making a beeline for the battleship. Duke Master asks, We're all fairly interested in a lot of the what-if ships that go beyond what we actually saw built in real life. The one I've never heard anything about, or even any information I could trust on, is US battleship designs beyond the Montana. We've heard of the length and 33 not Montana, and the Illinois subclass of the Iowa, but never anything solid about what lay beyond. What kind of weird and wonderful battleships were in the works for the US Navy to rival the monsters being developed overseas? Not a tremendous amount seems to have survived of the post-Montana design ideas. Um, a couple of works, including Friedman's US Battleship, suggest there was some interest in revised battleship designs going up to at least 1944, although they also mentioned that not a lot has physically survived of that, which may indicate either that it was disposed of or may indicate that actually maybe there wasn't actually that much work going on, just some general um, communications. But the post-Montana design ideas seem to have been split into two main categories. Um, one category, somewhat more mundane, which is revisions to the Iowa class. The US Navy was not entirely happy with all of the specs and capabilities they got out of them. A lot of that was reflected in their ideas for modifying Illinois and Kentucky. But there were, was also apparently some work done to basically do a, an Iowa Type B uh, design, which hopefully would have corrected the things they didn't like. And the other element was taking a Montana-style design forward, and the most concrete proposal there seems to have been uh, an idea to slightly reduce the speed of the Montanas to accept a 27-knot speed, retain the 12-gun main battery, but the reason for the speed reduction was the fact the ship was going to be made larger by lengthening it, and the idea of that was to allow a much greater anti-aircraft armament, and also an anti-aircraft armament that was laid out more simply, rather than being almost pyramidal in structure, they wanted it to be on a maximum of two deck levels. Now, those designs are somewhat mid-war-ish, so when they're looking at using 5-inch 54 caliber guns, uh, dual-purpose guns, and then the light anti-aircraft armament. The light anti-aircraft armament is nothing close to what the US battleships of various types would be mounting in the latter part of the war. Um, but you can infer that, you know, with specifically length of midship sections to accommodate more anti-aircraft armament, if those ships had been built, the amount of Bofors and Orlikans and etc. that would have been fitted would have been truly hilarious. Um, they were also looking at some sub-variations of that, looking at maybe dropping a turret to increase speed, 
back up again, but they were looking mainly at, you know, as I say, improving the ship's anti-aircraft capability. If they ever seriously looked beyond that after the Montana class design was mostly finalized, then there doesn't seem to be a tremendous amount of documentation surviving about it. Most of the other stuff that you sometimes see banded about, like the 33 not Montana or a Montana with twin 18 inch guns, all of that came about during and as part of the Montana class design process rather than after it. Randy Topeka actually asks two questions to which I can't provide all the answers to, so I'm going to give kind of a half answer to each. Uh, the first question is, in the booklet of general plans for the Fletcher class, the forward deck seemed to have a significant upward tilt following the main deck. Having never been aboard one myself, is this an accurate portrayal of the actual ship, or is it somewhat exaggerated? And secondly, um, what are your thoughts on the USS Iowa's Turret 2 explosion in 1989? So with the Fletcher class question, I haven't been on a Fletcher class destroyer myself either yet, so I can't answer that definitively, but I know there are a fair number of people who are viewers of the channel who have been on a Fletcher class at one point or another, so maybe they can offer their comments uh, below. And also, of course, hopefully, all things working out, I'll be in the States in April and I will be aboard a Fletcher or class or two so i will have definitive proof at that point so i'll try to remember to keep an eye out um, for any unusual sloping on the decks for you um and then of course we will have our definitive answer the other thing with the i was turret 2 explosion now i have mentioned this a few times in passing in various dry dock episodes but of course you will remember that i had the great honor of hosting captain larry sequist who was the captain of uss iowa for a good chunk of the 1980s and I think given that he was involved in the investigation um, for Turret 2 um, later on, and of course he knew that he knows the ship much better than I do, um, I think I will try and get in contact with him and see if what if he's prepared to offer his thoughts uh, either to me or in a video for, that everyone else can watch. Because let's face it, I can read reports, I can make my own assessments as an engineer, but compared to Captain Sequist, I think we know which of the two of us is going to know more about that particular situation, uh, and it's not me. Eric Knapp asks, In your answer in Drydock 175 on the CVE, I thought, well, crews referred to CVEs as combustible, vulnerable and expendable, and the crews of landing ship tanks called them large, slow targets. Are there any other cases you know about where crews took the letter designations of a ship and twisted them for humorous reasons, dark humour or otherwise? I must admit, it's not something I'm as familiar with as other elements of naval history, in part because using these wonderful sort of BB, CA, CV, etc. designations is mainly a US Navy thing. Um, the, the, uh, certainly for the period that the channel looks at, the Royal Navy didn't really go in for it all that much, um, and most other navies didn't either. And as a result, most of the twisting of uh, ship designations, if you will, that I'm aware of are you know, mostly European navies where they take the ship's name and come up with something that's vaguely similar to it but has a lot of humour built in, at least as far as what counts for naval humour is concerned. So you have you know people calling the Nelsons Nelson and Rodol because they thought they looked like tankers, Bellerophon, well even way back in uh, sort of the Napoleonic era was the Billy Ruffian mainly because a lot of to be honest a lot of Royal Navy ship nicknames come down to a bunch of sailors going yeah that name sounds far too complicated to pronounce we're going to call it something else, and I think Billy Ruffian got away fairly lightly because it remains printable. And then, of course, you have the famous HMS Explorer, a uh, immediate post-World War II submarine designed to use hydrogen peroxide as a propulsion system, which everybody quickly named Exploder. And although it's slightly out of the time period the channel covers, um, I recently came across a hilarious, if somewhat old, news article back from the commissioning of the carrier HMS Queen Elizabeth, which really bears telling. Someone actually made a really, really good-looking cake of HMS Queen Elizabeth, by the way. And 
they obviously put little sailors and figures out there to celebrate the commissioning and so forth. And one of the little sailor figures was holding an HMS sign. And of course, the Queen came to commission the ship. And of course, so they put a little Queen figure down next to the sailor figure and the Queen's the, the sign that the Queen figure was holding just said me. So it was HMS me because, of course, we have Queen Elizabeth um, the second in charge of the UK. So, yeah, I always thought that was quite funny. Apparently the Queen found it very amusing as well. So that's all good. Corvus asks, how is the propellant in guns that use bag charges discharged? I understand there's a patch of black powder in each end of the bag, but what touches off the powder? An electric spark, a large size percussion cap, a brave gunner with a match? It depends greatly on the era. And yes, I know this is a Des Moines class with you know, brass cartridges, but um, anyway. The bag charges in later eras, you would have a primer tube that would be inserted along with you know putting all the um, bag charges in and in later ships that would be then set off electrically so it could look like all sorts of things usually looks like a large shotgun cartridge or something like that but obviously when you go further back in time those kind of things aren't necessarily available everything uses some kind of primer but the electrical firing system wasn't initially available so back then it would be a literal almost like a percussion cap you would have to hit the thing pretty hard and then that would set off uh, the main charge so sometimes you can see uh, lanyards and that kind of thing on older guns that use bag charges uh, and that would literally be someone standing there or obviously off to one side because you don't want to get hit by the recoil and you just pull the uh, the rope or the chain or whatever's attached to it which um, yeah even when you're <laughs> Even when you're practicing with a gun that has no actual ammunition in it, it can be a little bit unnerving. Pendon Harley asks, Rats on naval vessels. The idiom gives us the phrase, like rats on a sinking, deserting sinking ship, and terms of endearment like scurvy bilge rats, suggesting that ships have had a rat problem. Also in C.S. Forrester's, uh, also C.S. Forrester's character Hornblower tells others that he caught and ate rats as a midshipman. Could you tell us a little bit about rats aboard ship and their impact upon the crew and their ability to serve? So most ships rats for the majority of the time period that they existed, and to be honest, there are still going to be ships rats today, but back in the day they were pretty much a universal thing, uh, were actually black rats rather than brown rats, i.e. ratus ratus rather than ratus norvegicus, uh, which explains their propensity for running up and down all over things because Rattus Rattus is much more uh, limber and likes climbing a lot more than Rattus Norvegicus. But anyway, um, yeah, as a pretty much a universal thing on ships, pretty much accepted there was precious little you could do to stop that. Um, ships would often carry cats or dogs, mainly with the express purpose of controlling, although not eliminating, the rat population. Although there were occasionally some rather obscure and weird methods attempted to try and control the rat population as well um at one point on some ships there was ideas of finding some particularly cannibalistic rats feeding them um both on captured and killed other rats and on, on the sailor's own food to basically make them big strong and somewhat psychotic then releasing them into the general population and letting them take care of the rat problem for you um there were various rat-related sports as well, because if the... I mean, as I say, they're accepted as a general thing, so if the population doesn't grow too out of control, um, the sailors would eat them, if they could, a decent source of protein and some vitamin C. Um, if they can catch them, some would make them pets. They would be... Um, some. There's accounts of sailors training them, and, of course, if you're stuck on board a sailing ship for months and months at sea and you get incredibly bored, you're going to find all sorts of weird and wonderful ways to entertain yourself. So the things like rat, literal rat races, um, teaching them to do tricks and dances was apparently also a thing that they did, along with somewhat less uh, kind things like rat baiting. Um, but, yeah, they were pretty much an integral part of the ship's life as long as they didn't swarm all over the place and when they did then it was time for an all crew hunt the main risks you ran were the rats getting into your food stores in a big way and eating everything in sight which was obviously not good um 
And obviously, more particularly in the age of sail, if they took a fancy to your rigging and your sails, you were probably on a bit of a hiding to nothing at that point because, yeah, you don't want to put rat gnawed lines out when you're in the middle of a storm. Incidentally, we have actually kept a pet rat once before. It was a ratus norvegicus, but unfortunately, ratus ratus are relatively uncommon, although, you know, keeping a ratus ratus or two as a pet would probably go down fairly well in this household. Daniel Silverthorne asks, How exactly does a Ridui ship differ from a Barbette ship, central battery ship, or any other kind of pre-turreted ship in the ironclad era? I've seen it listed as a type in its own category, but from all the drawings and description I've, I've seen, Ridui, Barbette, and central battery ships all seem to be suspiciously similar, except in name. From what I can tell, you're pretty much spot on the money. Um... Ridui seems to be a French term, which means reduced or small, uh, sometimes using the concept of a small room. And from my memories of high school French and then searching French internet, the most common references to Ridui when it comes to ironclad warships, when you either translate the phraseology across or you um, look at an English entry for the the same ship, it seems to be talking about central battery warships. Um, not so much the Barbette ships, um, because that's slightly different with open gun, guns on top, but I think, because a lot of them you see something like Redoui and uh, Curassier, or, some, or a similar word, French word for armoured associated in the same sentence. So I think and obviously French viewers, or French speaking viewers, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it seems to be trying to uh, get across the concept of a small armoured room um, for a ship as opposed to a broadside ironclad where the citadel is very large. So a small armoured room would be, you know, a central battery uh, type arrangement. The difference between a central battery arrangement and a barbette arrangement, of course, being that in a barbette arrangement, the armour column sits beneath the gun and the gun either pops up above it or sits above it unless you have an armoured gun house whereas in a central battery the armour is very much separate to the gun and the gun or guns exist within this armoured gun house that is the central battery. Rob Gannon asks you analysed Plan Z and projecting the Royal Navy's likely response to it if peace had been maintained, but Plan Z was one of only three options that Raider presented to Hitler. Does any detailed information such as sketch designs for the proposed ships to be built exist for plans X and Y? So there seems to be a little bit of confusion in various published sources as to what exactly Plan X and Plan Y actually constituted, but the most common themes that I can find are that Plan X was a very large plan. Um, it was effectively a kind of what do we need to achieve naval supremacy plan, which everyone looked at and immediately went, yeah, we can't do that. It's completely unrealistic, which is saying something for Nazi Germany. Um, and then it appears to have been then pared down to a kind of this is the best we can probably do realistically if we get a lot of money in the budget which became Plan Y, and both of these plans appear to have been a bit more focused on things like panzer shift, long-range cruisers and submarines, although they still had battleship and carrier components in them. And then once Plan Y was looked at, that was then kind of put together with other proposals that were a bit more battle fleet, battleship heavy, and that eventually morphed into Plan Z, which, if you'll recall, at least in its initial versions, called for both a strong battle fleet and a fairly substantial force of long-range um, commerce raiding warships. As far as sketch designs, well, pretty much the ships that were built for the Kriegsmarine, plus the stuff that was um, brought in and planned for in Plan Z, uh, because the three plans were barely a year or two apart from start to finish. Andreas Urbart asks, I've recently read that in 1896 the ironclad Riachuelo of the Brazilian Navy was refitted to carry a Gube II submarine. Though I cannot verify this fact, were there any other attempts to fit the new technology of submarines to battleships? So I had a look into that particular thing as well, and as far as I can tell, I think 
people have somewhat misinterpreted a period news article. So in 1896, yes, Riachuelo was carrying a Gube 2 submarine. She wasn't fitted to carry it as a part of the course. She was actually fitted, as were a number of ironclads of this period, to carry a small second-class torpedo boat, which admittedly did look a little bit submarine-like. But the Gube 2 submarine that she was transporting was not intended to be equipped on the ship. It was that Brazil had actually ordered five such submarines from France. Uh, Riachuelo was in France at the time, and so it was transporting one of the completed submarines back to Brazil, where presumably it would have been put into service as a coastal defence vessel if it had turned out that the Gube 2 type submarine was actually worth anything, which as it turned out it pretty much wasn't. They are actually a fairly failed design, but nonetheless. Um, so that's the, the story of Riachuelo. I'm not aware of anybody seriously trying to fit submarines to battleships as some kind of secondary weapon. I say they did try it with second class torpedo boats, but that trend was already dying out by the 1890s. And by the time that submarines became properly viable with things like the Holland type and such, like in the uh, very end of the 19th century and really into the 1900s, um, one battleship speeds had increased to a point where deploying submarines really wouldn't have helped all that much. It would just be an interesting way of stranding some people pointlessly in the middle of the ocean. Um, and also, it turned out, you know, to have a practical submarine of any substantial capability also required them to be considerably larger than a second-class torpedo boat, and that also made them impractical to fit onto battleships. Kenneth Lynch asks, During the Age of Sail, were there tenders sent out by the Admiralty for cannon and shot? And if not, how did procurement for these materials work exactly? It varied somewhat during the Age of Sail. In the earliest parts, yeah, pretty much going to private gun manufacturers was one of the few ways to actually get any substantial number of guns. But very quickly, that was brought in-house. So you have things like the Woolwich Arsenal, which you can see here in its uh, somewhat later period format. And that and a few other Royal Gun Foundries and Ordnance Works became the primary source of ordnance and ammunition for the Navy. Now, in times where demand was incredibly high, such as during the height of the Napoleonic Wars or perhaps the Anglo-Dutch Wars, there would still be a certain amount of... Uh, cannon and certainly ammunition that would be ordered from private manufacturers but for the most part because as you can appreciate the strategic nature of the guns and ammo you need to make your navy viable um, the vast majority of the age of sale for the royal navy saw that being sourced from the royal arsenals the royal ordnance factories and so on and so forth Seawolf asks, whilst researching HMS Spey after an encounter with the current holder of that name, I discovered one of her historical namesakes had been sold to South American revolutionaries back in the early 19th century and had participated in the Battle of Lake Maracaibo under the name Boyaca. Apparently, part of a tradition of the British providing South American nations with warships and or whole navies that stretches back to just slightly before they technically were any South American nations. Given the Napoleonic Wars were only a few years past and Spain and Britain had been allied during that time, given that history, why were the British supporting counter-Spanish rebels? And since they apparently were, were they supplying warships for any other nascent nations? Okay, so there's a few things. Firstly, during the 17th, 18th, even early 19th centuries, Britain's policy on arms exports was um, pretty liberal. Up, anything up to and including warships, if the Royal Navy and the rest of the British Armed Forces didn't have any immediate use for them, was open to sail to pretty much anyone who wasn't going to be pretty much guaranteed to be an enemy of the UK. And, you know, most of the time, unless, of course, they're rebelling against you, thanks, America, um, anyone else who, you know, was throwing off their European colonial masters, well, that was a good thing for Britain because it meant that the European colonial empires that they were in competition with were being weakened. So, of course, we'd happily sell them weapons. Why wouldn't we? Um, pretty much under the same logic as why the US supplied lots of weapons to Afghanistan in the 80s. Um, but, specifically, when it comes to the South American revolutionaries in the early 19th century, 
it's a it starts off complex and gets even worse because it's one of the finest examples of Britain not so much disregarding the rules as twisting the rules into a pretzel and then driving a coach and four through the resulting mess. So yes, it initi- well initially Spain had been against Britain in the Napoleonic Wars. That's why there was a Franco-Spanish fleet at Trafalgar. Then you had the Peninsular War, where technically Britain was allied with Spain, but they weren't allied with Spain necessarily as in Spain of the post-Napoleonic War period. They were allied with the Spanish rebels and the government they were trying to form, but the king, Ferdinand the something or other, I think it's the seventh, possibly, I think, um, who had been deposed by Napoleon still was somewhat pro-French and once he got back in to power uh, with the collapse of Napoleonic France he basically disregarded most of what the government that Britain had been allying with was actually trying to do so and became kind of an absolute monarch again so the Spain immediately post-1815 was not the same Spain that Britain had been fighting alongside five for the past or five or six years which was not the same spain that had been fighting against britain before that and so on and so forth um they did want the british still did want spain roughly on their side because they wanted to try and keep the balance of power in europe and uh post-napoleonic france was still once it got itself back on its feet a force to be reckoned with so they didn't want another franco-spanish alliance And because they didn't want another Franco-Spanish alliance, Britain couldn't officially be seen to be siding with the South American rebels. But unofficially, the South American rebels served Britain's interests quite well. Um, Hilariously enough, some of the impetus for the South American rebellion came from a failed British tax on Spanish-held South America before the Peninsular War, but that's a completely different story. But anyway, once the rebellions had actually gotten going... As far as Britain could see, it would, again, weaken a overseas colonial rival because Spain wouldn't have colonies if the rebellion succeeded. In the meantime, it would sap the Spanish resources, which would, again, prevent them from building up their military uh, in European waters quite as much. And the Spanish were still off and on trying to practice restricted commerce, i.e. mercantilism, in South America. So the British thought, well... If these countries are independent, then we can trade with them, whereas at the moment our ability to trade with them is somewhat, still somewhat restricted because they're under control, the control of Spain, who doesn't necessarily want us having free trade with them all. So if these colonies all break away, that will probably actually be a net win for Britain, but we can't openly support the rebels. So we can't officially say we're on their side. So Britain officially declares itself neutral. And then you get ships like the Spey, which are due to be decommissioned. They get paid. It's been paid off for a couple of years, gets put on the disposal list and is not sold directly to the South American rebels, but is sold on to an intermediary. Then, of course, then that intermediary is gathering other warships as well. And, then a Spanish, uh, well, sorry, a South American representative shows up and says, well, I'm interested in buying warships. Now, well, haven't I got a deal for you? I have a bunch of privately owned warships I just bought that you can have. And please ignore the fact that, you know, the transition from being a Royal Navy ship to my ownership to your ownership is very rapid indeed, a matter of days, if not weeks. So, yeah, it's, it's totally not like this is a very carefully crafted cover story to indirectly supply with weapons but anyway um and again you know the army demobilizing after the napoleonic wars there was lots of spare small arms and ammunition going around so well if we sell it at bulk discount to somebody in the uk well we don't care whether we've got our money back and if that person just happens to then stick them on all those supplies on a bunch of ex-royal navy warships they bought from another private supplier and sell them off all to south america well, that's just that's just business, isn't it? It's nothing to do with the government. That's all just private enterprise. We don't control who our stuff is sold on to once we've sold it on to someone else. 
really, Governor. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it, it did get a little bit ridiculous. Um, after a few years, there was open recruiting drives and you had you know, an entire regiment being demobilised, an offer being made to the officers of the regiment, and then them turning around and saying, right, lads, well, I know you've all finished fighting for king and country, but how about you come and fight over in South America against the Spanish again? I mean, to be fair, we, we know we're kind of how to do that already, and, well, they're paying us a fair bit, and you get to do something rather than be unemployed, so what do you say? And, you know, you know obviously some people are like, no, I'd rather go home, but suspiciously similar regiments to ones that had just been disbanded were just forming up and heading off to South America. And Royal Navy officers as well. I mean, Admiral Cochrane would eventually end up there. Um, you know, he's on half pay. He can go and do what he likes, just so happens to go off and help found two separate <laughs> South American navies. But there you go. So, yeah. Um, it was effectively almost a war by... officially a war by private enterprise. Um unofficially it was the british government equivalent of a bar fight on a colossal scale with sort of firearms and artillery breaking out and the barman just turning and staring at the wall so that when the police arrive he can claim honest governor i didn't see anything <laughs> and the spanish kind of caught on to this except they couldn't really do anything because officially the british government wasn't supporting them and well because a lot of this stuff was being transitioned back and forth between the UK and South America under British flags, and then obviously hoisting Grand Columbia flags once they got there. Um, they couldn't attack them on the high seas, because if they did that, they'd be attacking British merchantmen, and then the Royal Navy would get involved, and, well, the Spanish fleet hadn't recovered from Trafalgar yet. So they kind of just had to watch as... Britain fought an unofficial private war in behalf of the the Grand Columbia re uh, rebels and revolutionaries, which obviously eventually ended up working. Um, yeah, a, a very very convoluted way of you know prizing a bunch of colonies away from South America from uh, in South America away from Spain without actually officially doing so. Fire Team Joker asks. During the planned Operation Downfall, the Allies had planned to send in a dummy fleet to try and draw out thousands of kamikazes. What kind of heavily modified ships would they use and who would crew said death ships? Also, do you think the Japanese would have fallen for it? So, from what I can tell, it wasn't so much a decoy fleet that Nimitz wanted to use as a feint. So, the, the most reliable sources on the matter that I can find indicate it's, it's not kind of a you know, big lumps of steel for the Japanese to smash into. The plan was rather, instead of sending in an invasion fleet, you know, transports, escort carriers, fleet carriers, es and, you know, battleships, cruisers, the lot, the plan instead was to construct a large fleet of mostly battleships and cruisers, with, of course, the appropriate anti-submarine escorts in the form of destroyers, to simulate, at least by appearances, the vanguard of an invasion fleet with some obviously carry air support in the background and the idea then was to lure out the kamikazes to attack this fleet and then that fleet obviously is extremely heavily armed with anti-aircraft guns it's got long distance fighter cover from the carriers and because they're all fast they're able to maneuver and dodge and weave and do everything they need to do without being tied down to slow vulnerable transport and thus hopefully chew up the waves of kamikazes that they reckon the Japanese were going to send after them. And then, once you chewed up all the kamikaze waves, then the vulnerable transports arrived, and hopefully the attacks on them would therefore be a lot less. Whether the Japanese would have fallen for it or not, who knows. Um, I think it depends probably mostly on what exactly that fleet does. If it just kind of sails and then sits there, the Japanese might figure out something's up. Whereas if they sail up to the Japanese coast in large numbers and begin shooting at it, and you know, aircraft are attacking, etc., etc., especially if they're shooting at beach areas, the Japanese might conclude this is the opening bombardment of the invasion and then launch. But, you know, who knows? Vinve asks, So, during World War II, the Regia Marina sent the 12th Squadri uh, Squadriglia MAS? I think that means 12th squadron of the mars boats anyway to serve on lake ladoga in finland of all places 
Now, the Royal and US navies served around the world, but can you come up with examples of smaller navies serving in a place more unexpected than this? I mean, it is uh, <laughs> it is something of an unusual thing. The last thing you're expecting when you're in a Finnish lake is, um, yeah, Italian torpedo boats. But, I mean, during the First and Second World Wars, you did get a few odd um, ships showing up from various nations in places you wouldn't expect. Although, um, like, sort of the, the logical reason behind it is fairly clear. But when you just look at it in terms of, well, it's this navy showing up in this place, it, it looks a bit more weird. So, for example, Georges Averoff, the armored, Greek armored cruiser, ends up running convoy missions in the Indian Ocean, convoy escort. So, yeah, you have a Greek World War One era armored, well, pre-World War One era armored cruiser running convoy escorts in World War Two, um, as far east as, you know, the East Indian Ocean and Australia, which is probably the last place you'd expect to find a Greek warship. Um, unless, of course, you know the background as to why it's been assigned there. You also have the Dutch Flores class gunboats, who basically seem to show up almost anywhere where there's water to float a boat and somebody on shore needs shooting. <laughs> it doesn't really matter what theatre of war, um, they just seem to be out for blood all the time. And, of course, whilst it's actually relatively close to its own home country, you also get things like the uh, Brazilian monitor Parnaiba running Atlantic escort duty against U-boats. Bearing in mind this is a flat-bottomed, extremely shallow draft river monitor, and it's, you know, bobbing around in the Atlantic, where its primary defence against U-boats is, I have too shallow a draft for your torpedoes to actually hit me. Matthew asks, in your Royal Navy's response to Plan Z video, you outlined how the Royal Navy could possibly have responded to Germany's planned naval build-up. What were Italy's contemporary plans, and how would the Royal Navy account for them if, politically, Italy moved towards a German alliance as historically happened, but on the hypothesised Plan Z timetable? Uh, yes... The Italian response plan, I guess, if you can call it that, um, for naval construction, is a little bit of a three-way mess. Because in the interwar period, the Italians didn't care less what the Germans were doing. But to be honest, they really didn't care that much what the British were doing either. What they cared about was what the French were doing. And for the most part of the interwar period, the Italians and the French actually had relatively a relatively cordial understanding which was basically if you don't build up then we won't build up and that way we both get to save money and we all win a happy okay great fantastic and then the germans came and ruined it all not by going to italy you should build up your navy specifically because um they well they tried to encourage that but the italians weren't particularly interested in taking marching orders from the germans at that point what happened was the French fleet and the Italian fleet were kind of in an equilibrium, which was great as long as each regarded the other as the main issue. But then the Germans start building things. And the Germans are building things primarily with the goal of facing off against France. So France has to respond. So the Germans build the Deutschlands. So the French start building the Dunkirk and the Strasbourg. And as far as the French are concerned, they're building this in direct response to a threat that the Germans have created. But the Italians are now seeing the French building two, okay, small, but modern, fast capital ships. And they get a bit worried about this, because, you know, as long as the French have the Britannias and a couple of Corbets hanging around, and the Italians have the Cavours and the Dorias, they're not particularly worried. But once the Dunkirk and Strasbourg are laid down, now they do start to get worried. So they start the modernization plan for the Cavours and the Dorias, but they also start looking at how do we respond to this? Do we respond with a similar to Dunkirk style ship, or do we actually go the whole hog and try and build a modern fast battleship? The decision is to build the two Littorios, Littorio and Vittorio Veneto. Um, but of course, because that's an escalation, because they're much bigger and more capable than a Dunkirk or a Strasbourg, the French start to panic a little because they've already gone in and rejigged Strasbourg's design because the Germans have started building the Scharnhorsts. So now the French are looking at it and going, right, we've got the Dun we've got the Deutschlands to worry about, we've now got the Scharnhorst come out to worry about, and now the Italians are building battleships as well. So now we've got to, because you know we're now theoretically the target of both of these navies, we've got to build a navy 
that can stand up to both of them. So we will build the Richelieu's. And obviously they've initially planned for four of them. And then the Italians are looking at it and going, hmm, yeah, but four Richelieu's, two Dunkirks, plus whatever old ships you keep around, that's more than two Littorios and four modernised World War One dreadnoughts can handle. So we need to build some more ships. And so they start work on Roma and Impero. Which, of course, means the French start panicking a little bit because now the Italians are building Roma and Impero and the Germans are building the Bismarcks and so they have to think about designs for the Alsace. It's basically a no-win feedback loop because... The Italians want to be equal to the French. The French want to be equal to the Italians and the Germans. And the Germans don't care what chaos they're causing in the Mediterranean. They're just building ships. So every time the Germans build a ship, the French will respond. The Italians will look at the French and go, yes, but if you combine all your forces, you can come against us with overwhelming force. We don't like that, so we've got to match you, which means the French will want to try and match them. And around, 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 around it goes. <laughs> so... If Germany's doing the Plan Z build-up, you're probably just going to get some escalated version of this because the the Plan Z build-up, the French are going to at least initially try and match it, which means the Italians are going to try and match the French, which means the French are going to try and match the Italians. It's all going to go horribly wrong with the possible get-out clause of if the British really start ramping up their building plan, as I outlined they could possibly do, the British might turn around to the French and in the spirit of their alliance say, OK, look, don't worry about the Germans so much. We've got this. You worry about building up against the Italians. But this will probably only happen once you know, a couple of sets of modern capital ships have been laid down. And so the Italians will probably, well, they will end up with their, their four Littorios and the French are going to have their four Richelieu's. They'll probably be building whatever they decide the Alsace to be. And the Italians will be building some kind of successor to the Littorios to counter the Alsace. But I think that's probably about as far as either side is going to get before you reach kind of 43-44 cut-off date in that theoretical timeline. Odd Engineering Questions asks, for the High Altitude Research Project, or HARP, they welded a gun barrel on top of a spare 16-inch gun from an IR class to create a 89 caliber weapon. This sounds interesting. Tell me more about that. And has anybody ever considered combining two guns for naval use? So Project Harp, at its ultimate stage, as you can see here, is literally just two 16-inch gun barrels welded together and then bored out to be smoothbore. Um, creating an incredibly high velocity but incredibly heavy and unwieldy weapon, as you can see from all the support structure that's um, you know, around the gun to stop it drooping and falling over hilariously. The idea, as conceived originally, was to see if you could shoot satellites into space literally without rockets, so or with very, very, very small rockets the size of which could fit inside the gun barrel, which would obviously be a lot cheaper than using you know a full-on Delta rocket or something like that to get a satellite into space. Ultimately, obviously, as we don't exist in an era where the Kennedy Space Center is also the world's largest artillery range, it didn't quite pan out, but it was amusing to watch for a while. Um, they did manage to shoot some projectiles into space, at least, although they, they did come back down again. Um, but this kind of thing for naval use, not really going to happen. F a few reasons. One, the as I said, the barrel becomes incredibly heavy, which is going to make it difficult to turret mount. Um, two, well, again, look at the amount of support structure and machinery that needs to be there to stop the gun barrel drooping at sea that thing would droop and bend and be useless very quickly. Um, and you'd probably, with all that extra stuff on it, you'd probably only be able to fit a very, very few on the ship, even if you could. You'd be you'd be talking sort of pre-dreadnought layout with absurdly long guns pointing forward and aft. And yes, you'd get hilariously high muzzle velocities out of it, as was proved. Um, but apart from anything, in order to do that, they had to make the guns smooth war not rifled which will start to affect the accuracy somewhat so yes you'd have a hilariously over penetrating naval round but firing from a gun that a you wouldn't have that many of b you would probably stop working about a week into your voyage and c even if you did hit something you probably just poke a hole straight through and out the other side apart from anything else which is not really that effective colin williams asks 
were the 12 inch 50 caliber guns of the USS Alaska worth it? Or would they have been better off being designed to mount twin 16 inch, whether 16 inch 50 or 16 inch 45? Assuming the decision is made to save money in R&D and simplify the logistics chain, would the Alaskas be finished sooner? If so, when? Uh, what actions might they take part in and how well would they fare? Uh, would Hawaii get finished? And will they last longer in reserve due to the commonality in calibre and speed to the Iowas? Could they possibly survive long enough to be reactivated as part of the 600-ship Navy? Overall, um, I don't think it would be possible to just do a straight swap. I mean, there's the general rule of thumb, as I've mentioned before, of if you're going to be upgrading calibres in design, you can drop a gun in exchange for two inches, which in theory would give you the ability to swap triple twelves for twin fourteens, um, but doesn't give you the ability to swap triple twelves for twin sixteens. So I think you'd need a slightly larger ship. I mean, the Alaskas are within shouting distance of repulse and renown. Now, granted, the Alaskas are built on cruiser hulls as opposed to Renown and Repulse, which are battle cruisers built on more capital ship grade hulls. But still, um, you know, they're, they've got about the same level of protection in terms of overall belt thickness. Some of the armor distribution and armor layout check varies a little bit. Renown, obviously, actually, for a older albeit modernized ship has somewhat better torpedo defense because it's got torpedo defense on the scale of a capital ship as opposed to alaska's torpedo defense on the scale of a very big cruiser um they've got roughly similar top speeds so you might think oh this is all looking good and of course renown has twin 15s but the thing you've got to remember is that alaska has the full spectrum late war sensor suite anti-aircraft suite etc which um renown well, Renown has a similar scale of anti-aircraft and sensor suite by the end of the war, but also by the end of the war she's, uh, well, by 1939, in her ret retrofitted state, she's significantly heavier as well. She's gone up in displacement to a point where she now displaces about 4,000 tons more than she did when she was built and about 2,000 tons more than Alaska. And obviously the 16-inch gun is heavier still. So if you were going to build an Alaska with twin 16s, it is going to have to be a somewhat larger design. Um, not massively larger, but larger. And so you'd have to start off all the way back at the initial design step concept stage. And she's less useful in her design role with the 16-inch guns, because the 12-inch guns do actually have, well, a number of shells, 9 versus 6, but in a cruiser hunting role the ability to fire somewhat more rapidly especially once you've got the range or if you're happy to rely on radar range from the bat straight off of the bat is a lot more useful at that stage than firing fewer 16 inch shells over a slow period of time but nevertheless if they if they did decide to do this anyway would the alaskas be finished that much sooner i don't think so um, the Alaskas were could have been finished a lot sooner historically if the resources were available, but they were put on hold in order to divert um, steel and other things to the carrier program. Because even though the US obviously was capable of building an awful lot of ships, it was actually reaching a, its construction bottleneck in the latter part of World War II, as evidenced by the steel shortages that you know they had to prioritise which ships they wanted. So. Whether it's got triple 12s or a slightly bigger version has twin 16s, I don't think is going to make all that much difference to the decision of actually we want the Essexes first. And thus, she's probably not going to take part in any uh, of the wars, uh, ac main actions like North Cape or whatever. Um, would you get Hawaii? Maybe, because the supply and development of the guns would be a little bit quicker, so the construction might be a little bit accelerated but you still got that pause hanging over everything um if by some magic they decided actually we are going to prioritize alaska and she did get into action well you know she's a, a very large cruiser with decent ish armor but you know when you consider renown going up against enemy targets it's usually either renown facing off against something like the shan horse with 11 inch guns 
all renowned facing off against a target where neither side has particularly brilliant armor like the Congos, um, or a scenario where Renown's using its speed and excellent gunnery to get the advantage. It's Renown isn't put into scenarios where you imagine she's a particular tank. So if I mean, if a Twin 16 Alaska went up against a Scharnhorst at North Cape, then sure, I'd say that Alaska probably has a pretty decent chance of things. Um, but going up against a, a true battleship, if you like, I wouldn't necessarily be holding my breath because she would be very much be a glass cannon at that point. Um, would they last longer in reserve due to commonality and calibre and speed to the eye? Was probably not because... They're still less than the Iowas. They don't offer as much protection. They don't offer as much um, self-defense capability um, in terms of anti-aircraft armament. And with six guns, they don't offer as much firepower either. But they would still, as the Alaskas historically did, cost almost as much to run. So they, they'd be disposed of probably for about the same reasons as they were disposed of historically. Um which obviously then obviates them being reactivated in the 1980s. The The only thing that I can see them see, it poss see possibly happening is that with the commonality in firepower, it may be that the S South Dakotas get ditched first, then the North Carolinas, then the Alaskas. Um, and so the Alaskas, they might hold out into the mid 60s maybe even the early 70s but i can't see them honestly being retained after that unless somebody decides to use them if they last long enough to some decides to use them as an experimental platform to develop the next generation of missile technology and then completely converts them he also mentions as a postscript if you had the choice between 16 inch 12 inch or turret farm 8 inch versions which would you choose um I mean, if I can get a Brooklyn only armed with Des Moines triples instead of triple sixes out of the Alaskas, yeah, I'd go for that, because that would be absolutely hilarious. That would be a a ship that could, you know, at that point you can engage three or four cruisers at once with one hand tied behind your back. Conman2163 asks, What impact did the invention of the Gatling gun have upon naval warfare design considerations, if any, and were they used in any navies before being made obsolete by the invention of the machine gun? Well, the Gatling gun was adopted into a number of navies, and Gatling gun-style weapons were adopted into even more, uh, including some slightly larger caliber ones like Hotchkiss revolving cannon. Um, weirdly enough, the US Navy never seems to have been a particularly large f fan of them, and the number of navies that carried Gatling guns as a landing weapon um, is even... Well, I mean, obviously swells the numbers on top of the ones that were using it as an actual shipboard weapon. Um... The design consideration was basically mostly for use as an anti-boarding weapon, and indeed, on a couple of in a couple of conflicts that involved ironclads, it was used in that method um, to cut down boarders coming onto deck. And later on, as the torpedo boat threat advanced, at least initially, something like a Gatling gun was seen as a somewhat viable um, to use against torpedo boats because they were pretty small and um, torpedoes of the time. Uh, at least the early ones were so short range that you know hosing the crew off of a torpedo boat with a Gatling gun was a legitimate viable method of defense, although that tended to die out relatively quickly because torpedo boats got bigger, torpedoes got more capable, and then you needed you know a 20, 37, 40, 47 millimeter or something weapon to reach out far enough. That's where you get things like quad barrel Norden felts and stuff. Um, so yeah, they were in use for various purposes, lastly in an anti-infantry, anti-boarding role, and then yeah, the machine gun and other weapons render them obsolete. Amanda Jones asks, I've heard that black holes on coal-powered ships such as Titanic and the Victorian peacetime colours were to hide the mess from coal dust. Is this true? Were there any other aesthetic standards originally from some functional purpose like this? Basic pattern recognition in battle was one of the main reasons for other aesthetic standards Early, in earlier times, I mean, the what's now called the Nelson Checker, where you see you know the black and buff or black and yellow lines along British age of sail warships, came about in the, the towards the latter part of the Napoleonic War period, and that was mainly to allow British warships to recognise each other, even if you couldn't see their colours, the flags, um, 
because the enemy hull colors would not be that pattern. So if you saw um, a yellow and black striped vessel, like, oh, okay, well, this is one of ours, and anything else wasn't, so you could shoot it. Um, now, in terms of the aesthetic standard with black hulls, you do see it said a lot of the time that this was to hide coal dust stains. Um, I'm not necessarily entirely persuaded by that argument. For one thing, not all coal loading was done into the side of ships. Okay, on some ships it was, especially cruise vessels, but where you would do side loading of coal on a warship is usually where the belt armour is. You can't do that. So a lot of that uh, coaling, for warships at least, would go in over through down through the decks. At which point, you know, having a buff or white or whatever superstructure, that's not going to save you from getting covered in coal dust. So the practicality of, you know, a black hole protecting you from coal dust, I don't think is really there. Um, additionally, even for the navies that did go for black holes, like the Royal Navy, they didn't always. If you were on tropical stations, your hull would be white, which is the absolute worst colour if you're worried about coal dust staining. Um, and other navies just flat out didn't go for that at all at periods. I mean, the Victorian peacetime colour schemes changed over the years and between different navies, but there were good sections of time where the majority of some fleets um, were in very pale colours, and you don't very often see them looking that dirty from coal dust and the like. So I don't think that really is the explanation, especially because when you look at, um, you know, merchant shipping, even in the era when steam is just beginning to take off, a lot of those ships have black hulls. I mean, Cutty Sark, for example, black painted hull, not a steam engine in sight on her. She's a pure sailing vessel. And of course, uh, you know, Warrior famously painted all black on the hull, um, at least above the waterline. So I don't think it, it's the coal part necessarily. I think it's, to be honest, more the part that, one, black paint by the 19th century was pretty cheap, um, and it's relatively easy to get an even coating of black, uh, an even colour, whereas if you're going to go for some fancy colour that's not black or white or a very pale grey you can end up with varying gradients which don't look as good. So economy is involved. But also, and one of the reasons why various colour schemes ver um, would would vary quite a bit, black is obviously very good at absorbing heat. So if you are sailing around in the English Channel or the Atlantic, paint your hull black. It'll help keep your crew fractionally warmer. If you're assigning them to the Mediterranean or the Indian Ocean or the Pacific, don't do that because you will roast your crew and so you paint everything white or a very pale grey. And as I said, no one seems to have paid the blindest bit of attention to the fact that theoretically this would make a ship look dirtier. Uh, you just put the, set the crew to cleaning things a little bit more, even if it does. So I think there were a lot more functional and practical purposes for having black coloured hulls in a lot of 19th century vessels that have really not all that much to do with coal dust. Michael Imbizi asks, The Civil War era ironclad Dunderberg Rochambeau was originally intended to have both a casement battery and two turrets, but during construction it was decided to delete the turrets from the design. She was eventually sold to France because the war ended before she was finished, and she was then taken into French service in 1867, but stricken in 1872 and then scrapped in 1874. My question is, do you think she would have had a greater service life and remained useful for longer if the turrets had remained in the design? So for those of you who are unaware, the casement was originally supposed to be somewhat shorter. You can actually probably even guess how much shorter looking at the pictures. And there was supposed to be a fore and aft twin turret, each mounting a pair of 15-inch Dahlgren guns. They were eliminated, as said, from the design, and it ended up just being a case for ironclad. Now, if she'd kept the turrets, would she have remained in more useful service for longer? I don't think so, uh, for a couple of reasons. One, the 15-inch Dahlgrens are good weapons for the American Civil War, but they're a little low velocity, um, and once armour really gets its stride going in the late 1860s, 
you need something with high velocity um, to really mess up armored ships. So they would have been replaced. I mean, the guns the ship came with were replaced by French models almost immediately as soon as she entered a uh, French dockyard anyway, so that's pretty much a given. Um, I suspect the sheer amount of armor planned for the turrets would have caused her to be have even more st stability and sea keeping problems than she already did. Um, she was relatively short range and as you can see her low profile kind of meant she was effectively a shallow draft coastal defense vessel in a period when France really wanted more long range ironclads oceanic ironclads they did have a few coastal defense ships but to be honest the ship was built more to stop the prussians getting her oh it was bought sorry to stop the prussians getting her more than because the french navy actually wanted her in theory yes you could have refitted obviously the turrets with french guns it's still not going to make her a particularly useful ocean going ship and also her armor whilst it's pretty decent thickness for the time that she's being built in by the 1870s that armor is no longer really um you know a frontline thickness and when you combine that with the fact she's not a particularly brilliant sea boat and it's just after the franco-prussian war so the french are basically trying to ditch anything that they can ditch without compromising their fleet completely even a turreted version of Rochambeau is not really going to last in in French service, I don't think, because you'll still be obsolete and underprotected. And this is one of the big problems of a coastal defence ship. You have to pretty much give it as much armour as you can, at least in the 19th century. In the 20th century, you could make an argument for maybe being cruiser shell-proof with big guns. But certainly in the 19th century... If you are actually called upon to use your coastal defence ships, that's probably because the enemy's big oceanic ironclads have shown up, and they're going to be the ones with the biggest guns and the most armour, so you need the armour to stand up to those. And if you don't have it, well, then you're basically a ship you can only use as a last line of defence, and you're not going to be very effective in that role, so you'd have, you'd, but she'd has to go at that point. Of course, if she'd been sold into Royal Navy service, given the Royal Navy's propensity for keeping practically every ironclad they ever built until Fisher came along, she'd probably still be around in the 1900s and rated as something like a third-class coastal defence ship and being stored in Spithead or something, just in case they were needed for some reason. Mr. V asks, How does Nevada compare to the German World War I and interwar capital ships? Nevada's an interesting one, really, because... She sits right between the Koenigs and the Bayerns in terms of when she's constructed. So she's just a fraction more modern than the entire German 11 and 12 inch battle line. Just a fraction less modern, at least in terms of design time, as not maybe necessarily design features, as compared to Bayern. And then obviously that's the last German capital ship uh, battleship completed in World War One, and then you compare her to, well, the Deutschlands if you count them, but let's face it, okay, moving on, the Nevada's better than the Deutschlands. Um, then you compare her to Scharnhorst and Bismarck. So let's knock down the easy two, the World War Two interwar stuff. So Bismarck is superior to Nevada. She's faster. Armour is broadly equivalent thanks to mid, um, in terms of effective thickness, thanks to interwar metallurgical advances in Germany and indeed in the UK um, and the armament of Bismarck the 8 15 inch guns that Bismarck has is considerably more powerful than the 10 uh, older 14 inch guns that Nevada has so Bismarck definitely superior Scharnhorst Scharnhorst is an interesting one she's faster armor again broadly similar um, within shouting distance one way or the other but then you have the guns. Yeah, Scharnhorst has the 11-inch guns. Okay, they're much better than World War One era 11-inch guns, but still, um, I think it would depend. If you were looking at Nevada in, say, 1939, when Scharnhorst is just about to go to war, I'd kind of put my money a little bit on Scharnhorst, even though she has the weaker armament. Her fire control systems and gun range are such that she can almost certainly outshoot the Nevada. 
Um, but then once Nevada gets modernized, the tables probably turn a bit at that point. A kind of a Nevada at the North Cape. Yeah, I think that's probably the best way. If you have Nevada, for whatever reason, entering combat with Sean Horst in 1939, I'd just about be putting my money on Sean Horst because of that advantage at the longer ranges. Um, whereas if you had Sean Horst at North Cape and subbed in uh, Nevada instead of Duke of York, Sean Horst will run from the modernized Nevada. It's just that Nevada probably won't be able to catch her. <laughs> but, you know, such is the fortunes of war. Now, dialing it back to the World War One period, um, if you compare her to the Kaisers or the Koenigs, well, they both have 10 guns, but Nevada has bigger guns, 14-inch guns, so she has a firepower advantage there, at least once she sorted out some of the inaccuracy issues um, that plague her to start with. So we're assuming that, you know, crews are competent, their gunnery is all right, and the major issues are sorted out. So, so things like um, dispersion on guns being perhaps a little bit too much for comfort early on. So assuming that's sorted out, Again, speed-wise, okay, Nevada just a fraction slower, but probably doesn't make much odds. It's half a knot. Um, but she's got the bit larger firepower, and of course she has the all-or-nothing armor scheme, and her armor is, again, within shouting distance of the thickness this time of uh, German armor, because obviously it's now contemporary materials. And that basically gives the edge to Nevada, because if their armor is broadly comparable, well... German 12-inch guns versus American armor versus German, American 14-inch guns versus German armor, if everything's in the broad, broad park, well, Nevada can take punishment at much closer ranges and have her armor remain intact as compared to the Germans, with 12-inch guns will struggle to get through her armor at the same range. So Nevada, I'd say, is superior to a Koenig. Uh, but when you look at a Bayern... Now things get interesting, because once again, armor thickness, broadly comparable. Nevada has the all-or-nothing advantage over Bayern's distributed scheme. Speed, again, roughly comparable. Bayern has a slight edge, probably not enough to make much of a difference, except now, whilst Bayern has 8 guns and Nevada has 10, Bayern has 15-inch guns, um, albeit World War I German 15-inch guns, and Nevada has 14-inch guns. So that's going to be a much, much closer fight. Um who exactly would win in a fight between Nevada and Bayern? I don't know. Could go either way. I think it's that would genuinely be a fight that comes down to who gets the first hit in. Um, which, if we relax our, we're assuming all other factors being equal, rule will probably be the Germans. Because, um, yeah, US gunnery in World War I, uh, until they'd been drilled quite heavily by the Grand Fleet, not the most brilliant. But... If we reinstate our all things being equal, it's pretty much a coin toss, I'd say, between Nevada and Bayern. Eric J. Van Duting asks, People often discuss the what-ifs of U.S. carriers being present at Pearl Harbor for the Japanese attack. My question is, given that the U.S. had known for a while there was a risk of war breaking out with Japan, and that only three out of seven U.S. carriers were even in the Pacific at the time, how often was there more than one carrier docked at Pearl Harbor throughout 1941? Actually, a surprisingly large amount of the time um lexington and enterprise had both been in pearl harbor in late november um so, so less but just over a week before um uh, before enterprise had then left heading for wake island and um lexington left a few days after that you also have um the fact that okay saratoga was in for a fairly long refit in 1941 so she wasn't at pearl harbor for a good period of time so for the majority of 1941, in fact, pretty much all of it, you're not going to have three carriers there, but there would have been semi-regular occurrences when there were two. Sworn brother of the Ballistic Order of St. John Moses Browning asks, <laughs> I read that when HMS Hood went down, neither HMS Electra or Prince of Wales found any bodies in the water. If memory serves, I think Ted Briggs said in an interview that he was being sucked down even after he left the ship. Yes, that's correct. Despite wearing a personal flotation device until a gas bubble of some kind escaped the wreck and carried him back up. And the two other survivors. 
On the other hand, Titanic's cook Charles Gugin rode the stern rail into the water but apparently didn't even get his hair wet. Is there any known reason, or at least a decent hypothesis, as to why one ship creates suction as she sinks but the other doesn't? Also, you missed my question last month about the fictional Amagi refit. If you're referring to the 10-inch armed Amagi um, question about the Destroyman series, I'm 99.99999% sure I've answered that in a recent dry dock. If I haven't, I apologise, but I'm pretty sure I have. Um, anyway, going on to this question... Now, of course, you will get some people come along, oh, no, suction doesn't exist. Mythbusters proved it by sinking a yacht with a displacement of about four wafers. <sighs> anyway, that aside, um, two things when it comes to suction, and I've mentioned this before when, when discussing it and whether a ship that sinks creates it. Yes, I'm absolutely convinced that it does exist, and there's two main reasons for that. One... There's an awful lot of people who've been in circumstances where ships have been sinking and have been sucked down. Um, and do uh, you think they remember something like that? So there's a fair amount of empirical evidence that this does happen. Although, as you say, with something like Titanic, maybe not, not it didn't happen quite as badly, if at all. Second, physics. Physics does not care for the opinion of people who have watched a TV show and made a conclusion based on that. Physics is physics, and physics will come out and kill you if you're not careful. Now, as I've mentioned in previous dry docks, the thing is, okay, a ship weighs a lot. For in Hood and Titanic's case, actually well over 40,000 tonnes displacement. When that sinks, it is forcing an amount of water out of the way as it goes down. It is also obviously, now, when at least once it's left the surface, you know, as it goes down, there is a void where that object was, and water comes in to fill that object, that fill that space. Um, that, as the ship continues to go down, obviously this void that it is creating is above it and is going down, and therefore the water that is now sitting immediately above it is falling with the ship, and that's creating a void above, which is going to drag more water in, and so on and so on and so forth. Now, obviously, the further the ship goes down, the wider the volume of water above it it has to draw in, and so the less and less the suction effect on the surface is. But in close proximity to the ship, there is still a strong downwards current, i.e. suction, that is going down with the ship. How strong that is depends on how quickly the ship is falling. And I think this is probably the difference between Hood and Titanic, because Titanic was buoyant and very gradually became not buoyant and then slipped under the water, although it was obviously accelerating a little bit towards the end. So that means that its initial velocity, once it left the surface and went underwater, would have been less than the velocity of something like Hood, which is, you know, accelerating downwards a fair bit quicker, because, you know, it's been blown in half, its buoyancy is um, very negative at this point, and therefore, you know, with the with Hood's wreck going down faster, that's going to generate more current, you know, coming in above it, which is going to create more suction. Also, because... Um, because of the way that Hood actually sank as well, I think, the the attitude of Hood. I mean, both ships actually pretty much broken in half, but there's more of Hood going down linearly, if you looked at it from above, I think, based on the survivors' accounts, as opposed to Titanic, which by all accounts was almost, at least by the time the stern went underwater, almost vertical. So there's less area, um, and therefore less volume for the water to have to occupy per second when you're talking about Titanic. And the thing is, admit, now admittedly, obviously this is a small-scale experiment, and small-scale experiments don't necessarily manage to correlate exclusively well to large-scale, as was shown by the Mythbusters, you know, sinking a lightweight yacht and not getting all that much suction at all. Um, but you can actually show basically the effect that I'm talking about in a sink or a bath 
or a particularly tall glass if you happen to want to do it that way. So there's two ways of doing it. One, get a little tub, Tupperware box, you know, used cream cheese tub or something, I don't know. Put it in a sink of water and force it down. Now, as you force it down and down and down, because obviously it's going to be buoyant, um, obviously with the lid off, once the lid is overwhelmed by the water, once you've forced it underwater, you'll see all this water rushing in down um, to occupy the volume that was previously inaccessible to it. That's kind of illustrating the point on a small scale in a slightly more dramatic fashion, but it you know it shows the point of if there is something occupying space in a body of water and then that thing now goes below the water has to rush in to occupy that space as i say it's a little bit scaled up um because you know you've got this um pre-existing big void that you formed as opposed to a gradually falling void but if you want to do it via experimental methods in a slightly different way um if you have some kind of colored liquid that can show off the currents that are occurring in it pretty well i mean if you're really strapped for something then something like i don't know black current juice at a high concentration will do um, or you don't want it too concentrated otherwise you can't see but diluted enough that you can see through it with a decent light source um, but still viscous enough that you can see you know current swirls and everything and then if you with that if you get something relatively heavy um, i'd suggest a block of lead but that's a good way to make I mean, that dangerous to drink. I don't know. Well, you might not want to drink it afterwards anyway. But something heavy, uh, a stone or something like that, and just pop it in um, with, a, I say, with a strong light behind. Pop it in. Watch it drop, and watch the currents and vortices that form behind it. Again, small scale, but you'll see the currents and vortices that are formed, i.e., the suction that is formed by this little stone dropping in. Now, of course, if the stone only weighs a few ounces or a few tens of grams the force of the suction is only going to be a few ounces or a few tens of grams of water so the actual effect on anything on the surface is pretty minimal um but scale it up to you know, forty thousand tons of water that's a substantially greater amount of force uh, being exerted so yeah based on my engineering qualifications my understanding of physics and you know the accounts of survivors who were there um i'm a pretty sure suction exists at least in certain circumstances and b hopefully i've also given you an understanding of why i may not have occurred quite as much with titanic as with hood choo choo asks for the nelson class why was beta at the super firing one could c have been raised and allow b to fire over a at high elevation which would give you nine guns forward at uh, above a certain range uh, potentially by moving b close enough that when they're facing forward its guns were elevated and over the top of a to minimize blast so uh, in theory yes you could make c turret super firing it'd be pretty easy actually just put a tall barbette on the problem though is weight and stability the weight of the extra armor you'd need to raise the barbette that high or any height would put the ship over the 35,000 ton limit so you'd have to make some savings elsewhere which they don't really want to do and secondly irrespective of that the all that extra weight up top and the turret itself being elevated quite a bit higher is going to cause some fairly interesting stability issues for the ship um, so whilst yes there was a two triple stack super firing design for dreadnought early on and of course you have things like the Didos and the Atlantas showing that with lighter turrets triple stacks can work and then you have the K25 series where they were looking at quadruple stacks um, when it comes to battleships with triple 16 inch gun turrets uh, a triple stack of super firing turrets probably not the world's best idea but when it comes to why B turrets specifically um, there's a few reasons but one of the ones I recently found out about looking through some documents uh, about Rodney and Nelson was that they actually looked at should we have a and b flat and c super firing or should we have a and c flat and b super firing which is the design they went with eventually and one of the reasons why they went for b super firing instead of c was that with b super firing it has the best possible firing arcs it's the best balance between 
weight stability and firing arc. So you could theoretically get even better firing arcs with A, um, but then you're robbing yourself of six guns directly forward. Whereas with B, you get your six guns forward, and because B is so much f uh, further away from the superstructure than C, B can actually fire significantly at significantly better angles backwards than C could, um, even if you elevated C. So that's effectively why you have this sort of down-up-down arrangement. Burnt Potato asks, SS Great Eastern, if we took the same design but used more modern steel, say circa 1910 to 1930, how would she compare to vessels of that period? How was her design so robust? Well, here's one of my favourite illustrations of Great Eastern because it just shows how colossal she is. And yes, that is in fact an Age of Sail frigate without the masts next to it. It was just a little big. Anyway, um, if she'd been built out of modern steel in the 1910s and 1920s or so, I mean, she'd still be up there as one of the larger ships around. She wouldn't be the largest ship around. Um, other cruise liners and ocean liners had exceeded that. But she'd still be of a fairly respectable size. Um, the interesting thing, though, compared to other ships is that of course if you're building her in the 1910s and 9, 1920s the efficiency of machinery has gone up massively so you're not going to need the panels um you probably want more than one screw in the back though and so your overall machinery you could either use the same space to make the ship go a lot faster or you could use a lot less space if you wanted the ship to just go at the speed that it was originally designed to go at and of course you also wouldn't need the masts and so you're not going to need as many funnels so without the funnels without the masts, without the paddle wheels it's a very very different ship and of course compared to other ocean liners of the time she also lacks superstructure although you could with all the weight you're saving especially from the top weight from the masts etc you could probably build in a superstructure to increase your accommodation levels with that said, she would basically, at that point, be kind of a, a second-tier ocean liner. So a, a fairly big, fairly fancy one to go on, but not she's, she's not the Normandy, for example, or the SS United States. So the equivalent these days would be, you know, something like the, the Queen, Queen Mary II. So that's your top-end one, and then if you're just like on a, an ocean literally the ocean line um or whatever so one of the regular cruise liners that would be kind of where she'd be sitting um why was her design so robust well two part things partly the material limitations meant that engineers had to be a bit more sensible about uh, safety factors and also she was built by brunel virtually nothing brunel ever built was anything but hilariously over engineered there's so much stuff between him and uh, Basil Getty, there's so much stuff in the UK that still runs on their genius because they built their things so massively resilient that we're really over overloading and overusing a lot of the stuff that they made. And now, 150, 160 years down the line, it's only just starting to break down. Um, which, yeah, I wish we had people like that these days. Anyway, um, yeah. She had massive safety factors built into her because of the material she was made out of. The fact they couldn't necessarily rely entirely on the quality of the iron. The iron itself was obviously a lot less strong than steel. And Brunel definitely didn't want his flagship to sink. So it's just overbuilt. And th this would be a thing. If you were building her to spec with modern more modern steels in the 1910s and 1920s people would be complaining about the cost of construction saying we could you know we could build this ship for half the steel or less but you know if you build great eastern to her design spec with the design thicknesses of material etc the double underwater hull etc with modern steels well, the thing's going to be a flipping tank i mean she's going to be the single most durable ship outside of an actual warship on the high seas in the interwar period and it's basically just a series of safety factors so for those of you who don't know um a safety factor is a thing that's used in engineering and it, it means that you're designing against something 
but multiplied up. So let's say you're very simply designing a beam in a roof to hold up, you know, the tiles and everything else. So if you calculate your load of the weight, let's say, let's say the roof for sake of argument weighs two tons, and you calculate there may be possibly up to two tons of wind loading. Again, we're just pulling arbitrary figures here. It is going to be very different if you're actually doing the calculations for real. But let's say there's two tons of wind loading, and you know that your environment's a little bit north, so maybe you're going to encounter snow. So um, let's say you calculate that there's going to be a ton of possible snow loading, or rain loading even if it gets really bad. So you've calculated just for those factors. I mean, there's other things you might calculate for, but just for those simple factors, a total possible maximum load of the roof, plus it being covered in snow, plus there being a massive blizzard, so lots of high winds, of five tons. So in theory, if you build your beam to support five tons of weight, I mean, at that point, probably supporting the entire roof on one beam, which is a bit silly anyway, but let's go, just go with it for a second. Um, then your beam will just about support the weight. So it should not break. But if there's anything even slightly wrong with it, or if things slightly go over, or you know deterioration materials over time, it will eventually fail. Um, and in the lifespan of a house, you, that's probably not a good thing. So you design a safety factor, and then what safety factor do you consider? And this is where a lot of costs and calculations and estimates go into an awful lot of engineering projects, because if you design it with a safety factor of two, so you say, right, well, I'm going to make a beam that can support 10 tonnes, then obviously a beam capable of supporting 10 tonnes is a lot more expensive than one that can support 5 tonnes, but you've got a decent safety margin in there. You know, you'd need to double all the loads you've calculated before that beam was at risk of failure. But then you have to count, think of, you know, what could be unexpected point loads, what could be um, material deterioration factors that we might need to take into account, etc. So you might up the safety factor to 3 or 4 or 5. And, you know, what safety factor you select to be honest, most engineers will probably prefer a safety factor of at least 5 if not higher, because that makes their things really robust, really long-lasting. So in this case, you'd be designing it for a beam of cables pulling 25 tons. Very unlikely to ever fail, but a 25... Uh, beams capable of supporting 25 tons is going to be, as I said, heavy and expensive, and the homeowner might not want that, so they might force you down into a, a less durable beam. And this is the eternal argument between engineers and pretty much everybody else because let's face it most engineers including myself if you gave us the option of building things you'd end up with a lot of stuff that resembles the atlantic wall and we'd just be saying yep yeah, that's not going to break until the sun dies and possibly not even then <laughs> um, but no one else like living in our lovely concrete and steel bunkers everyone wants you know aesthetics and costs and you know completed this side of the next glaciation period uh, some people are so unreasonable. Slashia Zhang asks, Boarding action during the Age of Sail. In various movies and games, both warships stop during a boarding action. How do people launch their grappling hooks and ropes to get the enemy ship to their side? Do both sides have to stop voluntarily or not? And are cannon, including the small guns, which seem to have no effect except during a boarding action, used during boarding action? Would it not be terribly dangerous to try and load the guns during boarding action, especially on the upper deck? So... Launching grappling hooks and things, it, it was done to a degree, but not as much as you might think based on seeing movies and games. Um, also, coming up directly alongside one another was also not always done. I mean, it does happen occasionally, but ideally you wanted to control the points of access. So um, a lot of the time, if you're intending to board, you'd actually end up sort of ramming the other ship because the ideal scenario was for you to position your ship where you could control, I say, the access to and from your own ship. And, OK, you had to accept that that was going to also involve um, a limited amount of access to the enemy ship. But if you could get your bow and bowsprit tangled up with their masts and yards, not only would you be bound together far more effectively than any man portable grappling hook and rope would be uh, but you also had sort of a pre-made scramble net and if you like balance beam to get up onto the enemy ship or down onto the enemy ship depending on whose ship is larger um in terms of both sides having to stop it's not required um it usually did happen because once a boarding action began um i mean 
if there's some wind in the sails it'll probably drag the ships along but usually once they're bound together people trying to manage the sails tend to stop doing their jobs and focus more on survival which means ships will either just kind of drift along or, or coast to a something approaching a halt maybe even a walking speed level of, of drifting so that and then obviously the boarding action actually commences you can run a boarding action when both ships are still running alongside each other at a certain rate of knots because it's about relative speed rather than absolute speed you could in theory run a boarding action at 10 knots um, with both ships under a fair degree of sail as long as your relative speed to each other is pretty much zero um, the other thing is of course with the tumble home that you have on a lot of age of sail wooden sh warships coming directly up against each other to board may not necessarily be the best idea because if your ship's hulls are touching at their broadest points there may actually be a considerable gap between your two ships which is why you would then have to swing across with ropes and stuff although that does make you somewhat vulnerable um, cannon would be used in the boarding action to a degree but usually you can see a boarding action coming so you would try and get your guns loaded before then and you'd either try and clear the enemy's decks if the enemy's massing for boarding you try and clear their decks with grape shot um or you'd wait until um you were ready your boarding party was ready to go and then you try and clear as much of the enemy off right before your boarding party goes again with something like canister or grape shot as for the danger in reloading the guns it depends at what stage the boarding action is i mean if the enemy's boarding you then yeah you're going to not really be worrying about the gun so much as worrying about fighting for your life um if the boarding action hasn't started yet or if your crew are boarding the enemy ship you probably very much would try and reload because the enemy's attention is going to be diverted by the fact they're being boarded so they may not be particularly enthused about you know shooting someone who may in 30 seconds be a danger to their life when you know there's someone with a stabby sword or a cutty axe right next to them who's going to be a danger to their life in the next two seconds and if I've done this right, there should be a link showing up somewhere on the video, uh, which will take you to a video from Fight Camp uh, earlier this year, where a bunch of us actually practiced some of uh, naval boarding actions use, with some limitations put in to show the kind of thing that would happen in an actual naval act boarding action, i.e. it's not just a free-for-all melee line, there's only restricted points of access. And if you're careful, you can spot me in the shiny plate, because of course I decided to fight a naval boarding action wearing a Lamela plate armour. Because, yes. Iva Barken asks, As a fellow civil engineer from the States who still works on in the old US survey foot instead of the modern international foot or meter, what was the Royal Navy's transition from Imperial to metric units like? The short answer is nobody knows because they still haven't quite managed it. Much the same as the rest of the country, actually. Um, Britain is a very confusing but lovely, lovably mad country when it comes to uh, the mixture of Imperial and metric that we use. And pretty much everybody has their own version of what mixture they use there are some people who are absolutely you know will only ever work in imperial other people who will only ever work in metric and the vast majority of us work in both so for example taking me and very well to say everyone is different so i'm just one example i'm sure there's plenty of others with different experiences but i buy my petrol or diesel actually these days in liters but I measure my fuel efficiency in miles per gallon. Um, I measure my height in feet and inches, uh, but I measure my weight in kilograms. If I'm measuring weight in the kitchen, um, usually I will use grams, but I'm in actually equally happy to use pounds and ounces. And indeed, I find some recipes, especially a lot of baking recipes, work better in pounds and ounces than they do in grams. Um, when you're oh, pipes flipping out pipes if you're trying to do housework good luck because it, in places like uh, wix or b q which are hardware stores in the uk you can buy pipe work in quarter inch half inch three quarter inch 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 and a half or in you know 32 20 40 millimeter some of which are close enough as makes no difference others are not and you can also buy a bunch of converters to go between uh, metric and imperial still uh, the car speeds and the car speed limits are all still done in miles. 
And weirdly enough, when I shoot bows, when I'm doing archery, I measure the range in yards. If I'm using airsoft rifles, I measure the range in meters. I'm still not entirely sure why I'm doing that, but I am for some reason. Ah, the TV. The TV's diameter is measured in inches, but the door's diameter and height is measured in centimeters. I am basically familiar with the Celsius form of measurement. I really have never really used Fahrenheit, which is a bit odd. Oh, and of course, thanks to the wonderful eccentricities of Britain, if you go down to the pub, you will buy your drinks in pints. But if you go down to the supermarket, all your milk will be in litres. Although there will also be a pint conversion on the milk because everybody got very confused and annoyed. Um, it's the same thing with um, pounds versus kilos in the supermarket. These days, most things are displayed in grams, but a lot of stuff will have a quiet um, pounds and ounces value somewhere on it as well. And in my day-to-day -day life, if I'm measuring a very, very short distance, I'll quite happily measure it in millimetres or centimetres. But the minute it gets much beyond a handful of centimetres, I'm all over uh, feet and inches. <laughs> and then whether it's metres or yards at distance kind of depends on context. So given how utterly confusing my way of, you know, dealing with weights and measures is, you can imagine that for, a, for the Royal Navy, steeped in tradition, and bearing in mind the Royal Navy is recruiting from a bunch of people like me, who are all over the place with our weights and measures, um, I can pretty much assure you the Royal Navy has not gone fully over to metric. I mean, we still use four and a half inch and five inch guns, so that should give you some clues to, to that kind of thing. Dr. D. M. Platt asks, What motors or similar devices are on tugboats to enable towing? And do warships used for towing their sisters have the same types of equipment? It depends greatly on what era you're talking about. Modern tugboats will have all sorts of fancy equipment that regular warships won't have with relation to towing because that technology exists nowadays. Whereas, say, a paddle tug in the 1850s, its main advantage over anything else is going to be the fact that it has paddles. <laughs> And obviously, in the intervening period, which the channel covers up to 1950, you do get a gradual evolution of technology. The most likely bit of equipment you're going to see aboard tugs once it becomes available in the period that we cover, that a quote-unquote normal warship probably wouldn't have, would be high-powered winches and motors to reel in the tow lines. And that's because, well, as you imagine, a tug has to do this quite often, whereas a warship generally doesn't. And also a warship has a large number of crew, which, you know, <laughs> human resources, quite literally, if some, if you need you know, 20, 30 men to haul in a line that's gone slack or popped off or missed its um, lo a locking point or something, you can do that. On a tug, you probably don't have 20 to 30 men in the crew. And the last thing that they need to be doing is all standing on the stern of the ship, leaving it completely out of control whilst they try and haul in at the 24th line of the day. So that's a great labour saving device. But broadly speaking, the, the main thing that tugs have over other ships is an extremely high uh, power to weight ratio. Uh, oh, the other thing that you're going to need I mean, you need this pretty much any ship, but especially on tugs, is not just an incredibly strong hull, but incredibly strong mounting points for the ropes. Because, you know, if you have, let's say, a 35,000 ton battleship, and you're trying to tow that with a tug, well, let's say for, I don't know, the battleship's lost power. So you're trying to get it moving. If you are putting enough force into the water via your tug and its engines to move 35,000 tons of steel, and that's all going through a rope, or possibly multiple ropes, uh, maybe going through multiple tugs, but let's assume you're just doing one tug trying to get the shit thing moving in the first place. Well, at some point that rope is going to go taut, or line, or cable, or chain, or whatever you're using. At which point all of that force is going through that rope, which is fine, except that rope is secured to the ship and it's secured to you. And it's well and good if you're putting that much force through it, but if the mounting point that the rope is attached to is not attached to your ship in such a way that it can withstand that force, all you're going to do is rip the mounting point clean out of your ship, or the tug, or both, and then you're back to square one. In fact, you're worse than square one because now you don't have somewhere to attach your rope to. A bit inconvenient, 
So that is extremely key for a tug. And later on, as tugs evolve, you also see shock resistant mountings and mountings that have some kind of absorption uh, built into them as well on occasion partly to spread out that initial shock loading now of course you're not going to take a tug and go running uh, full speed ahead um, straight away you would to avoid things like that happening you would take up the slack slowly and then once you have the rope at tension you build up the power and this is perhaps an underappreciated part of a tug's equipment and abilities is the fact that tugs have to be very controllable at low speeds you have to be able to put obviously a huge amount of power through them but you have to put that power through in such a way that you can regulate almost to the tenth of a knot exactly how fast your tug is going both so that you can obviously take up the slack gradually and so that you can let it down gradually and basically not punching holes and breaking lines and so forth depending on whether you're pushing or pulling which is you know fairly important now the problem is obviously for warships which spend most of their time either at cruising or full speed apart from the fact that warships also have a great deal more momentum and inertia than a tug ever will um, their power plants are really not designed for low speed maneuvering such that some warships uh, certainly in the period that we're looking at can even lose all steering at speeds below about four or five knots and this does pose something of a hazard when you have warships trying to take other warships in tow for example that sea due to battle damage um, you see this quite a bit when you know this is attempted and quite often you'll hear about the first two three four attempts that lines are parting and that's in part because you know the ship's probably the speed differential when the line's gone tense is was probably a bit too much amongst the reasons it could also just be the line is too weak but that's less likely most of the time um, and because warships have this much worse fine control at low speeds it means that if a warship is trying to take another in tow you might just about get away with it and indeed a lot of the time they did um, but you do run the risk of as i said you know make revolutions for five knots well you might be going at five knots you might be going at four knots you might be going at six knots and with the sheer amount of force involved that could make all the difference so a, a lot of how a tug is more effective than a warship has to do with the fact that it can control its speed and agility at the lower speeds much more carefully and obviously it needs a very skilled crew to exploit that Hammond Pickle asks, in past dry docks you stated that the Royal Navy tried to develop a dual purpose 5 inch gun akin to the US 5 inch 38, but that effort failed. What went wrong? Basically they couldn't quite get the balance right to suit them, uh, because as I mentioned before the US had the 5 inch 25 caliber AA gun and a much longer, longer than 50 caliber anti-surface gun and they compromised at 5 inch 38 which gave pretty good performance in both but it is fair to say that the 5 inch 38 was a somewhat better anti-aircraft gun than it was an anti-surface gun it wasn't bad as an anti-surface gun but it was outstanding as an anti-aircraft weapon whereas it was kind of a maybe middle of the road as an anti-surface weapon because of its shorter barrel and the US was prepared to accept this um, in its dual purpose weapons because they had an outlook that was looking perhaps a little bit more towards the anti-aircraft role. Now with the Royal Navy when you look at their various efforts with 4.5 inch guns various marks of 4.7 inch guns the 5 inch experimental gun the 5.25 inch um, and so on and the 5.5 they put on hood which wasn't a dual purpose but was still in somewhere in that region the problem the royal navy had was that they wanted a gun that was very good in an, in the anti-surface role whilst also being good in the aa role so if you think a bit on a, on a rough scale of sort of out of 10 the us navy with the 5 inch 38 would say accept something along the lines of a 6 out of 10 for anti-surface as long as they got an 8 or 9 or 10 out of 10 for the anti-air whereas the Royal Navy wanted at least a 7 or an 8 out of 10 in the anti-surface department 
and at least a sort of a, at least a six or seven out of ten in the AA role. And this fundamentally presented a lot of problems because to get a good anti-surface weapon, um, you needed to have a long barrel, and a long barrel meant a heavier gun, um, a gun that was going to fire with a lot more muzzle energy um, for a given amount of charge. And therefore, it's going to have a longer recoil. It's going to have to need heavier mountings. It's going to have to have a deeper gun pit. It's going to need heavier motors to move it around, etc., etc. So all of this is kind of spiraling up the the size and weight of the mountings, and it's got to be loaded pretty quickly, which um, obviously is all being done by hand. And the fundamental issue was that you could get that out of an AA gun in the smaller calibers, four, four and a half inch, say. But then with the anti-surface role in mind, they were very worried that if this was going to be the primary armament of their destroyers and the secondary armament of battleships and maybe cruisers as well, that it may not have the stopping power against big destroyers like the German equivalents to the French super destroyers. And obviously the Japanese had things like the Kageras as well, and the Fubukis. So the Royal Navy kind of preferred this heavier caliber shell, the, sorry, heavier weight shell, which meant a larger caliber gun, which meant that thanks to the square cube law, the weight of the shell went up quite significantly, which then meant that the shell couldn't really be a single piece shell, um, i.e. the projectile and the cartridge all together, because that would then be too heavy to be able to be quickly loaded and moved around by a single person. And if you made it two-piece ammunition, then you made the loading time a lot harder and a lot longer, um, which slowed the rate of fire, which obviously is counterproductive in both the anti-surface and anti-air roles. And so they were faced with this quandary that they couldn't seem to break. And thus, in particular, for their attempt on the five-inch gun, uh, they had, a again, a longer than 50 caliber weapon. And the weight of the combined projectile and charge was just too heavy. They couldn't make it work, period. Um, whereas the US basically, as I said, accepted that maybe, maybe we're not going to have the longest range of uh, destroyer-grade guns, but we can fire an awful lot of those shells pretty darn quickly, and destroyer action should probably be fought at melee range anyway, so who cares, really? In the end, as you can see here, the Royal Navy went with a 5.25 in an effort to get the absolute heaviest shell they could reasonably get people to manhandle, whilst also theoretically having an anti-aircraft role, which, as again, as I mentioned before, it kind of worked out relatively well right at the end of World War II, once uh, refinements to the turrets had been made and radar direction had been developed, etc., but didn't really work out for most of World War II as well as the 5-inch 38 did. To give you some idea of the difference, a full charge 5-inch um, 38 round is about 38 kilos, so not light, but with the feed ammo feed system you can probably just about manage it, whereas the 5-inch 50 that the British were looking at had a full charge weight, uh, full charge projectile weight of about just under 50 kilos so you're talking about another 12 kilos on top of that and you know as i say <laughs> these days your modern safe handling limits are 20 kilos but the five inch 38 combined round round projectile and charge is just under double that whereas the five inch 50 round was two and a half times that sms schleswig holstein asks why did the U.S. Marines become closer to the phrase the U.S. Navy's Army rather than other Marine forces such as the British Royal Marines, which are closer to special forces? I suspect, now bear in mind this is my suspicion because I don't know 100%, but I think a secondary issue is just the sheer size of population. I mean, okay, fair enough, the U.S. population compared to the British population or the population of the British Empire in the 19th century depending on which year you're looking at, there were more people either in Britain or later in the British Empire, but in the 20th century, the US definitely had the manpower advantage. Now, when you look at nations that have that 
massive manpower advantage, um, then you tend to see their marine units also doubling up as kind of a sea-based army um, quite a bit as well. I mean, you look at Russia, for example, the Russian naval infantry were definitely a thing, still are, to that matter. Uh, and they're a lot more like the US Marine Corps than they are the Royal Marines. Um, although they still obviously have a reputation for being something of an elite. So that's a secondary one. My personal suspicion, based on what I've read, is that it initially happened more as a matter of coincidence rather than any particular intended role. Now, the reason I say that is that, one, the US Marine Corps obviously is much younger than the Royal Marines or the Dutch Marines or a number of other Marine Corps, so the, they don't have the same original founding role because they're two, three hundred years later. Um, so maritime security and back in the good old days of straight up boarding actions being very common, you know, that's not something that was particularly around as much once the US Navy became a, a serious fighting force. Obviously, boarding actions were still happening in the War of Independence and the War of 1812, but there weren't that many US Navy ships around at that time, to be perfectly honest. But when you look at when the US Navy was exerting itself in a significant way, because of the isolationist tendencies of the United States in the 18th and 19th and early part of the 20th centuries, the US Army was generally very small, if it could be thought of as existing at all at points, um, in any serious way. And the US was very, very, very loath to actually exert that army strength, such as it might have been, elsewhere. You know, the US Army really only came into any kind of significant size prior to probably at least World War One, if not World War Two, at times of conflict, much as the US Navy was, to be perfectly honest, a lot of the time. But what it meant was that when it came to seaborne expeditions, if you look at a Royal Navy seaborne expedition at the tail end of the Napoleonic Wars, if they need to just quickly land and do something then sure they'll use their contingent of marines and some of their sailors but if it's any kind of serious action ashore they might put together a naval brigade if they have to but the royal navy can call on the british army and if you know if you need three four five ten thousand men to go and uh, you know knock somebody's head in you can just put ashore a bunch of regulars i think maybe with a few marines and sailors and support probably with a few dismounted guns or something but there wasn't a particular call on the Marines to undertake major army-like actions, because they had an army. The US didn't. So when you look at something like the expedition into the Mediterranean against the Barbary pirates, obviously a famous Shores of Tripoli song, well, when the US Navy shows up and they find themselves having to exert some power ashore, they don't have US Army contingents aboard, and the US isn't going to send any, so they have to use the Marines. So the US Marines get used in an Army-type role. And you see this time and again through the 19th and early 20th centuries, all the way up to things like the Veracruz incident, even though that's practically off the US's doorstep, a large amount, if not the entirety, depending on the incident, of troops if you like that are put ashore tend to be the u.s marines because they're part of the navy the navy has them and that's really all they're really gonna get at any re real major point uh, the spanish american war is a little bit different but even then there's a very heavy marine contingent present in most of the um land actions and so i think it just developed that way um it the u.s marines became the kind of the land-based overseas tool of u.s foreign policy purely because the army was mostly a stay-at-home business for the majority of the developmental period of the U.S. Navy and the U.S. in general. Once you get to, um, you know, World War One, and then obviously more importantly World War Two, then the U.S. Army grows quite significantly in size, and there's a lot of Army troops around, but with that kind of mass recruitment drive, it also obviously ties in, as I said, to the fact that the US has a lot of manpower. Yes, the Army numbers went up, but so did the US Navy numbers, so did the US Marine Corps numbers, at which point 
if you've got a large contingent of US Marines who are, you've got this sort of embedded tradition and training regimen of amphibious warfare being used aboard ships, being landed, etc., etc. Well, why not use that? Um, and obviously, hopefully, get the army up to speed with amphibious warfare as well. And this is my suspicion. It's kind of the isolationist nature of the US in the first 100, 150 years of its existence kind of forced the Marines to be more army like, as opposed to the shipboard security and occasional special force type role that other Marine Corps tended to have. Randy Dandio asks, what's with the inclusion of underwater torpedo tubes on battleships designed or constructed immediately after World War I? My reading on engagements in the war and the limits on torpedo tubes seem very out of place. Is there a common naval lesson of the war I'm missing that justified the inclusion in designs? This has to do mostly with what people expected torpedoes to be able to do in the future as compared to the ranges they thought they were going to be for fighting at, and also how they thought the engagements were going to be finishing. Because various navies, obviously the US in particular, did appreciate that battles would be fought at longer range. The US thought battles would be fought at much longer ranges than either the Japanese or the Royal Navy thought they would be, but near as much as makes no difference. And yes, torpedo capability in World War I didn't extend even half of that range, but... Torpedo technology was advancing by the end of World War One and into the 1920s, and it could be anticipated it could advance further still. And so the expected torpedo range could be seen as maybe closing that gap a bit. And as I said, the British and the Japanese thought that battle range was still a little bit closer than the US did. So particularly for them, the idea of having torpedo tubes still aboard made a bit more sense because the both realised and theoretical closing of the range gap by the torpedoes was left a much smaller gap for them than it did for the US. So there's that and that's why you see for example with Nelson and Rodney when they're launched they have these massive for the time period 24 and a half inch semi in well enriched oxygen fueled torpedoes specifically designed to go a fair distance with a fair bit of hitting power. So you know, that they are taking the range issues into account here. But the other thing is that whilst they might expect battle range to be a certain amount, whatever it happens to be, depending on the Navy, nobody really believes that that's where it's going to stay. Because looking at World War One, yes, ranges opened a lot lot further out than people thought they were going to and yes hits were achieved a lot further out than people thought they were going to but bearing in mind obviously that um we're talking about the 1920s so radar isn't even on any anyone's horizon really one when you're fighting in the conditions like the north sea you might end up physically only spotting your opponent when they're much 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 closer as did happen several times at jutland um at which point you would be well inside a decently ranged torpedoes range. And two, whilst you might cripple or slow down your opponent, for the most part, at long range, your accuracy was obviously going to be less. And so if you wanted to finish your opponent, especially in a large fleet battle, the ranges would tend to drop. You see this in the run to the south, the run to the north, pretty much all the time. Ranges open at long distance, but both sides either both sides try and close the range or the side that thinks it's winning tries to close the range whilst the side that thinks it's losing tries desperately to open the range. And so once the ranges of the battle start to close, then having torpedoes makes a bit more sense, both in terms of dealing that little bit of extra underwater punch damage to an enemy ship or at least making it evade, which will throw off its fire control director systems. Or if you've battered the enemy ship into submission then again you know ships sink better when you let water in the bottom than when you let air into the top so they're also seen to a certain degree as coup de grace weapons you know if you've expended half your ammunition load battering the enemy fleet into submission you don't really want to be sitting there continually firing salvo after salvo after salvo after salvo just to get the enemy ships to go under 
Um, especially because obviously everyone understands the risk of submarines are ironically enough armed with torpedoes so you don't want to just hang around in the area at low speed in case the enemy subs or destroyers come back to redress the balance of losses so it's much easier to just go okay well you know this ship is a burning wreck we'll put two or three torpedoes into its side over it goes job done and we're off um, which seemed like a fairly good idea <laughs> at the time um, and you might ask well why wouldn't you just use cruisers or destroyers to do that well yeah, in that event, where the enemy fleet is burning and at your mercy, yes, you could. But as I said, in battle, as the range closes, again, one of the things that World War One had shown is that sitting in between two battle lines was not a very survivable place for destroyers or cruisers to be for any significant length of time, whereas the battleships kind of would just be there. So having them able to launch torpedoes, even if a relatively limited number, was significantly better than you know, sending a destroyer with eight or ten torpedoes in only to watch it get blown out of the water in five seconds flat. John asks, In the age of sail, it sounds like operational security was a bit lax by today's standards. Also, the ships were made of wood. It would therefore seem that a few guys, maybe a rowboat, and a bunch of yield Molotov cocktails should be able to make a mess of a fleet in harbour. However, while I have heard a lot of intelligence gathering spy stories from the Age of Sail, I have not heard much about, shall we say, ungentlemanly warfare from the time. How come? Two primary reasons. One, it was actually very difficult under normal circumstances to get right up next to an enemy warship during um, their time in harbour. Yes, you could get very close. So you could spy on ships. You could get their strength etc but actually physically getting close enough to lob a early equivalent of a molotov cocktail at somebody um that was somewhat harder big apart from anything you know if you screwed that up if you're say going after a ship of the line you could have anything up to 50 or more very angry guns loaded with grape shot pointing at you and if you're in a small open rowboat you aren't going to be on this planet very long um so yeah that that that's sort of the first problem you've got the second problem is that actually believe it or not whilst they're made of wooden canvas ships are not that flammable um for one thing they've spent a lot of time in the water so there's a certain amount of water soaking going on um and for second massive timbers uh, in the you know, properly used sense are actually very difficult to set fire to. Um, you can set fire to kindling and twigs that are well dried out very easily. Um, but if you try and set fire to, you know, three foot thick oak beam, it's going to go, hmm, that's nice. A little bit of charring. How many hours have you got before you actually get me to set on fire? Um, plus, of course, things like what we'd understand as a Molotov cocktail these days um, with highly flammable thin liquids, somewhat harder to get hold of in the early 18th century plus you'd have to persuade somebody uh, a captain of a ship to let you transport a large amount of incredibly flammable liquids aboard his ship to get to the enemy harbor which was always going to be something of a big ask now obviously you did have things like naphtha and pitch and stuff like that but um not quite the same as a modern petrol-based molotov now that's uh, so yeah setting and let's say setting a ship on fire you you'd struggle a bit um it's not to say it didn't happen obviously fire ships existed for a reason but a fire ship is a lot larger a lot hotter and a lot more persistent than a molotov and even then you know uh, a ship could if it was being attacked by a fire ship you could gr and i guess anti-grapple it away with things like boarding pikes if you were careful and even when you were firing broadsides at each other literally hull to hull as happened at places like trafalgar whilst eventually those muzzle blasts might be setting the side of the enemy ship on fire it did take a little while for that to happen and you could still put those out relatively easily so realistically speaking unless you've got something major like a fire ship by something that's too hazardous really a bit too hazardous for anyone to approach with anything other than a 20-foot boarding pike <laughs> um then you are going to have problems um, actually keeping a ship on fire setting it on fire fine but keeping it on fire is another another issue 
But returning to the original point of, you know, it's difficult to get close, the other thing you've got to remember is the sheer value of these ships. So whilst occasionally, yes, this did happen, where people would sneak in and set fire to enemy ships, and, you know, it's not unknown for this to occur, but this was usually called what's called a cutting out operation. And the logic that most people tended to follow was, well, if you can get a significant number of men close enough to an enemy ship in harbour or at anchor with your men in rowboats, well then, why not just take the enemy ship and add it to your collection? Because remember, if you set fire to an enemy ship, let's say, let's say your fleet numbers are equal, so you have 30 ships each. You set fire to one of the enemy ships, okay, it's now 30 versus 29 okay but if you take the enemy ship not only do you get a bunch of prize money which is obviously good but now you have 31 ships and the enemy has 29 so you'd have a two ship advantage so it's a lot more attractive to do that and that did happen again probably more attempts than there were successes but cutting out operations to try and seize or run aground an enemy ship which was a very definite way usually of making sure it it went um to the breakers if you couldn't have it yourself those were the more common results of you know getting close enough to an enemy warship to do something to it as opposed to um just trying to destroy it outright tog father asks what, if any, equipment and procedures were there for rebalancing ammunition between magazines on a ship in the Age of Dreadnoughts while she was at sea? For example, if a ship's been pursuing an enemy during a running fight for some time and is running low on ammunition in her forward main battery magazines, would the crew be able to move ammunition from the aft magazines to keep the forward guns in action, or would she be forced to break off for lack of ammunition? There was some capability to do this, but it depended on the type of ship you were talking about. So if you're talking about a destroyer or a light cruiser, then this could be done because the cartridges and shells or the whole thing, if it was a destroyer and had one piece ammunition, those could be simply carried by people. You know, and you could get a bunch of sailors, right? Everyone grab something, um, sling it over your shoulder whatever we're walking forwards and you could rebalance the magazines that way um for something like a heavy cruiser it was a bit more difficult but in it was something with an eight inch gun but it could be done um again you'd probably at that point you'd be using multiple people per projectile but it's possible um, once you get to battleship size guns though not really uh, apart from anything else you know, if you're in action, the last thing you will want to be doing is opening up your magazines and having a line of men <laughs> with a lot of explosives trailing all, all the way through your ship. Because, uh, yeah, if if the other guy gets a hit, that's going to end very, very badly. Um, but if you have to break off the action for whatever reason, the action comes to a conclusion and you find a significant imbalance in your magazines then when you're fairly sure you're not going to be shot at, you can do this. Um, at least for the smaller ships, as I say. When you're talking about the, the larger ships, it's not really that possible. Um, in theory, it could be done. You know, In theory, certainly the charge bags could be lugged from magazine to magazine. Um, the shells, however, are a slightly different matter because to load the shells they're moved across deck and then down the the loading um, mechanisms into the magazines uh, and obviously coming out they come up the loading mechanism for the turret and then they're inside the turret which is a slightly different location i mean if you were absolutely pushed I guess you could probably, using the same kind of carts or whatever other mechanisms people use, to, depending on the ship and the navy, to move the shells across the deck when they were loading them into the magazines in the first place. In theory, you could bring shells up the, in, the, in their cages into the aft turrets and then, I guess, try and manhandle them out of the turret and away... But that would be a very, very difficult, delicate, and very long-lasting procedure. 
which probably isn't going to have that many benefits because to be perfectly honest if you've been in an engagement in a battleship where you've shot out your entire forward battery uh, magazines yeah you want to head home to reload at that point because you know any kind of engagement that's going to happen again on that basis you don't have that much ammo left anyway and um you're probably going to run out which is not going to be a good thing to happen in action whereas on destroyers and cruisers where the rate of fire is a lot higher and you could conceivably actually shoot out your entire forward magazine load it's a much more manageable problem bfw asks how or what seems to be the deciding factor if a ship is sunk or just damaged i.e a decisive conclusion or not where the engagement cannot be avoided especially in the dreadnought era and so on the two main factors involved if you look at an aggregate of engagements appear to be one how close is the losing ship to help and two is its propulsion machinery still working um and i mean this is assuming that obviously it's not a very quick decisive action where you know shells just punch through the armor thing blows up and sinks or whatever and the reason for that is obviously one ships actually unless you happen to set off a magazine certainly by the dreadnought era and probably for a good chunk of the pre-dreadnought era ships actually fairly hard to sink if you as i've said before in this episode and in others let air in the top you have to get water in the bottom to get them to actually go down you can cripple a ship you can make it a completely non-viable fighting unit by blowing away everything above the main deck but that's not going to sink it um and as armor schemes improve this you know le letting the water in below gets harder and harder to do so assuming that you have i guess a standard engagement let's say you have a half hour engagement if the enemy is close enough that you're able to hit it now but you may not be able to hit it half an hour an hour from now because it's going to have friends show up whether they be in the sh shape of submarines other ships aircraft etc etc that is one of the big deciding factors the action may just be broken off um obviously we're talking about as you said in an engagement where the losing ship couldn't avoid being engaged in the first place um so yeah if it's got friends coming then all it really has to do is tank the damage in such a way that it's not going to be mortally wounded until it becomes too dangerous for the ship that are stacking it to hang around and then when that ship leaves obviously it can start doing damage control and then its friends can show up and hopefully help it survive and the other thing as i said is if the propulsion still works because depending on the time of the engagement and obviously depending on the era if it's world war ii and there's radar involved this doesn't apply so much but for much of the period the channel covers once you get to night the action is usually going to break off and again you know if you can keep afloat until night time then if your propulsion is still working you can get away because it's very unlikely that your opponent will stick right on top of your tail with searchlights if they even have searchlights obviously a good chunk of the period that the channel, that the channel covers they might not exist because they didn't until kind of the 1870s um and thus you you can just get away and yes you might not have been able to avoid that engagement because you were slower but come dawn if you've got 30 40 50 miles away you might be completely out of sight and even if you're not it might not be worth it for your enemy to keep going with your um with the engagement so i think yeah it's that survival of your propulsion and do you have friends nearby those one of those two usually will ensure your survival not all the time but usually whereas if you don't have those two if your engines are knocked out and you don't have any friends coming you are almost certainly going to sink because not the enemy has all the time in the world to make sure that you do um, and this is kind of you, you look at various actions so um you know, look at bismarck it couldn't get away from the engagement um its propulsion was pretty much gone um 
I know, yes, people can say, oh, yes, well, the engine rooms were still perfectly fine. One, no, they weren't. Um, you know, look at all the survivors' accounts for Bismarck. Some of the engine rooms were still unflooded. Others were not. <laughs> uh, also, you know, it had so much water aboard that it wasn't going anywhere fast anyway, even if its rudders had been working by the end of that, that particular fight. But on the other hand, um, you know, the British thought it had friends coming in terms of U-boats, which is why, apart from fuel concerns, this is the other reason why they eventually left. Um, but Bismarck not being in range of the Luftwaffe was a significant reason as to why the engagement happened in the first place. If Bismarck had managed to get under cover of Luftwaffe aircraft, it's somewhat less likely that the British would have tried to force the battle. Um, whereas if you look at something like, uh, say, Hie, for example... Um, you know, once day broke, the Japanese couldn't really afford to have many units stick by here, so it couldn't have friends coming. It had a few that were trying to help it already, but even they had to leave eventually because the Americans had their friends in the form of uh, Hendersonfield coming. Um, and Hie's propulsion system was a little bit shot up as well in places. So, you know, the, and then obviously Hie sinks. Um, and all of this, of course, is assuming you don't just take fatal damage pretty darn quickly the way that, say, something like Kirishima does. And that brings us to an end to this week's Dry Dock. Congratulations, you made it this far. I think 2022 is going to have to see me definitely getting a bit more to work on either medals, certificates, or T-shirts for those of you who have survived these Dry Docks. Um, and who knows, I might hide a... Uh, code somewhere in the middle to make sure that people are actually listening all the way but those who do listen through might be i don't know get some kind of special reward oh, who knows i'm just coming up with ideas at the moment but you know it's the end of just over six hours of recording well a lot more hours of recording but six hours of final product so congratulations there's nothing else to say other than well this is technically the last dry dock of 2021 even though you're now hearing it in 2022 if you're listening to this at time of release so let's hope that this year works out a little bit better than last year did although you know don't hold your breath on that you might turn blue um hopefully i'll see a bunch of you in america in april hopefully i might see a few others of you in uh, other times and other places throughout the year let's uh, see what this year brings but whatever happens take care stay safe and see you again in another video.